guidelines and she is very active member who had already done the guidelines and it had been published in diabetes and she made a book and now also she is doing something on insulin. So she is very active member, Professor Shabin from Pakistan. Yeah, welcome, welcome Pro welcome. Professor Shabi. Nice to meet you. Really, uh, it is uh, interesting uh, guidelines, and it was very helpful for uh, both endocrinologists and obstetric and gynecologists. I, I think Dr. Z Zainab uh, stressed on this point. Uh, many of the uh, physicians and uh, gynecologists, obstetrician, they have a conflict how to get the best way to treat patients with diabetes. So to keep it in these guidelines, really. It will be very helpful for all. She had it also before for Pakistan. Before she had created guidelines for Pakistan, then now it is for MENA region. Yeah, it is very... And it took uh, her time also. so much, many yeah. months. <laughs> we exactly. congratulate you, all of you, for uh, really this uh, effort and uh, the result it's, uh, uh, awesome and good. Hopefully we'll do well. Inshallah we'll present it. But anyway, it is the guidelines presentation. Anyway, in 15 minutes, we'll try to finish it. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Al-Hajri is here. I, Dr. Maryam and Dr. Dalal. Uh, still, I think not, John. Yes. Or okay. Let me see how many. But no, there are 150 participants. Okay, let us see. Because still, we will start within uh, five minutes. Okay. So thank you, Zainab. Actually, I was thrown out by the Zoom, so could not uh, listen. Uh, you, you must not have been able to listen to me. Yeah. So thank you very much for that very nice and kind introduction. Thank you. I think the network, I think, should work on it, Professor Nad. Uh, Shabin, because otherwise you will struggle with your representation. And also Dr. Asad, teach it properly, hopefully. Uh, can, we, can we share the screen and just check the presentation? Yes, you can. Okay. Okay. Sure. I think we we need to be fixed, Dr. Asad, to the program. We should start one. Yes, now. of course. We will. Mm -hmm. I will try to uh, take a role for this uh, session uh, until Dr. Dalal and Dr. Maryam come to the to the yep. Zoom. I think just we want to make sure that it will not have a mishaps at the time of a presentation because we oh, want to share we'll it from our side. So this is what the professor said. She wants just to see whether it is sharing or not. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Just proper preparation prevent poor practice. Yeah. yeah. Funnel five piece. Yeah. This is the most important yeah. one. So <laughs> we will start at one o'clock. We have almost yeah. uh, fifteen minutes. Yes. Yeah. yeah. That's good.
Good morning, everyone. Assalamu alaikum. It's good morning. Good morning to you. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Good afternoon. Yes. Except for the people who are in UK or America. In Jordan, even I think now it is also will be afternoon. Yeah. Well, uh, now Adan al Dhar. Yeah. Okay. Now Adan al Dhar will be. Yeah. So yeah, now it will be the afternoon, yeah? Yeah, yeah, it will be the afternoon after 14 minutes. Okay. Victor Nadima, no? Yeah. Yeah. How are you? Yeah. How are you? How are you? How are you? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Welcome, Victor Nadim, to board. Thank you. Victor Nadima, welcome to board. Dr. Jamil, all the speakers and panelists. Uh, thank you for yesterday and uh, good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today we will start the uh, second day session for MDO conference. Today we will have the fruitful, the uh, Bahrain Diabetes uh, Society and IDF MENA uh, program, which will be uh, for almost two hours. We'll start at one o'clock. And then uh, this session will be uh, chaired by Her Excellency Dr. Maryam Al Hajri and Dr. Dalal uh, Al Romahi. I will uh, introduce them uh, after a while. And the second session will be uh, about endocrinology, uh, about the uh, approach to adrenal nodule and Addison disease in a pregnancy. After that, we'll have a break. And then we will have another uh, lectures about uh, type 1 uh, diabetes with osteoporosis imaging. After that, uh, we will have uh, some about COVID uh, pandemic and uh, vitamin D related uh, COVID uh, weather immunity and looking for the evidence uh, for that. Then we will have the, some uh, uh, industry uh, lectures and after, uh, at the end, there will be uh, obesity and diabetes uh, treatment lectures. So today uh, we will have some uh, changes in the program uh, because uh, Dr. Ali Al Hamadan he have surgery uh, at that time. He will uh, give his lecture earlier at 8:30, and uh, the other will be uh, shifted uh, down. Then uh, Dr. Said Rida he will give. Uh, after that, Dr. Deb Debish Patil and uh, Professor Barbara. So first of all, I would like to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Uh, Dalal and uh, Dr. Maryam. Uh, Dr. Maryam al Hajri, she is the, uh, Her Excellency, the Assistant Under Secretary for uh, Public Health at Ministry of Health. Dr. Maryam al Hajri, she is uh, the deputy uh, chairman for Bahrain Diabetes uh, Society. She has a lot of efforts to support the uh, children with diabetes and care for them. And uh, we cannot forget the uh, Bahrain Diabetes uh, Society activities uh, led by uh, Dr. Dalal and uh, her team. So uh, they have a lot of activities to encourage uh, walking and uh, also they have good connection with the society. Dr. Dalal, I will just introduce her uh, as well. Uh, Professor Dalal Rumayhi, she's the head of the Department of Internal Medicine and consultant <laughs> endocrinologist at King Hamad <laughs> University Hospital. She has American board certification, internal medicine, diabetes, endocrinology and metabolism. She's a consultant endocrinologist at Yuma, uh, 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 former consultant endocrinologist at Yuma Regional Medical Center in Arizona, USA, program director of Saudi Arab Board Internal Medicine Residency Program, and associate professor of Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland in Bahrain, uh, board member and chair of scientific committee at Bahrain Diabetes uh, Society. Beside this, she has the, uh, I think, responsibility to be a chairman of the Department of Internal Medicine in the same hospital, and she is the uh, chairman of scientific committee for uh, Bahrain uh, Diabetes Society. So, uh, Dr. Maryam, Dr. Dalal, uh, floor for you. 
I welcome all the uh, delegates uh, for this conference, and I am uh, I have all my thanks to the members of the uh, IDF MENA to give them uh, their uh, lectures in this program. Dr. Dalal. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Assad, for the very kind introduction. Uh, Dr. Maria Milhajri, would you like to open your video? It's such a pleasure to see all the lovely faces from the IDF MENA region colleagues with us today. Thank you, Dr. Delal. Can we start now before one o'clock? Is it okay? Uh, I think uh, you just uh, you will take time to introduce the first speaker. So okay. we will, yeah. Okay. Thank yeah. you, Dr. Delal. Or if you want to talk also about your uh, guidelines, this will be also. Uh, yeah. Thank you, Dr. Assad. Uh, dear colleagues, uh, good afternoon. Wassalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. First, on behalf of Bahrain Diabetes Society, I would like to thank the organizing committee, Noor Specialist Hospital Education Plus, which conduct this, uh, the fifth uh, IMDO conference under the patronage of His Excellency uh, Lieutenant General, Dr. Sheikh Mohammed bin Abdullah Al Khalifa, Chairman of the Supreme Council of Health and President of Bahrain Diabetes Society. And it is uh, on behalf also of Bahrain Diabetes Society, it is our pleasure to chair this session in cooperation with IDF MENA region, and I would like to express my sincere appreciation for all of you for joining us here in the Kingdom of Bahrain, especially our distinguished speakers of from IDF MENA region. And uh, in this special session, which organized by Bahrain Diabetes Society in cooperation with IDF MENA region and chaired by me with uh, Dr. Delal as moderator. Uh, the speaker will tackle the hyperglycemia and pregnancy in details and what done by the IDF uh, MENA region regarding the subject hyperglycemia and pregnancy and regarding the guidelines for uh, hyperglycemia and pregnancy. Uh, first, uh, our speaker, the first, our speaker, Professor Shabin Naz Masoud from Pakistan. Professor Shabin Masoud, She's a head of Department of Obstetric and Gynecology in Isra University in Karachi campus and chairperson of Insulin Century Working Group of IDF MENA region. And she's an executive member of Diabetes in Asian, uh, Asian Study Group and executive member in the Academic Committee of Society uh, obstetric and gynecologist of Pakistan, funded by the World Diabetes Foundation in Denmark in 2019 to 2015. Professor Shabin, principal investigator for the Corona International Trial Study from National uh, per uh, Perinatal Epidemiology Unit of University of Oxford in UK. This is done in 2015 to 20 uh, and 27. And authors of multiple research publication in both national and international medical journals. I would like to thank Professor Shabin. She's as a maestro who managed in very clever and humble we all the team work with her in uh, uh, issuing the guidelines for pregnancy and hyperglycemia with the pregnancy. She's guide the team for a beautiful work, which 
honor our region, MENA region, and I would like to congratulate Professor Shabin and her team uh, regarding what they did for the MENA region. I will open the floor for Dr. Shabin as first speaker to give us an introduction to the guidelines and definition of hyperglycemia in pregnancy. Professor Shabin Masoud, the floor for you. Thank you for joining us in Bahrain in MDO conference. Professor Shabin, you can unmute your mic, please, and you can share this, uh, your slides if you wish. Uh, thank you, Dr. Mariam, uh, for that very kind and nice introduction. I am really humbled uh, by, your, uh, by your words and by your thoughts. Thank you very much. And uh, with this, I start my presentation in the name of Allah, the most beneficial, the most uh, merciful. Bismillah, Rahman, Rahim. Can you all uh, see my screen? Yes. Yes. So, so I'm thankful to uh, Professor Dalal, uh, Dr. Mariam, and the organizations, the uh, organizers of Internal Medicine uh, Diabetes Obesity Conference, and especially Bahrain uh, Diabetic Society, Dr. Assad also for providing me this opportunity uh, to share my views about a very important topic that is hyperglycemia in pregnancy. So I will talk about guidelines for hyperglycemia in pregnancy in MENA region. The question is that why guidelines are needed? So uh, I will start with two things. It is emotional factor that led us to uh, write these guidelines and also the scientific uh, facts. So what is the emotional factor? It's about the disappear and dispendency that started in January, 2021. This woman, 35 years of age, married for 15 years. This is her seventh pregnancy. She presented to us at 16 weeks of gestation. And unfortunately, in spite of six pregnancy, she had none alive. She was diagnosed as gestational diabetes mellitus, previously treated with improper doses of oral hypoglycemic drugs. And according to her, that this is her sixth child and all her children died at seven to eight months uh, in triutrine. And uh, I will stop her video. This picture again is taken on 31st May, 2021. And uh, by the uh, help of Allah, her blood sugar was diagnosed and treated and she had a cesarean section. And according to her, with the gracious mercy of Allah, uh, subhanahu wa ta'ala, she had her seventh and only live child in lap after six pregnancy losses. So lack of timely screening, diagnosis and improper treatment costed this woman years of disappear, deprivation, social stigma, physical and mental anguish and deprived her from the joy of motherhood. We, the healthcare professionals, do we have any justification for this omission and for this inertia? Another, uh, I said that there's an emotional uh, element and then there's a scientific element that led us to write these guidelines. Online survey of practice patterns among healthcare professionals of screening, diagnosis and management of GDM was conducted in 18 countries of South Asia, Africa, and Middle East through professional diabetes associations. And the aim was to identify the screening methods and diagnostic criteria used for managing women with GDM in the respective countries. And uh, I'll, I'll just share just one slide from this study. This has been published in uh, Journal of Diabetology last, uh, this year only, I mean last year only. And just see that the different screening modalities followed by healthcare professionals. And the irony of it is that 1999 WHO criteria is still being used by 27% of the doctors. And 
24% in MENA region, they reported to use ADA criteria. So we need guidelines to diagnose and treat the women with diabetes in pregnancy. So why do we need uh, the guidelines? So the urgent need of guidelines according to culture, socioeconomic status, lifestyle, nutritional patterns, beliefs and norms of MENA region are very different from other regions globally. And we all know, we are familiar probably from this diagram, that prevalence of diabetes is now we are getting a figure of 537 million people. And we can see that proportion of diabetes, proportion of diabetes in men and women is almost equal. You can see 11.9.6% in men and almost 9% in women. And the projections are again the same for increase in diabetes in both the genders. And uh, health, uh, hyperglycemia and pregnancy related statistics, one in six live births are affected by hyperglycemia in Europe. When it comes to Southeast Asia and MENA region, one in four or one in seven live births are affected by hyperglycemia and pregnancy, according to the Atlas 10 IDF published, in, published last year, November. And we can see this diagram, the gray area you can see, uh, they do not have any data source about diabetes in pregnancy because of lack of definition and also because of lack of screening and diagnostic modalities in these areas. So the purpose of the guideline was to create uniformity of care, at least across this diversified region that is MENA region. How it all started? I was privileged to chair the first hyperglycemia and pregnancy guidelines in Pakistan, initiated by Society of Ops and Gyne Gynecology of Pakistan, one of the largest societies, uh, professional societies. And obviously it was too difficult and uphill task. And we started in September, 2019 and finished the guidelines in nine months period. And it was finally published on 21st, 25th December in the Journal of Diabetology. These were our authors from Pakistan. And the secret of getting ahead is getting started, very rightly said by Mark Twain. And after this publication of guidelines, the first suggestion to write IDF MENA region guidelines for pregnancy with diabetes was initiated uh, in the end of August by the chair IDF MENA region, Professor Jamal. And again, it was too, I mean, difficult and uh, too confusing for me uh, to think uh, of writing a guideline for which would be agreed and with mutual consistency by 22 countries. The next week, we started a meeting with Chair IDF MENA region and Chair IDF, Chair elect IDF Professor Akhtar Hussain. Immediately the next week, uh, we had uh, the members uh, from MENA region to write guideline, uh, to guidelines and a guideline committee was held on uh, by the mid of September, immediately 15 days after it was proposed. And I'm thankful you are, you must be familiar with all the faces that are here. An in-depth review of global clinical practice guidelines was undertaken and preparation of guidelines. There were about 28 Zoom meetings every weekend and without any fail. And uh, it lasted for two to three hours, hours of discussion and agreements and disagreements. So we decided to have a timeline from September to May, that is about nine months, uh, eight to nine months. But in six months time, by the end of March, 2021, the task was Alhamdulillah completed. And 29 members from 19 countries of MENA region, they were the participant for these guidelines. And we have many of the faces together uh, today with us in the, uh, in the presentation. So preparation of guidelines uh, uh, that were approved for publication in June and was published on 22nd July, 2021, when it was the day of Eid al-Azha in Pakistan. And this was published in Journal of Diabetology, Diabetes in Asia Study Group Journal. So what are the highlights of IDF MENA region guidelines? So uh, this was the first comprehensive evidence-based locally tailored, tailored guideline for 22 countries of MENA region authored by multidisciplinary group of, uh, of healthcare professionals. That included obstetricians, gynecolo uh, obstetricians and gynecologists, 
uh, endocrinologist, internal medicine, pediatric uh, uh, medicine, and also diabetes educator and diabetes dietitian and nurses. So uniform strategy format was clear, user friendly. Contribution of 29 authors from different countries of MENA region for authoring various subsections of guideline, not only authoring, but agreeing to the consensus was the greater part. And you can see that each one, a uh, few of the authors, they were given few of the topics and titles to write the guidelines. And recommendations, uh, the specialty about it is, so there are, are lots of recommendations about blood glucose screening. So we decided to have few things uh, universally, uh, I mean, accepted uh, unanimously for MENA region, that is oral glucose tolerance tests, test and IDSPG criteria. Those who do not afford or uh, do not undergo or uh, fail to undergo OGTT, they were advised fasting blood glucose after an, an overnight eight hours of fasting. And those who could not come in fasting and could not afford three OGTTs, they were offered DIPSI method, diabetes in pregnancy study group method, which does not require fasting and requires only one test. HbA1c was not considered as a screening criteria, but just to see uh, the previous status of uh, diabetes in those who were lately diagnosed or were not diagnosed with uh, diabetes in pregnancy. So prevalence of obesity in MENA region, we all know is enormous. So absence, there is absence of standardized guidelines for physical activity in MENA region, especially for youth and in pregnancy, and needed to be addressed. So pictorial guidelines for lifestyle and exercises during pregnancy, they were incorporated into uh, this MENA region guidelines. And the good news is that all these, uh, uh, all these illustrations, they were made by one of the authors of the guideline. She is assistant professor uh, in one of the university hospitals in Pakistan. And uh, nutritional recommendations, again, were, uh, were uh, enormously uh, elaborated. And there were calorie intake, weight gain during pregnancy according to BMI. And then daily uh, requirement index was also uh, recommended. Especially uh, the types and sources of oil and fats were elaborately uh, were elaborated a lot. Then neonatal management, none of the guidelines, they carry on such a detail uh, about neonatal management, which is present in our guideline. And we are thankful to our neonatology team for, uh, for this. Then breastfeeding recommendations, our chairperson of today, Dr. Dalal was the one who was writing this. And the special part of it is what that, that the educational videos were incorporated to help promote and support breastfeeding. They were among the creative co uh, comments, and then the permission was taken to incorporate it into the uh, into the guidelines. Uh, contraception management in hyperglycemia in pregnancy was elaborated according to WHO and McPhil, um, that is med medical eligibility criteria, and was modified according to hyperglycemia and according to the needs of the patient with hyperglycemia and pregnancy who were seeking advice for contraception. So insulin injection techniques during pregnancy, they are given in many guidelines for, but then it was especially mentioned about all three trimesters. Pictorial guidelines for insulin injection was incorporated into it. These pictures were specially taken in, uh, in my clinic and in other clinics by myself and by uh, the author of this, uh, uh, this particular chapter. Then pictorial guidelines for insulin handling and storage, especially in low middle income countries and where there are uh, resource constraints, they were also given and elaborately explained. The important part of this guideline again was management of diabetes in pregnancy during Ramadan. We do not advocate the women to fast during Ramadan, but those who insist we have to find some way out. So this was very elaborately written and permitted by the DAR group, Ramadan group, and this was incorporated. None of the guidelines, they carry the management uh, protocols for Ramadan uh, so far. So who will be the end users of guideline? So we all know that doctors, uh, they are considered as end users of guideline, but this guideline has been written so, uh, so um, uh, in such an easy language that it is also meant for nurse practitioners and midwives if they want to use it and they can be benefited from this. 
Now the question is the last few slides. It will these guidelines be of any help to know the prevalence and gravity of situation in MENA region, or would it be it be another document to be shelved as uh, these as other guidelines have been? So the answer to it is that no. We have developed a Pakistan National Registry for Hyperglycemia and Pregnancy, and this has been launched and introduced in Pakistan on 14th November. 2021 on the occasion of World Diabetes Day and a software has been produced and has been pilot tested in Pakistan and we intend to share this uh, uh, this uh, registry document with the, our friends in MENA region so that we know the prevalence. In the end, I would say that guidelines are intended to assist in the provision of optimal cl clinical care and to make informed decisions with full responsibility and not to override or supersede clinical judgment. We intend to revise hyperglycemia and pregnancy guidelines after two years, inshallah. And special thanks to Dr. V. Mohan for final review, guidance, coordination, and accommodation of guidelines in the special issue of diabetes in pregnancy in the Journal of Diabetology. And I must say that he had to wait for our um, guidelines uh, uh, to be completed. And he waited for us uh, for this special issue. And we are very, very thankful to him. And obviously our thanks goes to Professor Akhtar Hussain, President Elect, and Chair IDF MENA region, Professor uh, Jamal Bil Qadir, for all their guidance and for keeping their, placing their trust in uh, the chairperson and collaborative group of authors. And I must thank to all friends in leadership position of IDF MENA region for their support and nomination of members to the collaborative group of authors. Without them, it was not possible. It would have been very, very difficult to uh, produce what we produced. And thank you all the authors for their enormous amount of time, passion to craft these guidelines. And in the end again, Thank you to Professor Dalal, Prof, uh, Dr. Mariam, uh, Dr. Asad, and the organizers of Eternal Medicine, Diabetes, and Obesity Conference, Bahrain uh, Diabetic Society, the chair, panelists, and friends for active listening and taking time out of their precious, busy schedule. Thank you once again. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mariam. Thank you, Professor uh, Shabin for excellent uh, uh, talk and introduction regarding the guidelines and definition of hyperglycemia and pregnancy. Uh, we appreciate that you today with us, inshallah, we hope we'll see you soon here in Bahrain. Yeah, uh, sure, thank you very much. We'll give the floor now for Professor uh, Dr. Delal to introduce the second speaker. You are welcome with us, Dr. Nadima from Jordan. Thank you. Thank you so much. And thank you, Professor Shabin, for a lovely walk through the journey. We've uh, moved together with lots of memories and uh, not all the subsections are covered today. So this is another invitation to all the attendees to please pull the guidelines and keep a copy with you on your desktop and refer to it because it's a very rich document that we're very confident it will help you. So with great pleasure, I introduce uh, Dr. Nadima, a very dear friend to all of us in the IDF MENA region. She's a consultant in endocrinology and diabetes, president of Jordanian Society for the Care of Diabetes. And uh, she used to be a full-time consultant at Georgian University Hospital's National Center for Diabetes, Endocrinology and Genetics for seven years and Vice President of the Jordanian Society for Endocrinology, Diabetes and Metabolism, co-author of several publications. She does a lot of volunteer work in humanitarian and cultural organization, involved in the Scientific and Disaster Committee. And also uh, she is busy with over 30 year, uh, events per year, speaking events and activities. And she was our host uh, in Jordan in the last IDF MENA region. It was a lovely, lovely gathering scientifically, socially, and on all levels. So without any further ado, go ahead, Dr. Nadima. Thank you, Dalal. Thank you a lot for the nice introduction. I'd like to thank you, the organizers, 
and to thank Mark, Dr. Mariam, our Professor Shapin, the leader of our uh, guidelines, and all the lecturers today, because we are all a participant in these guidelines. Allow me to start my lecture now, and I am going to talk about the screening part of the guidelines. Well, let me start with, today uh, my talk will be about screening and diagnosis of hyperglycemia in pregnancy. Before going into, let me see, yeah. So what are, why it is very important to talk about this subject? Because it is estimated that in 2021, it was estimated that around 17% of live birth to a woman had some form of hyperglycemia in the pregnancy. It means one in six, and as Dr. Shabin said, in Europe had, had some form of hyperglycemia. In our region, it is one in seven. And appro approximately half of the women with history of GDM will go to develop type two diabetes in the future within five to 10 years after delivery. So hyperglycemia in pregnancy are such a condition where glycemic value are very extremely important. And if ignored by the physician can lead to a diagnostic inertia, which will be a, a, a very bad consequences for fetal maternal, maternal well-being. Well, the prevalence, as Dr. Shabin has shown you, is increased because of increased maternal age, high prevalence of obesity, and the rise of type 2 diabetes in women, in women with childbearing age. As Dr. Shabin said, there are lack of consensus in the literature regarding hyperglycemia in the pregnancy. And why is this lack? This lack because there are, up, I mean, since 2013 up to 2018, we found 16 clinical guidelines for the screening strategy of GDM has been published. Of those guidelines, there are inconsistent, include timing of screening, actually the, uh, st uh, the approach of for screening, whether it is one step versus two step, and the diagnostic criteria regarding oral glucose tolerance test. In our region, the IDF Middle East and North Africa MENA region is a diverse of and unique territory for create great ethnical and cultural differences and social economic extremes. So we had a lot of low income country and middle income country. We had to find a guideline that is a used friendly and can be used in a low and low resources country. So we came out with our guideline, Dr. Shafin talked about, but the fundamental question was in our guideline to answer is when, who and how to do the guidelines. So we started who should be screened for HIV in pregnancy. We decided that universal screening should be done for all pregnant women, because in MENA region where the population composed multiple ethnic and the prevalence of obesity and type two is high, and they are people, women are prone to develop type two diabetes. The best strategy to ensure the maternal and prenatal well-being and to prevent future complications is to implant universal screening for everybody. To convince you, I just brought some data about the difference between universal screening and risk-based screening. In Europe, the European study showed, uh, which was applied, risk-based screening retrospectively and universal screening found that 20%, 16 and 5% of women had no risk factor. Why? And they were having undiagnosed gestational diabetes. And a cross-sectional study in Pakistan showed that 26% 
of women diagnosed with GDM had no risk factor. And in Malaysia as well, 24% with GDM didn't have any risk factor while screening. In American study as well, gestational diabetes was found to be around 1.5% in women using risk based screening, and in the same population of women, they were found to have 3% using the same population using universal screening. So we decided to adopt universal screening and the best strategy it was when to do the screening. According to multiple uh, international guidelines, as you can see here, the WHO, the FIGO, the IDF, and our guideline, IDF MENA region, we, they adapt early screening at the first trimester, and those guidelines adapted universal screening. Most of those guidelines adapted universal screening, uh, except the endocrine, they have, endocrine society as well, they have universal screening, either to roll out gestational uh, diabetes type 2 or early gestational diabetes. The, the majority of guideline universals, they adopt recommended universal screening at first antenatal visit using WHO or ADA guideline. The, the aim of early screening is to identify the female women who have at risk of gestational diabetes or they are undiagnosed as type 2 diabetes. Early GDM diagnosis can prevent a lot of complications for the mother and the baby and can prevent hypertension, preterm birth, and prenatal mortality, allow us to intervene to, for intervention as early as, as we can. So the first trimester screening is justified, I hope. So to emphasize that screening for hyperglycemia and pregnancy should be done at the first antenatal visit. Second trimester screening, everybody agrees on the second trimester screening, which should be usually done at 24 to 28 weeks of gestation. In our guidelines, we ask to repeat third trimester screening if the first and second trimester were missed, or negative, and the, the woman has sign of hyperglycemia in pregnancy, the third trimester should be applied. How to do the screening? How to do the screening? We have to choose between one-step approach or two-step approach. Here you can see the two-step approach, approach, and you can see the two-step approach has two steps. First, first step, the lady come in non-fasting state and she will go, 50, she will have 50 gram oral glucose tolerance test. And after that, if the results are abnormal, they will go to 100 gram oral glucose tolerance test three hours. And the criteria are either carbon diantosine or NDDG criteria. So the disadvantage of this approach, it is higher missed, cost, missed cases, loss to follow up because in some area of the MENA regime, the lady cannot come twice for the clinic. Sometimes she is allowed to go once or only. And there will be a delay in diagnosing and initiating treatment as well as higher missed causes. And you have to have two values for the GTT after using the 100 gram with uh, between Carbenter and cuisine and MDDG criteria, there is no agreement which value to use, but a lot of value will confuse the practitioner or the physician. So we decided to use one step approach. The one step approach, we have to have only one abnormal value for the, the diagnosis of gestational diabetes. And if the fasting above 92 milligram per deciliter, you don't have to do oral glucose tolerance test. If it is less, you proceed to oral glucose tolerance test. The advantage of the 75 gram oral glucose, it is simple, easier to diagnose, indefinite more GDM cases, and the disadvantage, it requires women to come in a fasting state. So it is recommended. Alternative option, we have alternative option if the lady or the, uh, the pregnant lady that cannot come in a fasting state, we can perform 75 gram oral glucose tolerance by DIPSI criteria 
Dipsy study diabetes in pregnancy study group of India. Now, if the woman cannot tolerate the GCT, the high anhydrase glucose solution, we depend on fasting blood sugar, but we have if we have an, one abnormal value, which is above 92 milligram per deciliter, we have to repeat the test and confirm it by another test. So fasting will do the job if the lady cannot drink and hide the solution. Fasting blood sugar is very easy as a screening tool for gestational diabetes. It is uh, cheap, reliable, and avoid potential nausea and vomiting data can occur with the uh, uh, anhydrase glucose solution. Using fasting as initial test can uh, spare some a lot of oral glucose tolerance that is not needed when the fasting above 92 milligram per deciliter. And fasting special specificity and positive predictive value at 92 milligram are 100%. If laboratory value not available, we can use a glucometer calibrated one. Hemoglobin A1C, as Dr. Shabin said, is not recommended for screening, but it is, can be used for type 2 diabetes, and it can be used to diagnose type 2 for a lady who's not known or for follow-up for diabetic patients. In summary, at first prenatal visit, universal screening for all pregnant women is recommended irrespective of risk factor. The recommended gold standard test is one step 75 gram, two hours oral glucose tolerance test. It is very important to diagnose hyperglycemia in pregnancy in a timely fashion. By early detection and treatment, the outcome of affected pregnancy are improved with reduction of adverse event, event and complication. And we recommend adherence to the guidelines needed to be ensured. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you so much, Dr. Nadima. We will just take the Q and A at the end. I remind our SND, please add them. Dr. Mariam. Yes. Thank you, Dr. Nadima, for excellent uh, uh, topics regarding screening and diagnosis of hyperglycemia in pregnancy. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, now we uh, would like to introduce our the third speakers from Bahrain. Dr. Zainab al Jufiri. Uh, Dr. Zainab, uh, consultant uh, obstetric and gynae at Al Rasala Medical Center in Bahrain, and assistant professor at Arabian Gulf University. She had a master in health profession education, and uh, see from also uh, Arabian Gulf University in June 2006. And she was member of examination committee in Arab Board Council till 2012. Uh, she was head of investigation committee in obstetric and gynecology department at Salmania Medical Center till October 2020 in Bahrain and had been involved in investigation committee at licensure at National Health Regulatory Authority. Dr. Zainab, she will talk about uh, uh, preconception and antenatal management. Uh, Dr. Zainab, you are welcome and the floor for you. Assalamu alaikum. Good evening. Alaykum Thanks, salam. Dr. Mariam, for in this nice introduction. But definitely, I'm really, I enjoy to be part of this. Uh, committee and I had been introduced by Professor Dalal and really I learned a lot. So now like definitely the lecture which had been presented by Prof. Shabin and uh, Dr. Nadim had made my life easy. So I just being an obstetrician, I had been honored to go ahead and to give the guidelines, the practical guidelines on a preconception and antenatal without really real introduction. So, okay. Is it seen or what? Yes. Is it yes. okay? Yes, yeah. very clear. Okay. Is it okay now? Yes. Yeah. Okay. 
So for me, my, in these 15 minutes, I hope I will finish uh, the preconception and antenatal guidelines from a practical point of view. I think this is important for obstetrician, midwives, even uh, family physician who are dealing with this pregnancy from uh, clinical, I mean, from practical point of view. To start with, all women who are having hyperglycemia in a pregnancy must be counseled to plan their pregnancy and to attend the pregnancy clinic. Unfortunately, this is not done, and most of the time we'll see patients who are coming with um, uncontrolled diabetes when they are pregnant. All maternal assessment and intervention will be aimed to optimize the health of these ladies prior to conception in order to improve the pregnancy outcome. And I think the best example is the one which Professor Shapin had shown us for that really lady who had previous seven uh, losses and then she ended with a nice outcome. So to start with, what are the guidelines for women who are attending a preconception clinic? By the way, this one can be held by either obstetrician who are inter interested in gestational diabetes, family physician, or endocrinologist. And I will start with just a little bit guidelines about the women who are having high risk for hyperglycemia in a pregnancy. These women should be offered to our 75 oral GTT to identify and diagnose pre-existing diabetes. And if the women are overweight or obese, they should be instructed to have exercise and weight reduction before embarking on a pregnancy. Now, what we should do for women who are having a pre-existing diabetes, I think it is ideally this patient should definitely attend this pre-pregnancy clinic in order to educate them and counsel them about the importance of euglycemia at conception and throughout pregnancy if we want to minimize the risk of miscarriages, um, fetal anomalies, and even fetal loss. These women should be asked to avoid any planned pregnancy by using effective contraception, which will be dealt later on by our colleague, Dr. Abir. And we should really make sure that before embarking on a pregnancy, their HbA1c should be less than six person in order to avoid all the complications. We should advocate healthy eating for these women. And I think this is the time we should discuss with them how to monitor the blood glucose, how to educate them, how frequent, how to chart it, and what are the targets we are aiming at. Who are having type 1 diabetes are at risk of hypoglycemia, especially in first trimester when they are having excessive nausea and vomiting. So they should be warned about hypoglycemia risk, uh, how to recognize it, and how to manage it. And we should really look into their medication, which they are using for diabetes, whether they, especially now there are a lot of drugs which are used for diabetes, and many of them are still not known whether they are safe during a pregnancy or not. So I think ideally it is better to switch them either to metformin because it had been the safety had been established and insulin if it is not controlled. It is very important to review their medications, and it is, I think I should emphasize that they should take folic acid five milligram per day at least two months prior to. Uh, pregnancy until 12 weeks to reduce the risk of a neural tubal defects. If the patients, because most of these type 1 or type 2 diabetes are having hypertension and they are, they should discontinue AC inhibitors or uh, angiotensin 2 receptor blockers, thiazides, when they are pregnant, and to switch to safer antihypertensive drugs like lepitalol, nifedipine, hydralazine, and methyl dopa. And if these women are on statins and fibrates, they should uh, discontinue this medication as soon as the pregnancy is confirmed. They should be screened for hypertension, thyroid disease, and we should really look whether they are having any medical complication related to diabetes, like ischemic heart disease, renal insufficiency, retinopathy, and neuropathy. If the woman had not have before um, dilated retinal assessment, then they should be offered this one. And if they are having diabetic retinopathy, photocoagulation should be done by ophthalmologist. 
and it should be stabilized before starting a pregnancy. And these women who are having diabetic retinopathy should avoid rapid reduction of blood sugar before uh, finishing the treatment in order that their diabetic retinopathy will not be deteriorated. Also, they should offer renal assessment and if the uh, serum creatinine or urinary albumin creatinine ratio is high, then they should be referred to the prologist before conception. So now we had finished the aim and guidelines for preconception for women who are having uh, type one or type two diabetes. Now we will go to how we should manage women who are pregnant, what we will do with them. I think the most important, we should emphasize that good glycemic control is the key for improving the pregnancy outcomes. Definitely diabetes in a pregnancy or outside the pregnancy, it really, it needs education and counseling. If it had not been done in a preconception, it should be done during a pregnancy. And it is very important to emphasize the role of a glycemic control uh, to counsel about the glycemic targets. We should put them on diet. We should emphasize about the role of diet and exercise in order to have a good glycemic control because many of them, they will depend on insulin and they will not have a proper diet. And it is very important to educate women, especially type one diabetes, how to avoid hypoglycemia and ketoacidosis. It is very important to individualize food plan because not all the ladies, they like the same food. Uh, so either because of personal or cultural differences, it should be individualized in order to optimize, optimize the glycemic control. Aspirin, it is, uh, should be used in these women because they are at risk of having a preeclampsia and it should be started uh, from 12 weeks onward till 36 weeks in a dose of 100 to 150 milligrams. And also calcium can be started from 12 weeks. And all of this is to reduce the risk of preeclampsia. In each visit, what we should do for these patients, the blood pressure should be checked and also urine dipstick to identify preeclampsia early. They will continue folic acid and you will watch for complication. I think it is very important to set the glycemic targets with our patients and we should really educate them because unless we educate them, they will not be compliant with us. And usually we should tell our patients that our target for fasting or pre-prandial or pre-meal should be between four to 5.3 millimole. If they are going to depend on one hour, it should be less than 7.8. Two hours, it should be less than 6.7. And their hemoglobin A1C should be less than 6%. So if we are educating our patients our, about these targets, I think they will be more compliant. How to monitor the blood glucose? The best word is to do self-monitoring blood glucose. It is better to be done four to seven times daily at the beginning, but then later on if this control it can be reduced to two to three times per day. And each antenatal visit, these uh, measurement of blood glucose should be checked by their physician. Hemoglobin A1C should be done at booking and to be repeated in each trimester in type 1 or type 2 diabetes. And we should really, really look for uh, ketoacidosis, especially if the woman who is having hyperglycemia, hyperemesis, or she is unwell. How to control the blood sugar? whether in gestational diabetes or uh, begin the treatment with, can you see me? Because my battery is low. Can you hear? Yes, yes. Yes, very yes. clear. Yes. Uh, okay. Yes. Well, we should begin a treatment with lifestyle modification and we should add metformin and insulin if it uh, does not achieve within two weeks and review their medications. In the first antenatal visit, we should review their obstetric history, their history of diabetes, whether the complications, any medical problems, and routine blood investigation. It is very important to do the ultrasound in the first trimester by, to confirm first of all the fetal, fetus, whether it is viable, the gestational age, and whether there is any multiple gestation. Uh, we can arrange early animal scan as early as 12 weeks and no thickness between 11 to 13 weeks. And this patient, they will need 
to be between 22 weeks antenatal visits. We should monitor in each visit, monitor weight gain, do fetal growth and serial fetal scan every two to four weeks from 28 weeks onward and CTG. Animal scan should be done between 18 to 24 weeks to rule out fetal anomalies. Fetal echo should be offered for patients who are having uncontrolled diabetes or the four chamber review, which was done on animal scan was abnormal, then they should have fetal echo. Fetal growth and amniotic fluid volume should be assessed serially. And it is very important to plan with the patient um, how to deliver her and when with, with the patient and her family, and you should really document it in the files. And if the patient is coming with uncontrolled diabetes, then they should do CTG. Timing of delivery, it is a bit difficult, but it is very important that it is no, there is no clear answer, but definitely the optimal timing of deliveries, it will be depending whether the patient had complication or not, whether she had good glycemic control or whether she had any metabolic or obstetric complication. But usually we'll aim to deliver the woman, especially if it is well controlled between 38 to 20, 39 weeks. No diabetic pregnancy to go beyond 40 weeks. And in case of associated complication, they should deliver around 37 weeks gestation. Mode of delivery, our aim should be for vaginal birth. And cesarean section should be recommended only for obstetric reasons. Consider elective cesarean section if estimated fetal weight is more than 4 kg. Diabetes itself is not a contraindication for vaginal birth after cesarean section. If the patient is allowed to go deliver for normal delivery, use partigram to monitor labor. And in case if there is a slow progress or you require ins instrumental delivery, anticipate shoulder dystocia and you should call for senior and skilled staff to be present in labor work. It is very important to control the blood sugar even during delivery to avoid neonatal hypoglycemia and, high, and diabetic ketoacidosis for a delivering women. And usually we should aim that the blood sugar would be between four to seven millimole per liter. The blood sugar should be monitored either four hourly in women who are diet, and women who are insulin should be between one to two hours. Here, just the details quickly on how to the insulin. Uh, usually, the, the night of the induction, they, they can use the intermediate or long acting insulin at bedtime. In the morning of the delivery or induction, the morning dose should be omitted. And uh, for women who are going for cesarean section, also omit the morning dose and they should be the first on the operation list. And this is about how to control the blood uh, sugar for women who are having or are insulin by using two infusion. And by this, I'm finishing my presentation. So what is the take home messages? That women with diabetes should avoid unplanned pregnancy and to ensure that hemoglobin A1C is less than 6% to minimize the risk of congenital malformation and miscarriages. Folic acid should be taken two months prior to conception and first at 12 weeks. Women with gestational with diabetes should be screened for complication and to review their medication. Good glycemic control during the pregnancy is the key for improving pregnancy outcomes and aim for vaginal birth at 38 to 39 weeks, unless there are obstetric or medical complications or suspected macrosomia. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Zainab, for this very informative and yes, I agree with you, very practical session. Uh, I'm sure all of our colleagues will find it very useful. A uh, reminder for all our attendees, if you have questions to our speakers, to please add them in the Q&A and we will ask them at the end, inshallah. Next, uh, if I may, please uh, ask Professor Ahmed Bilal to share his screen. Professor Ahmed Bilal, uh, he's Professor and Dean of Medicine, Department of Faisal, uh, Faisalabad Medical uh, University, Pakistan. He holds fellowship from College of Physicians and Surgeons, Pakistan, and he is the president of Pakistan Diabetes and Endocrine Society. 
He has published several research papers and other publications with special focus on diabetes and endocrinology. And he published several educational material for people to learn and um, live well with, with diabetes. And he served as chief organizer and host of all Pakistan uh, diabetes and endocrine conferences several years. And he's such a great mentor, great leader, who we are working with on a, another project related to hyperglycemia and pregnancy. Perhaps he will share with us when he speaks about his section. Professor Ahmed Bilal. Thank you very much, Assalamu alaikum, and uh, for a very kind introduction. Uh, today we would be. The voice, our... the voice is not here. Uh, is it clear now? Is voice clear? What's about the rest of uh, audience, Dr. Adela? I can no, hear it. Yeah. The, the volume. Yeah. Please, Dr. Bilal, can you increase your volume, please? Am I audible now? It looks very far. Like yes, so far. very far away. Hello? My recording, then you can play with that if there is a problem in it. Uh, let's try for the last time. Uh, is the voice now clear? Doctor, do you want us to share your recorded presentation? And yes, then you can. Already. Yes, yes. Yes, okay, we'll do that. Thank you. While they share it, Professor Ahmed Bilal would like to talk about our new venture. Uh, am I audible? Yes. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, this is a book and uh, at my last slide we have given a big thank to Bahrain because uh, we had wonderful intellectuals from Bahrain in form of uh, Mariam, Dr. Dalal, Dr. Zainab and Dr. Arich, uh, Ms. Arich and they have contributed a lot. And uh, it's a uh, player announcing that the name of this book was coined by Professor Dalal. And the name is Diabetes in Pregnancy, A Journey into the Past, Present, and the Future. And uh, there is a wonderful con intellectual contribution from Berin in this book. This book is having is uh, con authors from the 25 countries. Doctor, we have shared your representation. I am very thankful okay, to thank Dr. You very Mariam much. and Dr. Dalal for inviting and giving this opportunity. I have no conflict of interest. I would like to acknowledge Ms. Areej, Dr. Zahir, and Dr. Aisha. Non-pharmacological treatment, the euglycemic glycemia can be achieved with non-pharmacological treatment among 70 to 85 percent of the women with <laughs> gestational diabetes mellitus. Now, pregnancy is a reason, not an excuse. Every woman must exercise. The primary instruments are a physical activity plan, a medical nutrition therapy, empowerment of the woman by educating and counseling to choose the right quantity, that is the serving size, and right quality that it should contain all major macro micronutrients uh, along with the fluids. Now exercises also reduces the future risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus. It should be continued after delivery. Treat every mother like an, an empress. Provide her a congenial environment for, uh, for a physical activity like an, an empress. Now pregnancy is a very unique situation where 
women are highly motivated for their baby's health if properly guided they can be encouraged to start exercises to control hyperglycemia in pregnancy it would improve the glycemic controls prevent excessive weight gain reduce the weight in the postpartum period recommendations for exercise during pregnancy whom we should advise certainly everybody who has no contraindications when to start as soon as possible when to end continue it throughout the postpartum period and also thereafter do we need to interrupt them yes if there are certain conditions like vaginal bleeding abdominal pain so they should be knowing that what are the uh, conditions when they would be uh, reporting their healthcare uh, providers like chest pain calf pains and so on now the best exercise is walk with a correct posture what should be the duration it should be half hour to an hour and it's better to split in 10 minutes sessions they should be performed every day or the minimum standard is 3 to 4 days a week but preferably it has to be on every day time of the walk is preferably after meal or snack to counter the post uh, prandial uh, rises in the glycemia the intensity of the exercise this is a very frequent question and we must guide so the talk test is a very simple uh, example the woman who can hold a talkative conversation she is not over exerting so climb no faster than you can speak so less than 60 to 80% of the age predicted maximum maternal heart rate and uh, usually this is 140 beats per minute and they must uh lie in the moderate level of self reporting intensity box the environment should be very congenial smoke free well ventilated temperature controlled and prolonged exposure to heat and extreme cold should be avoided the footwear wear should be a shock absorbing sneakers with cotton socks and the floor should not be wet guidance and supervision if needed now there are certain exercise equivalents like people going for the shopping mopping gardening washing child care and so on so they are the exercise equivalents and have be, have to be taken account for contraindications to the exercise include the medical contraindications and obstructive contraindications and uh, so they can be further divided into absolute and relative contraindication so the woman uh, at the start of exercise they have to visit a healthcare provider can make them a safe schedule unscheduled excessive routine activity hypoglycemia could be a threat the people uh, the women who are having the pharmacological therapy and they can just compensate to take the extra calories and food prior to the exercise after delivery the exercise plans should be continued to reduce the risk of type 2 diabetes mellitus dvt and slow and gradually introduce exercise according to the woman physical ability and clinical clinical condition women had who had cesarean section can resume strenuous exercise after 3 months now the safe exercise is obviously aerobics brisk walking stationary cycling swimming although diving is contraindicated modified yoga pelvic strengthening exercises strength trainings and jogging only in the previously so 
Precautions must be taken to avoid wet floors. Proper fall should be avoided. And uh, contraindicated exercise has to be the contact exercises to be avoided. The people, uh, women on the bed rest, they must do the flexion and extension of the legs in left lateral position and they can move the upper body movements the exercise equivalents so exercise can be modified for them and the woman who had orthopedic limitations they can sit on a high chair and they can exercise while sitting the walk the athlete women's the recommendations are slightly different they should be supervised the heart rates and overtraining syndrome should be avoided and they should be discontinued or modified their trainings if needed food let food be thy medicine and thy medicine shall be thy food so medical nutrition therapy is a set of principles making a customized balanced meal plan in hyperglycemia and pregnancy to achieve optimum glycemic control and long-term fetal and maternal well-being. We need a holistic approach for a wholesome meal plan and we recommend uh, nine steps. The first step is that we must set the goals assess the nutritional status and educate the woman we should differentiate between the myths and the rest the reality and they should be crystal clear concepts uh, gain and caloric requirement is needed i would just like to highlight that the recommendation for the europeans and asia pacific are different and uh, the caloric requirement for per trimester are different they are very evident in the slide. and also we must learn the glycemic indices and caloric content of the commonly used food and if you can just see that we have divided uh, the low glycemic index into two groups very very low glycemic index and low glycemic index it will help the uh, uh, women to customize their plans in a better way when we should follow the macro and micronutrient requirements you must know it the carbohydrates they are the we cannot minimize less than 175 grams per day and we can never reduce them less than 45 percent in the setting of the pregnancy because if you reduce the carbs this is going to produce ketosis and ultimately this would damage the fetal developing brain similarly Proteins has to be in proportion of 20 to 25 percent, fats in 25 to 30 percent. Fiber has to be an essential part of it and the low sodium diet and has to be promoted. meet the fluid requirement is the step six practice safe food handlings and it is not only the education of the mother education of the whole family is important learn the principles by daily meal plan distribute in three three main meals and three small snacks space each meal and snack by two to three hours preferably finish the breakfast before eat dinner before 8 pm and the maximum time uh, 
apart at night from the last food to the start of the food should not be more than 10 hours. Do not skip meal or snack. This is important that you should fix your meals and snacks and the physical activity and if there is an unscheduled physical activity monitor it and compensate. This health so, uh, showing the serving size. Left top corner is in red and is absolute contraindications. The direct sugars cannot be used. The top portion in yellow is oil which should be necessary and minimum. The dairy, it has got three servings and the important point to be noted is that it has to be less than 1% of the fat. You can see the lean proteins 114 to 170 grams and the fruits one and a half to two and a half servings and the non-starchy vegetables they have to be like four to five and a half servings. The bottom contains the grains, beans, lentils and starchy vegetables and they include the 6 to 11 servings. We must learn how to make a smart plane. Half of the plate should be filled with non-starchy vegetables. One quarter should be with the proteins one quarter with the grains and outside the pen, uh, plate content we can have less than one percent of the dairy like milk or yogurt and fruits and water is the best drink. A customized diet plan must be given. On one side there are three main courses and three snacks. The other side you can see there are options to be included into the main uh, meals and snacks. Women in this way can get a full liberty to plan the daily meal with a full variety. These are the you can choose between bread, rice, potatoes and chapati. Similarly, you can have the options for the healthy snacks. Thank you, Bereen, for a wonderful intellectual contribution to the book on diabetes and pregnancy, which is going to be launched on 12th March. And uh, four out of 121 authors are from this wonderful country. And uh, Bereen is one of the 25 countries across the globe. Yes, sir. Uh, Thank you, Professor Bedal, for excellent topics regarding non-pharmacological treatment, which we need as a pregnant women or non-pregnant women. Thank you very much. Now I will uh, uh, talk about the, the fifth the speaker, uh, Professor Delal Rumihi, uh, our uh, my uh, colleague with me in the, to chair this session, uh, Professor Delal, she's uh, head of department of internal medicine and consultant endocrinologist at King Hamad University Hospital in Bahrain. She had American board certification in internal medicine and diabetes, endocrinology and metabolism. Uh, she was consultant endocrinologist at Yama Regional Medical Center in Arizona in uh, USA. And she's uh, a program director of Saudi Board Internal Medicine Residency Program. Uh, she's associate professor at the Royal College of Surgeons of Ireland here in Bahrain. And she's a board member and chair of scientific committee at Bahrain Diabetes Society. So welcome for Professor Delal. She will, she will give us uh, the, the topics uh, about pharmacological 
therapy of hyperglycemia in pregnancy. Dr. Delal, you are welcome. Thank you so much, Dr. Maryam. Thank you, Your Excellency. Uh, it gives me great pleasure to be with you this afternoon to speak about the topic. And as a disclaimer, uh, in the guidelines itself, this sub uh, subsection was worked uh, by uh, Dr. Mohamed Suleiman, who is with us today, and Dr. S uh, Bashir Saleh. However, I have spent a few months expanding on the topic further in preparation for the book with Professor Ahmed Bilal. So when it was time to choose a topic, uh, that was a topic very near uh, and dear to me uh, due to the extensive uh, literature review that we had to go through for the book preparation. So off we go. Um, the outline of my brief talk today will be what are the target glucose values? And Dr. Zainab has already touched upon some of these. We will speak about the preferred therapeutic option. What should we give? Should we give insulin or should we give oral agents? And what oral agents should we uh, pick? We'll speak about principles of dosing insulin. And then how do we manage pregnant women with diabetes or hyperglycemia in special situations? So this is directly from the IDF uh, MENA region guidelines. Um, for monitoring of uh, glucose at home, we recommend that women are checking at least four times a day, especially at the beginning. We check fasting, we check one or two hours after meals. And then in some situations, like especially women with type one diabetes, because they are at risk of hypoglycemia that can be nocturnal hypoglycemia, we may check a bedtime or a midnight uh, glucose. Uh, you might say, why one hour or two hour? Because there are studies that have shown that all of us, if we consume carbohydrates, depending on the type of the carbohydrates in our physiology, I might peak at one hour, you might peak at two hours in terms of your uh, highest glucose value. So at the beginning, you might want to analyze that woman's glucose further by testing one and two hours, perhaps for a day or a few days, and then you will decide that you will stick with the one hour or the two hour value because it's the worst for her. And these values have been shared earlier with you uh, by Dr. Zainab. The fasting, we strive to help the women reach a glucose value below 95 or 5.3. If we're measuring one hour, it's below 140 or 7.8 millimole. If we're measuring two hours, it's below 120 milligrams or 6.7 millimole. What about technologies? Because we know now we have plenty of women using devices like continuous glucose monitors or flash glucose monitor, like the lady in this picture in front of you. So two things to do here. First, we have to adjust the settings. There will be a setting option where you will have to pick the time of glucose, the time and range. So for pregnancy, we recommend to keep the time and range between 3.5 and 7.8 millimole or 63 to 140 milligram per deciliter. So that's the first thing you do. The second thing is when you're monitoring these ladies, when they're coming for follow-up, the target that you're trying to achieve for women with type 2 diabetes who are pregnant or GDM is to keep the time and range at 90%, allowing only 5% for hypoglycemia or hyperglycemia. However, as you see here in the table, if we're dealing with women with type 1 diabetes, because of the higher chance of hypoglycemia, we permit some further hyperglycemia up to 25%, allowing the time and range to be just around 70%. So what do we, what do we prefer uh, as the first option of therapy? You might see doctors are doing it differently, recommending uh, either to start with insulin or starting with orals. And let's go through why. Uh, if you look here on the right, there are some societies that will advocate as the first choice to start with oral anti-diabetic medications, like the Society for Maternal Fetal Medicine in the US or the NICE guidelines. However, if you look at these set of societies, like the American College of Obstetrics and Gynecologies, uh, American Diabetes Association, Canadian Diabetes Association, and the Australian Diabetes and Pregnancy Society, they all advocate to always start with insulin first. How about the IDF MENA region guidelines? Well, what we said is we go with insulin first because insulin has been considered for years as the gold standard of therapy in pregnancy, and it is supported by rigorous, extensive amount of data to support its safety. And this statement here, I will show you in the next slide. We took it directly from the IDF guidelines. 
because the IDF uh, recommendations for hyperglycemia in pregnancy recommends to start with insulin with or without metformin in addition to diet and exercise as the first line treatment in uh, uh, GDM, especially if you have already signs that this could be pre existing like if you have a blood glucose of more, a fasting of more than 126 or a two hour value more than 200. Now you might notice that the FIGO, so the International Federation of Gynecology and Obstetrics has conditional recommendation. So they do advocate for going for oral agents first, and if that fails, go to insulin. However, they do recommend that there are four situations that you will anticipate failure with oral medications and hence, it's best to start with insulin. These four situations are as well. That's if you have, um, if you can please mute among the panelists, somebody's mic is open. So for instance, if you have hyperglycemia diagnosed below 20 weeks, so this is probably somebody with pre-existing diabetes. If you have hyperglycemia diagnosed after 30 weeks where you do not really have the luxury of time to try and fail and come back, you just have to do it quickly and properly. Or if you have fasting glucose more than 6.1 or the lady has gained more than 12 kgs and you anticipate there will be resistance and you'll need insulin. Um, why would uh, us, why would uh, doctors, uh, patients, nurses be torn to do, do I want to use orals first or do I want to use insulin first? Well, if you look on the right side, orals will be attractive because of convenience. It's of course easier to take a tablet than to take injections. However, the limitation here is the lack of long-term safety data. We have very good data on short-term safety and I'll share that with you in a few slides, but the long-term data is lacking. However, if you look here on the left side of the table in favor of insulin, insulin is fantastic. It's very effective. It is safe. Uh, you are able to titrate the doses with ease, but it comes at a cost. The cost of the insulin itself, the cost of needed monitoring, because these women will need to be more careful about testing their glucose. They might need more visits. So it's all adds to the cost of care. Um, I would intuitively anticipate that if I have to ask people to inject, they are less adherent, there is higher chance of hypoglycemia. And of course, with insulin, there is additional weight gain. So what are the principles of using insulin if insulin is what you would pick uh, to give the pregnant woman? Just a reminder of uh, basics of insulin, time to onset and duration of action, because this information is very helpful when we dose patients with basal bolus insulin. So basal insulin are the three options you have in the bottom of the table, NPH insulin, Detemir or Levemir, Glargine or Lantus. And these are long acting insulins. They do not act immediately. It takes about two hours for it to start working. And the duration of action is shown on the right. So the most popular insulin here is insulin Detemir because it is supported by strong a randomized control trial showing its evidence uh, of safety in women with diabetes and pregnancy. And it lasts around 18 to 26 hours. Sometimes you can manage by once a day dose, but sometimes you'll need to give it twice a day. Now, if a, if a pregnant woman with type 1 diabetes, say, or type 2 diabetes was stable on, on Glargine, it is fine to keep them in pregnancy and there's evidence to support its safety. Uh, on top here, you will have four options of quick acting insulin or mealtime insulin or bolus insulin. And the fact that these insulin, for instance, work within 15 minutes is a reminder to tell patients to please inject, wait 15 minutes and then eat because it takes that long for the insulin to start working. And to remember that the duration of action is four hours. So you don't want this lady to inject closer than every four hours to avoid insulin stacking and then hypoglycemia. And as you notice here, regular insulin will need to be injected even further in advance of the meal, which is not very convenient, but it is very affordable. And we understand in the IDF MENA region, we come from different resources and we have to be able to successfully manage uh, diabetes care in all of the region. This is a busy slide. I took it directly as, a, as an image from the uh, book. I just want to highlight a few practical tips from this table. Let's look at point number two. We do not recommend using premixed insulin because it doesn't give you a lot of flexibility and it increases the risk of hypoglycemia. Another good tip is number three. 
follow up, follow up, follow up. You cannot be successful no matter what dose you or regimen you have designed for a patient without proper follow up. And in this day and age, we have lots of advances thanks to COVID with like whether uh, telehealth or teleconsultation and multiple solutions connectivity between us and patients. And of course, not to neglect the valuable asset we have in the clinic, diabetes nurses who can communicate on our behalf with our patients and monitor their glucose closely. And also just a good tip here is number four, if you have a pregnant woman who is vomiting, so you're not sure if she will consume the carbohydrates that she is desiring to have for the meal, in that exception, we can say, take the mealtime insulin post meal. Uh, what about the oral agents? What will we recommend? The king of all until now is metformin. Metformin is supported by strong history of evidence um, of its use in, in um, diabetes in general. The, the disadvantage of metformin is it does cross the placenta. The level reaching the baby is 200%. Do we know that this is entirely safe? Probably is um, because there is no evidence of teratogenicity. Um, it is, there's no link with congenital anomalies. But we do not have long-term data. There are current studies that are up to nine years in offspring of women who were exposed, their offsprings were exposed to uh, metformin in utero. And it is encouraging, except for some increased risk of adiposity and obesity. Um, however, all other parameters seem reassuring and there are longer term studies currently in progress. So we will hear more reassuring information about metformin in the future. When we start metformin, we usually start at 500 milligram and we start it twice daily post meal to ease the GI adverse effects and we can up to the maximum dose, which is typically two grams per day. If that doesn't work in two weeks, my, my recommendation is to switch to insulin. Glyburide is not recommended. It might have been recommended years ago. Uh, but when you compare it to the other better options, whether metformin or insulin, it fails. So in the second bullet here, compared to insulin, uh, glyburide um, causes less maternal weight gain. So that's a good thing. However, there is a higher chance of high birth weight, increased macrosomia, higher rate of neonatal hypoglycemia. And in a meta-analysis that compared metformin and glyburide, they found that metformin is the advantageous option. It causes less macrosomia and uh, large registrational age birth. So in the IDF uh, recommendations, we recommend not to use glyburide. In, a, in an exception, you might when you have no other option. If you have a woman who's refusing insulin and you cannot give metformin for some reason, glyburide might be an option to consider. Finally, concluding with some special situations and how we deal with them. So what do you do when you are uh, starting women on steroids? Our colleagues in obstetrics to improve uh, lung maturity of the um, fetal lung maturation might be betamethasone or dexamethasone. So we know that these agents will increase insulin resistance and increase hyperglycemia. These women are typically admitted. So when they're uh, consulting us in the inpatient setting, we recommend that they test their glucose before meals, after meals, and then at bedtime, so seven times a day. And usually you will need to increase the dose. And this is directly the work of Dr. Bashir Saleh and Dr. Mohamed Suleiman in the guidelines. So you will increase the night's dose by usually 25% uh, on day one. Day two and three, you will increase by 40%. Day four and five, perhaps 20%. And you will carefully monitor and taper as the effect of steroids wear out. I want to talk about type 1 diabetes uh, in pregnancy. This is um, a table or a chart that shows us what's happening to their insulin doses during pregnancy in comparison to their pre-pregnancy dose. And you will notice that up to 16 weeks, the doses are typically the same as they've been before pregnancy, maybe a little less or the same. But starting from 16 weeks onward, with the expansion of the um, hormones from the placenta that counter-regulates the effect of insulin, there's more insulin resistance and more requirements to increase the dose, typically 5% increment of the dose every week. And it keeps going on that way until 33 weeks where there might be a decline, but staying within a typically uh, acceptable range uh, nonetheless. 
Uh, a point of caution here or a word of caution here is if you suddenly say you're at 29 or at 31 weeks and you suddenly have a woman who's pregnant with type 1 and has reduced requirements for insulin, that's a clue that there might be a problem with the placenta, like placental abruption, placental insufficiency. And we recommend that uh, if you're a primary care physician, an internist, an endocrinologist, and you observe that there's sudden need to increase the doses, to refer them urgently for obstetric obstetricians to evaluate if there is any placental insufficiency. As Dr. Zainab beautifully um, described, women with type 2 diabetes have to be carefully assessed, counseled, and treated pre-conception, and we alter the regimen to safer options. So here, metformin and insulin, and we will probably target tighter control than the usual control because we want an A1C if we can achieve a 6%. And all contraindicated medications, whether they are statins, ACE, ARBs, and other diabetes medications that are not studied extensively in pregnancy, will be uh, omitted uh, before the pregnancy. So my, my 15 minutes are up. I'll just conclude with a few resources. We have created a few resources that can help you from Bahrain Diabetes Society. Uh, I worked on a piece uh, directed to patients. It's simple. It's in Arabic and it's in English. Uh, you will find it published in Bahrain Diabetes Society newsletter and the newsletter is electronic and it's available on the website for Bahrain Diabetes Society which is bdsbahrain.org. I welcome you all to browse through our website and see our valuable resources there and if you haven't downloaded the guidelines yet uh, this is a, your chance to uh, just aim your camera on this QR code and you can easily download, download the PDF file and I will again uh, re-emphasize that I would like you to keep it with you in your office, keep it with you on your desktop, refer to it when you have a, a situation where you're not sure what to do. Maybe the 29 of us who worked on this can tell you what to do in that situation. And if you want to communicate with me directly, this is my email. If you want to join Bahrain Diabetes Society Scientific Committee, if you want to work with us on projects, I'll be delighted to work with you. Thank you all. Thank you, Dr. Delal, for this excellent uh, topics regarding pharmacological therapy of hyperglycemia in pregnancy. And thanks for uh, what you mentioned regarding the journals of Bahrain Diabetes Society. Uh, now I will give you the floor to introduce uh, Dr. Mohammed Suleiman, Dr. Delal. Thank you, Dr. Maryam. Welcome, Dr. Mohamed Suleiman, to this session. Ahlan wa sahlan. Dr. Adalal. So Dr. Mohamed Suleiman is um, our dear colleague in writing the guidelines. He worked as a consultant endocrinologist in the UK from 2001 to 2012 before joining us here in the region in the Imperial College London Diabetes uh, Center in Al Ain, UAE as a consultant endocrinologist since 2012. And there he is also the lead doctor for medical guidelines. He did endocrinology research, which culminated in achieving a doctorate of medicine from the University of Sheffield in the UK. He graduated from the University of Khartoum, Sudan, and trained in general medicine, diabetes, and endocrinology in the UK. And he's a wealth of knowledge and a very nice guy to work with. So welcome to this session. Thank you very much, Dr. Adelal, for the very nice introduction. And I'm really very pleased to meet uh, my colleagues from the IDF MENA guideline group. It's really great to see you again. C can you see my slides? Not yet. Yes, now we can. Yes. OK. OK, so uh, thanks very much. And uh, yeah, so my task is to talk to you about diabetes emergencies in pregnancy. And when we talk about uh, <clears throat> diabetes emergencies in pregnancy, um, diabetic ketoacidosis, although not common, is probably is the most important uh, because it's, it can be quite serious. Uh, so I'll, the bulk of my talk would be about DKA. Um, much less common than DKA is acute hyperglycemia with no ketoacidosis. Um, so we'll talk about that and then finally talk a little bit about hypoglycemia. Okay, so first about DKA. Um, according to this review published in 2013, um, the prevalence of DKA in pregnancy is between 1% to 3%. This is usually in patients with type 1 diabetes, uh, particularly those who have been recently diagnosed type 1 diabetes. Much less commonly, it can affect type 2 diabetes, and rarely it has been reported in patients with gestational diabetes. 
Um, with modern management of DKA, the maternal mortality is not high. It's uh, estimated at less than 1%. However, uh, the rate of fetal loss is uh, quite high, estimated at between 9 to 35%. And um, just one word about the pathophysiology. Um, what happens usually in DKA is there is an imbalance between insulin and the counterregulatory hormone. So there is absolute insulin deficiency and there is an excess of the counterregulatory hormones, uh, glucagon, catecholamines, cortisol, and growth hormone. Um, the precipitating factors for um, diabetes, uh, for diabetic ketosis in pregnancy are similar to those outside pregnancy. Um, so uh, infection is uh, the commonest. Um, issues with compliance, so people not taking their insulin or not taking enough insulin can be a reason. Um, Dr. Dara has just mentioned uh, steroids given some, sometimes for uh, ladies who go into premature labor, so that can be a precipitating factor um, uh, by giving uh, uh, steroids with adrenergic agonists. Women who use pumps uh, because the insulin in pumps is, uh, has a very short half-life, uh, if there is pump failure, that can reason for DKA. However, this is quite rare with modern pumps. Um, very important to make the diagnosis of DKA, really now the guidelines stress that we have to have the three points, the three criteria. So we need the D, we need the K, and we need the A. So the D, uh, which is diabetic for hyperglycemia, the general cutoff level um, um, expected or, or um, as a condition to make the diagnosis is 200 milligram per deciliter or more of glucose. However, uh, especially in ladies who are pregnant, you can actually have diabetic ketoacidosis with a lower level than this. This is what's called euglycemic ketoacidosis, which is commoner in pregnancy. Um, K, uh, K stands for ketones. Ideally, if we can measure them in the blood, that's the best. And we need a plasma ketone level of three millimole per liter or more. If that test is not available, at least demonstrating the presence of ketones in urine is important uh, by you doing a simple urine dipstick. And the third uh, condition is to have the acidosis. So you can, this can be confirmed by either having a low bicarbonate at less than 15 or pH of less than 7.3. The principles of managing DKA in pregnancy, again, are not different from outside pregnancy. However, there are some important points just to uh, consider. So as I mentioned, DKA in, in pregnancy is a very serious emergency, with this, especially with high uh, fetal loss. Um, so, and for this reason, management should really be in an intensive care unit. And outside pregnancy, there are criteria for uh, uh, ICU, manage, uh, ICU care. But in pregnancy, it should always be in ICU. Um, and it should be by a multidisciplinary team. So we should have at least a diabetologist, an intensive care physician, uh, an obstetrician, midwife, and trained uh, ICU nurses. And a very important uh, point to make here is that stabilization of the condition of the mother should always uh, be prioritized over uh, plans for delivering the fetus. So uh, go, I'll go by the clinical criteria. So history, uh, usually there is uh, osmotic symptoms of thirst and polyuria. Uh, very commonly, uh, nausea and vomiting do happen. And some ladies may have abdominal pain. Examination-wise, there is usually tachycardia, and some people may have low blood pressure. There is usually tachypnea, high respiratory rate, and some ladies, uh, some patients with DKA have what's called Cosmol's respiration or air hunger. There are usually signs of dehydration. Uh, there might be a, a smell of ketotic breath, and there might be some impairment of consciousness with initially some confusion, and then and some ladies may present in coma. Regarding investigations, there are very immediate investigations just to confirm the diagnosis, to do immediately when the patient arrives in a &E or uh, where they arrive. So capillary glucose, using a glucose meter to check for the glucose. Uh, do, uh, doing, looking for the acidosis by uh, pH or bicarbonates. You, usually a venous sample is enough. However, if the condition of the patient dictates it, then one may, not, may need to do an arterial blood gas. And the other uh, test to do very urgently is to check for ketones. So if a blood uh, uh, ketone checking is available, that should be done. If not, a urine dipstick for ketones. Other uh, tests which should also be done urgently include a plasma glucose to be sent to the lab to confirm the hyperglycemia, urine electrolytes, mainly to look at the potassium level, uh, complete blood count, and, and a midstream urine. Some patients may need the blood culture if uh, there is a suspicion of infection. An ECG may be indicated, and some ladies may need a chest X-ray um, to uh, confirm if there is a chest infection. 
as I said, the, the principles are similar to outside pregnancy. So these are the main principles of management of DKA. We'll go through them briefly. So intravenous fluids is the main um, element of treatment, giving uh, insulin intravenously and replacing potassium. Very important to uh, look for the precipitating cause and try to treat it. Doing fetal assessment for the pregnant lady uh, to see what the situation of the fetus is like. And once the DKA has resolved, uh, transition to subcutaneous insulin. Uh, monitoring, very important. So hourly should do pulse, blood pressure, respiratory rate, looking at the fluid input and output and checking the capillary glucose. And uh, potassium and bicarbonate should be done at least every four hours. Um, as I said, the main uh, point, the, the main uh, element of uh, management of DKA is replacement of fluids because there is a, a large degree of dehydration. And estimated that uh, the fluid deficit is roughly about 100 mil per kilogram for an average person. The fluid of choice is 0.9% normal saline. Um, when the glucose drops to level around 250 milligram per deciliter, the fluid should be changed to 10% dextrose to allow giving insulin and to avoid hypoglycemia. This table just, just gives a rough guide into the amount of fluid that's needed. However, uh, the one should use judgment. So some patients may need more if they are very hypotensive in shock, and some patients may need a less uh, or slower rate of fluid. Potassium replacement, as I said, is very important because there is uh, a large uh, total body deficit of potassium and um, uh, hypokalemia can actually be quite serious, can be one of the causes of mortality because it can cause cardiac arrhythmias. And the aim is to maintain the potassium level of between four to five. Uh, this table is from the Joint British Diabetes Society's guideline. It gives a guide on to how much potassium chloride to give with each liter of fluid. Uh, intravenous insulin infusion, again, that's an important part of the management. So usually people use soluble human insulin, and this is usually given intravenously. And now the recommendation is that it should be given at a fixed rate infusion. So usually the recommendation is to give 0.1 unit per kilogram per hour. When, uh, if the targets are not achieved, obviously one would monitor the glucose every hour. If targets are not achieved, then one can increase the rate. Uh, it can be increased by one unit per hour every hour. A very important point to make here is that if the potassium initially is low at less than 3.3, very low potassium, uh, here, if you give, if you give insulin, uh, it can push potassium into cells and can worsen the hypokalemia, which can be quite serious. So in these situations, one should withhold insulin and replace potassium until the potassium is above 3.3, and then insulin can be started. And another point which has been recommended in the recent guidelines is that ladies who are on basal uh, insulin analogs, this should be continued because it's usually helpful when the DKA has resolved to have some background insulin around. Uh, as I said, it's very important to identify the precipitating cause. So here, obviously, one should take a good history, uh, do an examination to direct the investigations appropriately. Uh, and it's important to remember that one of the commonest causes is omitting insulin or not taking enough insulin. So uh, patients may need education for that. So uh, the, once the DKA has resolved, one should uh, move to subcutaneous insulin. And the criteria for the resolution of DKA is that the acidosis should be corrected by uh, demonstrating that the pH is above 7.3 or the bicarbonate is above 15. Uh, if you have plasma ketone measurement, then the level should be less than 0.6 millimoles per liter. Um, you, during doing uh, urine dipstick for uh, for uh, ketones is not reliable because it, it, you can continue to have some ketones in the urine while the decay has resolved. Uh, but another criteria for resolution is that the patient should be well and eating and drinking before one converts them to subcutaneous insulin. Uh, so as I say, once uh, it is resolved, you go to subcutaneous insulin. If they are already on insulin, go to the back to the usual regime. For those who are newly diagnosed diabetic, then one should start them on insulin. As, as Dr. Deral mentioned, the ideal is a basal bolus regime. Uh, and generally, a total dose of between 0 0.5 to 0 0.7 units per kilogram per day uh, is recommended. And here, it's important to remember that uh, if you give subcutaneous insulin, you have to keep the IV insulin going for at least an hour uh, because you need to allow time for the subcutaneous insulin uh, to be absorbed. Uh, fetal assessment is important. And here, the decision to deliver really should be based, should be individualized and should be based on a number of factors. So of number one is of course the maternal clinical situation. We need, we need to make sure that the, the woman is stable. Uh, fetal gestational age is a factor and, and the situation with the fetal heart monitoring. Um, uh, fetal losses are, are common with DKA, uh, but the reports and series have shown that most of these uh, fetal losses actually occur before the DKA has been diagnosed. 
And I think Dr. Dalal just mentioned that uh, we need to be careful with giving uh, betamethasone for premature labor because it can worsen the decay. Prevention is very important. So we need to remind, especially type one diabetic patients about the sick day rule. So we need to remind them about continuing their insulin, even when they are not feeling well. Uh, if they are obviously a common mistake that they are worried about hypoglycemia and they stop insulin. And when they are vomiting and not eating, they, they think they have hypoglycemia. So they should be advised to monitor more frequently to, to confirm that is actually, most of them will be hyperglycemic and not hypoglycemic. Uh, what, uh, what can help them sometimes is to take carbohydrates in a liquid form, with, uh, which is covered by uh, short acting insulin. And very importantly, if, uh, if they are worried at any time, uh, they should not delay seeking help. And the next uh, emergency to talk about briefly is acute hyperglycemia without DKA. So here, of course, the priority number one is to, ru to rule out DKA. And once you've ruled out DKA, then the next priority is to decide that, does this lady need to be admitted to hospital or can she be managed as outpatient? If she's vomiting, if she's not able to take orally, uh, then of course she'll need to be stabilized in hospital. Um, the first uh, th thing to do so, do an assessment to find out why she's hyperglycemic. And commonly there might be something like a urinary tract infection, could be hyperemesis. Uh, if they are dehydrated, uh, they should be rehydrated with uh, ideally with giving intravenous uh, saline. Um, if they are on insulin, then we need to review the insulin regime and step up the doses. And the glycemic targets have, have only been, uh, have already been shown to you by Dr. Dalal and Dr. Zainab. Um, very important point here is to avoid giving what's called the subcutaneous sliding scale because it's been shown to cause a lot of fluctuations uh, in glucose levels. Um, some women with hyperglycemia may be stable to be treated as, as outpatient. So, and this is if they are eating and drinking well. So what we need to do is give them glycemic targets, uh, keep in touch with them, give them clear advice on how to step up their insulin. If they are on orals like metformin or rarely uh, glibenclamide, then they should be transferred to insulin. And um, we should uh, teach them uh, to check for ketones because we don't want them to go into DKA. So if they can do uh, plasma ketones, that's ideal. If not, urinary deep stick for ketones, uh, re-educate them on the sick day rules, and of course, arrange follow-up. And, and the last emergency to talk about quickly is hypoglycemia has been touched upon by colleagues before. And this is just uh, an audit done in the UK by Diabetes UK in 2018. And it showed that over one in 10 women with type one diabetes were actually admitted to hospital with acute hypoglycemia during their pregnancy. So it's, so it's very common, uh, a very common emergency in, in pregnant ladies uh, with type one diabetes. Um, this is a recommendation from the American Diabetes Association. They recommend for treating hypoglycemia, what they call the rule of 15. So give glucose, uh, a dose of between uh, 15 to 20 grams, uh, this is a preferred treatment if the patient is conscious, of course, uh, and if they have hypoglycemia with a level of less than 70 milligrams per deciliter. Uh, so 15 to 20 grams, any form of carbohydrate which contains quickly absorbed uh, uh, glucose is, will, will be uh, fine. So juice, dates, sugar, honey, any of these, uh, whatever is available immediately should be given. And 15 minutes after this, the blood sh glucose should be checked again, blood glucose monitoring. And if they are still hypoglycemic, less than 70, another dose of 15 grams uh, should be given. Once the blood glucose has gone up, uh, then they should be given either a meal or a snack uh, to prevent uh, the hypoglycemia uh, uh, staying or recurring, especially because of, a lot of this will, will, will be on insulin or orals uh, and they are at risk of hypoglycemia. So you want to maintain uh, the normal glucose levels. If the patient is unconscious, uh, then the ideal treatment is to give glucagon, which can be given either subcutaneously or um, intramuscularly. However, a re recently, uh, an intranasal preparation has been made. Um, the alternative, uh, apart from glucagon, is to give intravenous glucose. And this can be given in the form of 50% uh, dextrose, uh, which can be given over a period of one to three minutes. And again, uh, in about 15 minutes time, uh, the glucose should be checked. If it's still less than 70, then th the dose should be treated. Um, um, and once the glucose has improved, then they should be uh, helped to have a meal or a snack uh, to maintain the uh, glycemic levels. Um, and very importantly, to prevent hypoglycemia happening again, these patients will need education. Uh, previous colleagues uh, uh, touched on this. So education, not just for the patient, but also for family members. Uh, we need to educate them about preventing hypoglycemia, how to recognize it, and how to treat it. So to summarize, 
Um, I think that diabetic ketoacidosis is really the most important and the most serious emergency because it's associated, associated with the high fetal loss rate. Um, and because it's very serious, um, uh, it should be managed in an intensive care unit and by a multidisciplinary team. The coronary stones for managing DKA include intravenous fluids, the most important, intravenous insulin as well, and potassium replacement is also very important. Um, hypoglycemia is also very common in pregnancy, but it is preventable. And really the, the main take home message here is education, 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 that is uh, important to prevent DKA, but also prevents acute hyperglycemia without DKA and also important to prevent hypoglycemia. Uh, thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Dr. Mohammed, for excellent uh, topic regarding uh, the diabetes emergency and pregnancy. And would like, inshallah, next time we have to see you instead of this uh, online. Thank you very much. Now we reach the last speaker, uh, our last speaker from Bahrain, Dr. Abir Sawir. Dr. Abir, she's a consultant family physician and diabetologist and public health consultant in the NCD, non-communicable disease section at the Ministry of Health in Bahrain. Uh, and she's assistant professor in family and community medicine department. We are also a member in scientific committee at Bahrain Diabetic Society. Dr. Abir, you are welcome and the floor for you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Mariam, for this uh, lovely presentation. Thank you, Dr. Adelal, and thank you, Mdu, for inviting us for this uh, very pertinent and important guidelines, which, which carries many of uniqueness and uh, uh, pertinence to the region. And uh, I hope I'll be the eyes on the top of the cake because the eminent speakers that, that preceded me have done a lot and uh, have uh, highlighted so many topics, but I would like to uh, uh, particularly indicate that the topics that uh, I'll be covering are so unique to these guidelines and makes these guidelines um, stand out among other guidelines in the region. Uh, so I told Abir, she will give us on postpartum management and the breastfeeding and contraception. Uh, which is related to her as family physician consultant. Yes, that, that's true. And it's very important that we are incorporating uh, such sections in the diabetes guideline that we are um, as Ministry of Health and uh, NCD section and the primary care uh, section. We are doing guidelines for type 2 diabetes in primary care. And we incorporated uh, co contraception and breastfeeding in, uh, as a separate section in the guidelines. So without do a delay, um, thank you very much. And I will proceed with the postpartum management. Um, so uh, the postpartum period, the immediate postpartum period is crucial in terms of addressing the immediate perinatal problems and for the early preventive health of both mother and child who are at risk for future obesity, metabolic syndrome, diabetes, hypertension, cardiovascular disorders. Postpartum management of women with pre-existing diabetes is different than postpartum management for, for women with gestational diabetes, but we always, always have to encourage breastfeeding immediately after delivery and supported by all means, either physical or um, uh, educational means. Uh, we provide, you should provide women with post-delivery plan to reduce pre-pregnancy insulin pump dosage settings or readjust antihyperglycemic drugs and record this in your birth on whatever document so you can document the progress of the patient. Screen women with type 1 diabetes for thyroid hormone abnormalities uh, because they are very popular due in endocrinology during pregnancy and approximately one to three months postpartum. Provide appropriate hygiene, antibiotics, and proper glycemic control in order to detect early signs of infection for the breast, genitourinary tract, and surgical site infections. As for the ladies with uh, postpartum management for ladies with GDM, then uh, again, encourage breastfeeding, then inform women with previous GDM, uh, as well as their families and caregivers about their increased risk for the development of type two diabetes and advise lifelong screening that we'll touch upon in a, in a while. 
and offer lifestyle advices, weight control, diet and exercise and ointformin if appropriate to prevent or delay progression to type 2 diabetes, which is about um, the, 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 uh, the progression to type 2 diabetes may occur in 50 to 70% in the next uh, 50, five to 10 years if mother is not compliant. A screen women with a recent history of GDM with 75 gram OGTT after four to 12 weeks postpartum by using the non-pregnant WHO criteria, followed by six months postpartum if possible, then one year later followed by yearly or every other three years. In our guidelines in Diabetes in Bahrain, we recommend screening these ladies yearly because we are a high risk population and we need to emphasize on the progression to, to diabetes with those with GDM. Now, if, if we want to screen afterwards, after the postpartum period, either fasting blood sugar, A1C, or OGTT can be used interchangeably. No one uh, test is preferable to the other. Um, screen all components of the metabolic syndrome in that situation, because these ladies are uh, potential diabetics, so, so they have the insulin resistance syndrome or the metabolic syndrome, because it's more prevalent in this population. Advise women about using proper contraceptive methods, and I'll touch on, uh, uh, upon it in a while. Uh, counsel women to attend preconception management clinics, if any, or to, uh, to be referred to the uh, concerned diabetologist in her region or in a, a place before planning for their next pregnancy. Psychosocial assessment is very important and support for cell care should be included and encouraged to enable women and their families to carry out diabetes care tasks. What about the pharmacological management in women with pre-existing diabetes in the immediate postpartum period? Uh, you might continue and should continue blood glucose monitoring in women who were on metformin or on low dose insulin, less than 0.5 units per kg per day by fasting blood sugar, and the two hour postprandial for the next about 48 to 78 hours. Then uh, this frequency can be adjusted according to the results of the uh, glucose monitoring. In women with pre existing diabetes, nevertheless, uh, with an insulin requirement of more than one unit per kg per day, you might, might be more stringent, and the insulin dose may be reduced by two uh, to 50% of the postpartum leap. However, in the case of uh, uh, those in insulin of 0.5 to one unit uh, per kg per day, the dose needs to be individualized according to the monitoring of blood sugar. Resume and continue medications, either metformin or insulin women with pre-existing type 2 after birth according to her monitoring, blood sugar monitoring. Advised women with pre-existing diabetes see their primary care or diabetologist postnatally for further management of diabetes. Uh, what about the pharmacological management in women with GDM? Uh, women with GDM usually revert to normal glycemia after delivery, but um, this guideline does not recommend only stopping, modify first or monitor, then stop pharmacological treatment according to the postpartum target uh, of uh, fasting blood sugar or according to the uh, glucose monitoring. And the postpartum target for fasting blood sugar is less than 5.5. We revert back to the non-pregnant uh, situation. This is the same as the non-pregnant women. Uh, uh, glucose monitoring should be stopped whenever appropriate, if there is no pharmacotherapy as well. Uh, and readjust the medications for women in pharmacotherapy, stop pharmacological therapy if, if, you, if the monitoring does not show any uh, increase in blood sugar immediately after birth being vaginal or C-section. Uh, continue uh, blood glucose monitoring four times a day if necessary and stop monitoring uh, 24 after birth, all preprandial uh, mon uh, uh, glucose monitoring are between four and seven. Uh, blood glucose monitoring may continue every four to six hours uh, till oral food is allowed and thereafter two hours postprandially according to blood glucose levels during the immediate post-op period in the case of C-section. Stop IV fluids uh, early if diet is tolerated and seek medical review if diet is not tolerated or the monitoring of blood sugar shows a, a sugar, a blood sugar of below four. However, consider replenishing uh, uh, by 4% dextrose and 0.18 or 18% sodium chloride or Hartman's and dextrose one liter IV 12 hourly if necessary. So this uh, deduct my first section. This uh, the next section is breastfeeding. And 
uh, all women should be encouraged, all women, diabetic or non-diabetic, should be encouraged and supported to attend breastfeeding. Breastfeeding is known to offer long-term uh, long metabolic benefits to both mother and offspring. Furthermore, it protects the, uh, from several complications occurring in infant and mother, including reduction of childhood obesity, type 1 diabetes, type 2 diabetes, and it helps with postpartum weight loss. Women with pre-existing diabetes should be given additional support and encouragement to breastfeed as they tend to have delayed milk production due to poor glycemic control, if any. What are the recommendations? Uh, as I said before, as we only encourage women with pre-existing diabetes to breastfeed immediately after a delivery and for at least six months postpartum, as it may contribute to the reduction of neonatal hypoglycemia, offspring obesity, and prevent the development of diabetes. Consult with the lactation consultant, if available, diabetes educator, MCH supervisor, to support women needing help with positioning, initiation, of breastfeeding, or overall support. Explain to women with pre-existing diabetes who were treated with insulin to have a meal or snack available before or during feeds to avoid hypoglycemia. And as I said before, reduce insulin doses immediately during the postpartum period by approximately 30 to 50%, depends on your blood sugar monitoring, and to avoid hypoglycemia in breastfed women and breastfeeding women. For women on insulin pump, you may consider reducing basal insulin by at least 50% after delivery to avoid hypoglycemia. Advise women to avoid any medicine for the treatment of diabetes complications that were discontinued for safety reasons during the preconception period. This is a, uh, in the immediate postpartum period. Women with pre-existing type 2 diabetes who are breastfeeding can resume or continue to take metformin and glavinclamide immediately after birth, but should avoid other oral glycemic uh, lowering agents while breastfeeding. And Dr. Dalal was kind enough to construct such a nice a table which delineates uh, the medication, the oral hypoglycemic medication, uh, the, all the medications available, uh, their present or absence of milk, and their atrophic, atrophic light approach where, uh, where are the medications are safe, green to use, where are they in a gray zone, yellow, you may individualize their use, or it is red zone that no evidence has shown or there is a contraindication in evidence to show breast, uh, taking this medication while breastfeeding. So I'll start with metformin. Yes, it's present in breast milk, but in general, it is supported uh, by wealth of uh, evidence that is safe for a long time. And uh, the, uh, uh, the uh, concentration of metformin available in breast milk is very little that makes it, renders it safe. What about glycoside? Unknown, but there is um, a contraindication in uh, uh, using it in breastfeeding mothers. So it's traffic light red. Glimipramide, unknown, but um, you, you may compromise the need and see if the, you can uh, sway uh, or uh, delay its uh, use or use it. It depends on the benefit against the uh, uh, risk. Uh, Glimipramide, um, it is safe, but even though we need to be careful and it's, it's not uh, sure it's present in the uh, breast milk, uh, it can be detected in the uh, serum of breastfeeding infant six days after birth. So we're not sure about that, but according to the manufacturer, uh, the risk of hypoglycemia makes, it, makes us a little bit shaky about using it in uh, lactating women. Uh, DPP-4s are, we don't know if it's present in breast milk or not, and according to manufacturer, the, the risk uh, and the benefits should be outweighed. What about TZDs like pegalitazone? Uh, again, the same recommendation. Uh, SGLT2s, um, that's not known if it's present in breast milk, but due to potential for serious adverse reactions in the breastfeeding infant, uh, breastfeeding is not recommended by the manufacturer, and we're given it a uh, bread red uh, recommendation. Acarbose, uh, unknown to be present in breast milk. Breastfeeding is not recommended by the manufacturer. However, less than 2% of an oral dose of acarbose absorbed systematically in adults, which may render it uh, very traceable in children. But uh, we don't know the risk against the benefit. Repaglinide, due to its potential uh, cause uh, and uh, effect on uh, glucose level causing hypoglycemia, it's contraindicated in lactating women. Uh, the GLPs, uh, one uh, agonist, unknown if it's present in breast milk, 
Uh, nevertheless, you may weigh the risk against the benefits. Uh, on the other hand, oral semaglutide, which is an oral G GLP uh, agonist, is not known uh, if it's present in breast milk. And the oral formulation also contains uh, salcaparazate uh, sodium, and it's not known if uh, snack is present in breast milk or not. So it is it uh, it's rendered uh, not uh, uh, favorable in lactating women. This uh, ends my section about breastfeeding. I'll uh, proceed to contraception, and this section um, was introduced in this guidelines and. Um, not available in all other guidelines, I have to say that. Um, so uh, we need to be cautious about family planning schemes, including contraception use that's either permanent or reversible and should be offered to the lady, either in a permanent or reversible fashion, according to her preference, and should be discussed with all women with diabetes who are of contraceptive or reproductive age. The aim of this is to uh, ensure that pregnancy is planned when the mother's metabolic health is optimum to reduce the risks of spontane spontaneous abortions or congenital malformations. Uh, the WHO medical eligibility criteria, MEC, uh, for contraceptives uh, may be considered for the categorization of contraceptive methods into beneficial categories. This is the MEC uh, criteria. And we can notice on the left of your screen, uh, category one and two, these are conditions where which there is no restriction for the use of the contraceptive method. This is one. Two, a condition where the advantage of using the method uh, generally outweighs the theoretical proven risks. So these are the common safe um, contraceptive methods. While MEC three and four conditions where the theoretical or proven risks usually outweighs the advantages of using the method, and four a condition that represents an unacceptable health risk if the contraceptive method is used. Having put this in mind, we'll proceed with the different kinds of um, available contraceptive methods that we can recommend for our ladies. So the most popular hormonal contraceptive therapy. Dr. Abir, you have two minutes. Is that okay? Yeah. Give me five, please. Uh, recommend uh, combined hormonal contraception, including combined contraceptive pills, transdermal contraceptive patches, combined vaginal rings. I understand not all of them are present in our countries, but uh, whatever is present in your country and combined injectable contraception in women less than 35 years of age without comorbidities such as hypertension, nephropathy, and retinopathy. This is MEC2. And women with these comorbidities, we are transferred to MEC3 and 4. Uh, recommend in that situation, if you, your lady cannot, uh, uh, and she's in category three or four, then progesterone only pill for women with diabetes, especially lactating mothers of any age, regardless of their complication status. Long acting, another method of contraception, long acting reversible contraception, uh, uh, contraceptives, LARCs, including levongrestrel, uh, intrauterine devices, lingus based systems, progesterone only injectable contraceptives, and progesterone only subdermal implants are relatively safe and can be recommended if resources uh, permits. On the other hand, non-hormonal intrauterine contraceptive devices, for example, copper tea, multi-load, can be offered safely. As a matter of fact, it's, it's very safe and number one treatment uh, and expensive and not expensive method, especially during the immediate postpartum period. Natural barrier methods of contraception, uh, including withdrawal, calendar method, and lactation, and barrier methods, condoms, and vaginal diaphragms are included in category MEC1 with a failure, very big failure rate. So you might advise your women who have irregular menstruation in such cases not to rely on these barrier methods as it entails risk of unplanned pregnancy. Emergency contraception, of course it happens. Uh, the use of copper uh, intrauterine devices in women with diabetes not restricted. As a matter of fact, it's inserted safely within five days of unprotected intercourse. The efficacy of an emergency insertion is very high, reaching up to 99%. And another method is the, using of, uh, the use of progesterone-only oral contraceptive pills in women with diabetes. And then the dose of this LNG is 1.5 milligram or two doses of 0.75 milligram, uh, 12 hours apart with five days after unprotected intercourse. It could, uh, uh, at the end, I'll talk about permanent contraception. Some couples will decide to have permanent contraception. Please advise it, uh, counsel the patient beforehand to avoid the regret and offer tubal ligation vasectomy as safe and effective methods for couples wishing for permanent contraception. In summary, 
This graph uh, summarizes all what I talk about contraception, patient with hyperglycemia pregnancy seeking, contraceptive advised. If she has GDM with no comorbidities, you can safely prescribe any type of contraceptive. All are make one for her. If she has history of type one, type two, secondary diabetes, then counsel her at first. If the first effective and safe choice of contraception, such uh, uh, ladies, non-hormonal, long-acting, reversible methods of contraception. If she's not willing or not tolerating, then assess her cardiovascular, renal, retinal complication, or other comorbidities, including hypertension, age more than 35 years of age, and BMI. If they're absent, then she can use oral and injectable hormonal therapy. If it's present, then offer her oral and injectable uh, offer, uh, oral, uh, oral injectable hormonal therapy is restricted as mixed three and four, and then you offer her progesterone only pills. Uh, again, if the lady does not want uh, injectable hormonal therapy, you might propose, uh, offer her progesterone only pills. Thank you very, very much, and any questions? Thank you so much, Dr. Abir. Thank you. We have limited time for the Q&A. We will at least address uh, one question to every one of our speakers. Uh, Prof. Shabin, if I may ask you first. Is Professor Shabin with us still? Maybe all the speakers can open their cameras because we would also love to have a group photo with all of them. Is Professor Shabin here? If not, we can go to Professor Ahmed Bilal. Stop sharing, Dr. Yeah. Abir. Yeah. So Professor Shabin, if we take a look in the future in two years, what do you anticipate will be the big shift in our guidelines when we sit again and update? What do you think will be the changes? You are muted, Prof. Shabin. Oh, sorry. Actually, I'm in the clinic right now. Uh, it's a pleasure to listening to everybody of you. And uh, it's good to see that people are uh, taking care of the, uh, of the guidelines. As far as your question is concerned, I think that yes, we need to we need to look at the guidelines again because obviously it is a it is something which is uh, humanly made and has some problems in it, some deficiencies in it. And as you know, that medicine is uh, I mean advancing so fast that now we are with the ten years HEPO study. We are now with the uh, available with the ten years mix study. So I think things are changing. So we need to change the a uh, few of the things from the guidelines. But before that, we need to see our own uh, situation, especially if we can work on registry, that would be better. Thank you. Thank you so much. And Dr. Nadima, there is a question about women after bariatric surgery when they cannot tolerate the OGTT. What are the options they have available? In our guideline, there was another option. If you cannot tolerate OGTT, you can depend on fasting blood sugar. But it has to be repeated twice, either the other uh, next time fasting or to add hemoglobin A1C. Thank you so much. And for Dr. Zainab, there is a question about uh, your recommendations for Bahrain. You mentioned like in the preconception care, there are lots of women who are pregnant anyways, and then they come and they are uncontrolled and we are struggling and they are struggling. So I work in Bahrain Diabetes Society with Dr. Maria Milhajri and what would you advise us to do? How can we increase awareness? I think using the social media, definitely it is important. Now the people are listening to the social media and YouTube more than to the journals. I think maybe today when we are on YouTube, people will know about it, definitely English, Ordinary people will not know about it. Definitely it should be in Arabic translated. And I think, yeah, most of the time when the patients are coming to us, I know just recently I came across one patient who is coming to me diabetic and her blood sugar, she was in the first trimester, her blood sugar is 10 and 11. And most of the time it is not unusual. So definitely using social media, I think it will be very important. I think it should be written in Arabic. I mean, now the guidelines, which is in English, I think let it be simplified and to be translated to the ordinary people, I think, yeah. And definitely family physician have a big role, and endocrinologists have a big role, obstetrician. All of us had some role. And definitely diabetes is common. Not a single family without diabetes. 
and most of them yeah they will come with diabetes so i think yeah it is um, we can at different levels it can be taken yeah but definitely now social media is very important yeah if we want to win we should really go for the social media thank you so much and there was a question uh, for Professor Ahmed Bilal. I don't know if he can uh, open his video. It was about, uh, do we advise pregnant women with gestational diabetes on intermittent fasting or it's not recommended? Uh, no. We, uh, you see, there is a hazard of getting uh, fasting in pregnancy. The answer is very clear cut, no. In our book, which we are writing, there is a full chapter on Ramzan, and we have very clearly uh, put on the religious point of view that this is a big no. And the, for the people who are stubborn and are, are not ready to listen to the doctors and to the religion, then we have put on special recommendations, then what they should do. Thank you so much. And there's a question for Dr. Mohammed Suleiman also from the audience. It says about um, for hypoglycemia, instead of 10% dextrose, can we give 5% dextrose? Um, ideal, uh, I, I think the short answer is yes. Um, but uh, if you have 10% or more, that's better um, because obviously you want to give a higher concentration. But, uh, what I understood from the question is, I, I don't know if it's meant by hypo, for hypoglycemia or whether when you give fluids during DKA management, we, uh, we recommend 10% dextrose. Um, you can give 5% dextrose in DKA uh, instead of 10%. However, if you look at different guidelines, some of them say 10, some of them say five. 10 is probably preferred because the, the, the main treatment is giving insulin to switch off the ketosis. And to allow you to give enough insulin, you need to give enough glucose and 10% is better. So 10% is preferred. Thank you so much. And final question to Dr. Abir is in the postpartum period, um, how often in your practice you've seen women who are actually missed, uh, labeled as GDM, but they're truly uh, type two diabetes, which is very prevalent in our area here in Bahrain? Yeah, we see them a lot, a lot, but uh, the new scheme that we um, that adopted to screen women early as uh, uh, Dr. Anadima has appointed, as, as, as early as first time we see her and then keep screening in all trimesters in order not to miss any uh, kind of pregnant or any kind of diabetes has helped us to uh, recruit more patients and to get to know more patients and to um, be more aware about the um, percentage of patients with diabetes in our community. Having said that, you've asked a question to Dr. Razin about, about uh, how can we prevent. Yeah, it's, it's, it's a collaborative work. It's um, Ministry of Health, uh, King Hamad, uh, um, Ministry of Education, Ministry of Commerce. Everyone has to uh, pull in and uh, put all his efforts. It's a multi-sectoral uh, work and all the means, all the weapons should be used in this uh, fight. Thank you so much. And if I can ask for one group photo before we leave, for uh, Professor Ahmed Bilal, can you turn on your camera, please? And any of the um, MDO staff, Dr. Asad, Dr. Iman, you're welcome to turn on your cameras. So, one, two, three. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Dalal. Thank, Thank you very much. Thank you for the live session. You worked really hard for it. Thank you very much. Congratulations. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. And wish to see you all in Pakistan soon. Inshallah. Yeah, that's right. Dr. Salam Shilal is working too hard, and I'm just trying to follow his footsteps. Thank you, Professor. No, no, no. Thank you, Professor. We are trying to follow you your footsteps, madam. Thank you, Professor. Thank, thank you, uh, thank you uh, for inviting, giving us an opportunity. Thank you very much. Thank, thank you. you. Bye. Bye. Uh, Dr. Asad. Uh, 
Uh, dear uh, delegates and friends, we are going to start our Hello? second session. Yes, Dr. Asad. Yeah. You close my. Uh, uh, I cannot uh, open the camera. Hello. Yalla, Can you Dr. Open my Hi. camera, yes. please. Yalla, yalla. We are working on it. Your camera. No, not working. Hello? Yes, doctor, you can access your camera, Dr. Asad. You open it now? Okay. Yes, yes. Yes, thank you, Dr. Iman. Uh, uh, it's really a pleasure to start again, although we are uh, late in time. Uh, we have 10 minutes back. It's my pleasure to chair uh, this session. I will uh, introduce Dr. Khawla, uh, and this uh, session we will share with uh, Dr. Uh, Bejina. Uh, two lectures we have in this session. Dr. Khawla Fuad, she is uh, a consultant in endocrinology and the Telemedicine University Medical Center of King Abdullah Medical City, Kingdom of Bahrain, Clinical Senior Lecturer, RCSI, MUB, Kingdom of Bahrain, member of the Medical Complaint Investigation Unit and the Clinical Trial Unit. Uh, in a, uh, National Health Regulatory Authority, Kingdom of Bahrain, uh, PG training in internal medicine, Will uh, Corner Medicine, New York, and uh, she has the fellowship in endocrinology, diabetes, and metabolism, Cleveland Clinic Foundation, uh, USA. Dr. Khawla will talk now about uh, the uh, thyroid, uh, sorry, uh, adrenal nodule. And in uh, this uh, really interesting topic, she will focus on the uh, implication of this uh, uh, endocrinology uh, topic. Dr. Khawla, floor for you. Thank you, Dr. Asad, and uh, thank you for the organizing committee for inviting me to speak to you today. Assalamu uh, alaikum, rahmatullah wa barakatuh. Sauti wadah, Dr. Asad, the slides clear. Yeah, I can hear Oh, okay. Uh, hopefully we'll be able to finish on time by 3.30. So today's main topic is on really how should an internist or a family physician um, or a primary care physician approach adrenal nodules and more specifically adrenal incidentalomas. So um, the overview for today's lecture, we're going to start by defining the adrenal incidentalomas, the pathogenesis of such what is the epidemiology of these nodules? And then the main focus is going to be on investigation and management of these adrenal um, nodules. And then at the end, I'm going to share with you a very interesting case uh, that we've encountered a few years ago, um, you know, a very um, sort of very illustrative uh, case uh, from, from my archives. So to get started, what is an adrenal incidentaloma? It's a clinically and apparent, of course, adrenal mass that have been discovered inadvertently in the course of diagnostic testing or treatment essentially for conditions really not related to adrenals. And anything per the guidelines that is one centimeter or above warrants further evaluation. What is the origin of adrenal nodules? Now, adrenal nodules are, of course, monoclonal groups of cells. And these monoclonal groups of cells can arise from either the adrenal cortex or the adrenal medulla. Now, if the tissue or the nodule arises from the zona glomerulosa in the adrenal cortex, it essentially gives rise to an aldosteronoma or a nodule that produces aldosterone. If the nodule arises from monoclonal cells in the adrenal cortex, and specifically the zona fasciculata uh, layer, then that usually gives you adrenal Cushing's or a cortical uh, cortisol producing adenoma or ACTH independent uh, Cushing's. And then we have the zona reticularis, of course, of uh, the adrenal cortex. And this is the main part that's primarily responsible for producing a little bit of androgens and primarily DHES in our system. And this, we see it elevated in patients with adrenocortical carcinomas in particular. 
um, so malignant types of adrenal nodules. And then last but not least, of course, the most inner layer is the adrenal medulla, and that's the portion that uh, gives rise to those uh, uh, neurohormonal cells that produce uh, some, or stimulate sympathetic uh, nervous system uh, responses. And so this is the layer that gives rise to pheochromocytomas that produce epinephrine, norepinephrine, metanephrines, etc. Now, as far as the prevalence of adrenal nodules, adrenal nodules, you know, most of these studies have been done post-mortem on cadavers, uh, though some have been done on imaging for other reasons, and they've quantified essentially the frequency of adenomas for all comers. And what we can see here is that the percentage really is highly variable. It ranges from all the way, you know, from a 1% uh, percentage or even a 0.24% percentage all the way up to 10% and sometimes more. And what we do see is one of the important factors that determine the prevalence of adrenal nodules is age. And we do see that these adrenal nodules peak in those 50s to 70s and rarely in those less than 30s. Now, again, this is an association, but it doesn't necessarily imply causation. In other words, we do see them more often in this group, but again, this group is the group that most likely gets imaged, et cetera. As far as epidemiology is concerned, there is really no gender prevalence for adrenal nodules, and there is no clear side uh, that has more prevalent adrenal nodules, though some studies have suggested a left side prominence. Uh, not clear why. Uh, as far as, 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 uh, in addition to that, we do see it sometimes in association. There has been proven associations in those with diabetes, obesity, and hypertension. And the thought is that perhaps in these particular individuals, they might get periods of ischemia. And the periods of ischemia is usually followed by a period of free generation, and that regeneration might predispose these individuals to developing monoclonal cells and hence adrenal nodules. Now, the eventual diagnosis, of course, the majority of the adrenal nodules that arise from the adrenals are actually non-secreting or non-functioning. And so what we see here from this particular, from these particular series is that in the non-functioning case, it's 75% in total of all adenomas. And of those that are functioning, or in other words, produce hormones, cortisol is the most common hormone that's being produced. And what we can see here is also aldosterone, interestingly, is the least likely to produce uh, in an adrenal uh, nodule. Not to say, of course, that hyperaldo is not a common thing because it does arise from bilateral adrenal hyperplasia and other reasons not necessarily related to autonomous production from a single uh, solitary adrenal nodule. The other interesting thing about the epidemiology, and that you know, essentially makes sense is that the bigger the tumor size, of course, the bigger the, uh, or the more likelihood the adrenal nodule is malignant. And what we use essentially is a cutoff of four centimeters to determine uh, when do we have a really high risk of malignancy and so the nodule needs to come out regardless of whether it's functioning, et cetera. And so we do see a very clear association between size and also malignancy potential. Now, as far as functionality, this is I think the interesting part. You do see that the bigger the tumor size, also the more likely it is hyperfunctioning. Though this, you know, some people might say, um, you know, very often those that go undiagnosed and grow big is because they're non-functional. And that's what I'll show you in the case at the end of this presentation. But interestingly, this study shows that as a matter of fact, if it's over six centimeters, that means the likelihood of being hyperfunctional is the highest. So what are the initial steps to managing and working up a patient with an adrenal nodule? So let's assume that you're a GP or you're a family physician, you've ordered a CT scan for a particular patient or have seen a CT scan ordered from an inpatient visit and you're supposed to follow, up, follow it up outpatient. And on that CT scan, they discovered an incidentaloma, an adrenal nodule. What are the initial steps that you're supposed to take? 
You can always refer them to an endocrinologist, but a lot of the time referral takes time. And so in the meantime, the, 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 the consensus with regards to the initial steps can be summarized as follows. Number one, if the adrenal nodule is one or more centimeter, and that's where the consensus is, it has to be worked up. Number two, we divide the workup into both biochemical and imaging. Now, the biochemical workup, what we need to make sure is, is this adrenal nodule functioning or not functioning? Or in other words, does it secrete hormones or is it a non-functional, non-secretory type of adrenal nodule? And so there are a few things that we need to screen for in the biochemical workup. Number one, the production, of course, of epinephrine, norepinephrine, catecholamines in general. And so we need to screen for pheochromocytoma. We screen all comers also for hypercortisolism, and that's overproduction of cortisol. And we also screen people for overproduction of aldosteronism, especially if they have hypertension, hypokalemia, et cetera. And then most importantly, hypokalemia. And then most importantly, we need to make sure with the history that's provided does this patient have evidence of hirsutism, virilization, any evidence of excess androgen production, and therefore concern for adrenal cortical carcinoma? And then, of course, imaging comes next. So let's go through the biochemical testing in details, the basics of biochemical testing. So first is the screening for cortisol production, and this is also very helpful or essential if you want to screen for Cushing's in general, even if that pituitary is the source of Cushing. So the rule of thumb here is we never measure AM cortisols by themselves. That usually is a useless test and will not tell you if there is overproduction of cortisol. The test of choice to screen for Cushing's, whether it's adrenal, whether it's pituitary, is to do a dexamethasone suppression test. And the way to do this test is very straightforward and simple. Though, you know, getting this particular medication has been proven challenging in the private sector in Bahrain. Um, so what you need to do is you need to prescribe the patient a pill of dexamethasone, a dose of one milligram. We instruct the patient to take this dose at 11 p.m. at night and then go on to get their blood work the next morning, fasting at 8 a.m. And what we typically get is a total cortisol or an AM uh, total cortisol. Now, in a normal person with no over production of cortisol, the natural response is if you give them exogenous steroids, the adrenals have to shut down. And so the cortisol would essentially be very low. However, if the cortisol comes out more than five uh, milligram per deciliter, then in this case, this patient has autonomous secretion of cortisol that is not regulated uh, internally. And then number uh, three, if there's, of course, this intermediary range, which really gets us into a lot of dilemmas, then this is a possible hypercortisolism. And at that point in time, you might want to do other tests as well, such as 24-hour uh, urine-free cortisol or midnight salivary cortisol uh, test. Now, there are, of course, reasons to get false positives. So, you know, something that suggests Cushing's when there's no Cushing's, and that's number one, if you're not absorbing dexamethasone because of, let's say, uh, recent bariatric surgery. Number two, if you accelerate the metabolism of dexamethasone, so it gets metabolized very quickly, so it doesn't suppress the cortisol for a long period of time. Or if you have increase in the cortisol binding globulin, this is the protein that binds to cortisol, and that's essentially the total cortisol that we measure the bound and the unbound type of cortisol. And so if you have more protein in the system because of OCPs, such as estrogen, you will get a higher total cortisol, even though the free is actually looking normal. And so in this case, you might want to stop their OCPs or revert to the free cortisol measurements to assess directly free cortisol levels. Um, as far as pheochromocytoma is concerned, now, of course, you know, there are a lot of times symptoms that are suggestive of that, though I will show you a case of a pheo with no headaches or sweating or tachycardia. What we do usually is we either get serum or 24-hour urine metanephrines and, uh, and catecholamines. Now, remember, for this to be abnormal, we don't just look at above the threshold by a little bit. It has to be at least two to four times the upper limit of normal for it to be a true positive and a reflection 
reflection of fields. Now, of course, getting serum metanephrines might not always be positive because you know most of these fields, they're, sometimes their secretion is episodic, and so you might not catch necessarily the metanephrines at that point in time, and that's why we prefer sometimes to do the 24-hour urine. And what I usually advise the patients to do is that I want them to wait for the attack that sweating and headache and tachycardia attack, and then starting from that point and for 24 hours, collect the urine, and that's the best time to get it. As far as hyperaldo, now hyperaldosteronism screening, it might look simple here, but you know, in reality, it's very confusing sometimes, and it can uh, sometimes be very uh, laborsome to interpret some of these tests, but usually the very you know, clear cutoff uh, for hyperaldosteronism is if you see an aldosterone to plasma renin activity ratio of over 20. That's usually highly suggestive. Specifically, or more specifically, it's very suggestive if you have a high aldosterone level, a suppressed renin level, and hypokalemia. So we expect that when we have hypokalemia, aldosterone should be suppressed. And so in this case, that sort of makes the likelihood of primary hyperaldo very likely. Now, of course, if there are false negatives or false positives, there are always other tests that uh, we use to confirm. Uh, we won't go into them today because that's a lecture on its own. And then the important thing to keep in mind is that even though we are really assessing hyperaldosteronism because there is an adrenal nodule, and if there is biochemical evidence of hyperaldo, we think it's coming from the adrenal nodules, but a lot of the time, especially in those over the age of 40, sometimes they do have a nodule, but the aldosterone is not coming from that nodule. It's actually coming from a bilateral adrenal hyperplasia uh, picture. And so in this case, most often, if it's an elderly person, what we do is we refer them to specialized tertiary centers to get adrenal vein sampling. So go in with interventional radiology and sample the adrenal veins and using specific calculations you can determine where the aldosterone is coming from. And sometimes you do see it coming from the side that doesn't have the nodule. Now, as far as imaging is concerned, of course, now most of the time the imaging that we use is CT, and we specifically write for radiologists CT adrenal protocol. It's a specific protocol that they do to assess the adrenal nodules with washouts, et cetera. And so most of the time what we do focus uh, uh, you know, on is that there are specific characteristics for the malignant versus the benign, and that determines does it come out or does it stay. Um, and so irregularity in shape, heterogeneous content, any evidence of necrosis or calcifications, if it grows more than one centimeter per year, if it has more than 10 house fill units, which is the attenuation on an unenhanced CT, of course, and if it has a slow washout on CT protocol, and of course, if it's bigger than four centimeters, FDG, Avidon, PET scan, et cetera, and it's a lipid poor nodule on MRI, those are all suggestive of a highly malignant uh, uh, nodule and it needs to come out. So what do we do with these nodules? If the nodule has been proven to produce hormones, it needs to come out. That's number one. Number two, if it's a non-hormonally active adrenal nodule, then we look at the imaging characteristics. Generally, if it's over four centimeters, it comes out. Now, if it's less than four centimeters with completely benign characteristics, it can be followed up over uh, time. And the follow-up usually is we repeat imaging in one year. Sometimes we repeat it sooner if there's some indeterminate characteristics. And usually if it grows more than one centimeter in a year, it should come out. If no growth, then the risk, of course, of malignant transformation or malignant potential is very uh, low. And this is a debatable and a highly controversial issue. And, and most of the things that we've mentioned also here, a lot of them are controversial, again, because there isn't much data on the adrenal literature. But essentially, what we do say is, in general, you want to repeat the testing, at least the cortisol testing, or if you have new incidence of hypertension, hypokalemia, perhaps also the aldo to renin ratio, at least annually for a few years to make sure that nothing comes out of it. And this is sort of a slide that nicely summarized from Endocorrectus 2019, the guidelines for uh, managing adrenal nodules. Now I'm going to use the last uh, two or three minutes to show you a case, a very interesting case that I've encountered a few years ago. This was a 45-year-old woman who we were called uh, to see her in the emergency room. She was admitted with a progressive nausea, vomiting, and abdominal pains for three months. And with really no notable past medical 
medical history, except that three months ago, she noticed worsening abdominal distension. And that progressed to nausea, and then the nausea progressed to postprandial vomiting. She couldn't really tolerate anything, no solids, a little bit of liquids. In addition to that, despite this poor appetite, she's actually gained about 10 pounds off weight. And no really significant past history or, or things uh, to, to mention. And again, she's from rural, rural areas, so she hasn't really seeked medical attention for that sort of gross uh, picture that you'll see in a second, unfortunately, really for her. Um, so her blood pressure on admission was very elevated, systolic 180, pulse was 94, but regular. And then interestingly, her abdomen was very visibly distended, and there was a clear left upper quadrant, solid mass palpated, that really measured approximately over 10 centimeters. And this is her CT. And what you can see here outlined is the uh, nodule. And this nodule or this mass, uh, you know, this mass uh, per se was read to be arising from the uh, left adrenal gland. And so at that point in time, of course, you know, we've got some blood tests on her um, and the blood tests do show significantly elevated. Again, you know, if you have a true FEO, then usually these levels are not just, you know, above the upper limit of normal by a little bit. So if the upper limit is 340 for uh, serum metanephrines or urine metanephrines, it won't be just 400. It has to be at least two to three times the upper limit of normal. So we do sometimes get, especially with the epinephrine and, and norepinephrine, we do get some fluctuations, even in people who don't have necessarily few chromocytomas. So for a true positive, usually it's two to three times the upper limit of normal. Now, the interesting thing is that this lady did not have symptoms. You know, she didn't have those episodes of panic attacks, the classic sweating, et cetera, that comes with FEO. And that's perhaps maybe, and it's not really clear why, despite the significantly elevated uh, catecholamines, and that might perhaps explain how this FEO chromocytoma grew so large and got to that stage. And so, of course, at that point in time, you know, she was prepped for surgery with alpha blockage and then beta blockage was added according to the protocols for FIA with good blood pressure and heart rate control. And she was, of course, uh, sent for an open approach. Again, anything over 10 centimeters usually should be, uh, you know, that's the guideline for, uh, for the removal of adrenal mass. And so post X lab, of course, or post, um, you know, X lab, she had the resection of her left adrenal mass. Uh, and then uh, the plan was also for a possible left nephrectomy, uh, distal pancreatectomy, removal of adjacent organ if this was involved within the mass. So exploration essentially and proceed with excision. And so postoperatively, she was stable. Um, her findings, they found a six and a half centimeter left adrenal nodule, a mass that was adherent to the tail of the pancreas. Uh, now, splenic vessels and splenic vector uh, mesocolone uh, were able to be mobilized off the mass with no evidence of invasion, moderate new vascularity, and there was no invasion, luckily for her, off the left kidney. Uh, and so this was a left adrenalectomy with complete mass resection and a distal pancreatectomy with mobilization of the splenic lecture. This was actually her gross pathology. This is the capsule. I don't know if my cursor is showing, uh, but this is the uh, capsule. Let me just see if, uh, is my cursor showing by any chance? Hopefully it is. So this is the capsule of the adrenal uh, mass itself. You can see there are focal areas of hemorrhage within it. And this little piece of tissue uh, above it is actually part of the pancreas. And I'll show you that in a second. So this is the pathology slide right here. You can see that the capsule, the inner portion are all these FIO cells from the mass. And then this was, these were all the pancreatic tissues that have been excised. And of course they were diffusely positive for chromogranin A, which is a marker for a uh, uh, chromocytoma. And so the pathology report did confirm that it is a FIO. Um, and it did abut the pancreatic parenchyma, the margins were free, and the neoplasm had some aggressive features. We usually use a score called PASCORE to determine the aggressiveness. And this was actually, uh, per the literature, we presented it in a conference, the second largest VO in the United States, and it measured 18.5 centimeter in its greatest uh, dimension. That is all for my talk. Uh, I'm happy to take any questions. Thank you, Dr. Khawla, for uh, your interesting topic now. Uh, I, I, let me see if there is any question over here, but uh, I will start to uh, look for 
the uh, your criteria to uh, care for a patient with the uh, nodule, uh, how we can uh, help our uh, internist and even uh, general practitioner to the way to refer patient with the uh, nodule or to keep observing them. So whether there is any alarming sign to refer uh, as emergency or you can keep it on the same schedule as being uh, appointed. Mm, excellent. Yes, very, very, very important point. So, you know, if the patient does, so let's say we assume that we did the initial workup by an endocrinologist, and now the patient is following up with their primary physician. Now, a few points to keep in mind is that we need at least yearly imaging tests and any really significant change in the size, a little over one centimeter, you should probably send them back uh, to the endocrinologist. So change in size is a big one. Uh, if there's any change in the clinical features of this patient or the history, so let's say this patient now all of a sudden develops new hypertension and also has mild hypokalemia on their uh, laboratory test, it's also another uh, sort of alarming sign. Maybe there is endogenous aldosterone production. Maybe I should refer them. So to keep it simple, I think, you know, if in doubt, refer um, I think, or at least pick up the phone to some endocrinologist and, uh, and ensure that this patient doesn't need uh, right now repeat testing, right now repeat imaging, et cetera. Thank you very much for your interesting and really informative lecture. Dr. Thank Khabar. you for inviting me today. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Asad, there is a question in the chat box, please. Yeah, okay. One minute. I don't know the data, Fatiha, but it's a very good question. The question is, what's the incidence in Bahrain? And I don't know the data, to be honest. But it's Thank a good you. One. Uh, there is, uh, yeah. You, you read it at, uh, no, okay. Incidence in Bahrain, okay. So, Dr. Khawla answered. Uh, thank you. Now, uh, we have the second lecture, a uh, disease in a pregnancy. And we are looking forward to uh, introduce uh, Dr. Evigina. Uh, good afternoon. What is the time in your place? Oh, we, we are in the same time zone, so no differences between us. Oh, great. <laughs> so, Dr. Virginia Batrikiva, consultant, endocrinologist, and uh, she's uh, uh, really working in neurosurgery department, St. Petersburg uh, City Hospital, teaching assistant, St. Petersburg uh, Medical University, founder of educational web resources, for patients with a diabetes, senior lecturer for postgraduate courses, European Association for Studying Diabetes. I really, uh, I'm looking for your lecture because I had been referred from uh, one obstetrician, my colleague and my wife as well, a patient with the uh, troubles in last uh, uh, delivery. And then when we investigate this patient, she has an Edison disease. And unfortunately, we try our uh, best to review her troubles. Every pregnancy, she gets a lot of problem. And uh, for two pregnancy, they cannot discover maybe partial adrenal uh, insufficiency. And the patient, she was really different when being treated in the, uh, her third pregnancy. Looking forward for your lecture, close for you. Thank you. Just a second. I will share my screen. Can you see it? We can see. Okay. Uh, thank you, Dr. Saad, for a kind introduction again. And I'm happy to be here with you during the second day of such a brilliant conference and usual. And it's a great pleasure to be involved in such activity. And thank you for all organizing committee and for you personally for invitation because to be a part of such a nice project is really a honor and a happiness. As you told us, uh, Edison's disease and pregnancy is a huge problem everywhere, I think not only in Bahrain or in Russia, everywhere in the world. And during the next 20 minutes, we will discuss why and what can we as clinicians can do with such condition in women during pregnancy. Uh, I will be happy to share all my slides and every slides and everything uh, with you. So if you need something, just uh, write me an email and I will send you everything, even all historical things and documents which I will show 
because really we are here to spend our experience and knowledge all over the world. So don't be shy and ask questions, write comments and email me. I will be help, happy to help you. So let's start from some historical point of view and I will explain why I, I'm starting with describing of Sir William Mosler, the famous therapist working in the years and years ago. And this is a description from him of six cases of adrenal insufficiency. And what I want to stress here, that approach to pathogenesis, to clinical picture of the disease, and even to treatment, which is written here, is the same during all the time. But still we have some difficult situations in this disease, and one of them is pregnancy. Why so? Uh, because from theoretical point of, of view, of course we know that pregnancy has a profound effect on, on adrenal steroid genesis. And why? why is it so? Because uh, we know that maternal adrenal glands do not change morphologically during pregnancy. Uh, but adrenal steroid metabolism is modified. Uh, and let's discuss how, because placenta and corticotropin releasing hormone SRH rises several hundredfold during pregnancy. And I will show you the picture after, which modulates both maternal and fetal pituitary adrenal axis and may also regulate labor. And it's very, very important from the clinical point of view, both maternal and placental ACTH level and cortisol level rises dramatically during pregnancy with the initial surge and the 11th week of gestation and significant rise after 20 weeks of gestation and the final surge on these hormones during labor. And you know why and for what reason. Fetoplacental unit has a market capacity for steroidogenesis causing plasma cortisol level to rise from two to three fold over the course of the pregnancy above the levels of non-pregnant controls reaching values that are in the range seen even in Cushing syndrome. Increased estrogens, they also play a role here from the placenta, of course, stimulate hepatic production of CBG levels, leading to an increase in total cortisol level and decrease in cortisol clearance. As cortisol is displaced from CBG by progesterone, free cortisol level also increase. But despite the increase in placental hormones and increased HPA axis function, a normal maternal circadian rhythm of ACTH persists throughout pregnancy. If we just go in through this information graphically, as you can, can see here from the classical work about the uh, Edison disease during pregnancy and about physiology of cortisol and ACTH uh, secretion here, we can see that from 11 weeks of the station, which is here, the concentrations of uh, these hormones are rising in very, very proper way. Just uh, look to this picture and try to remember when we will think about Edison disease during pregnancy and when you will try to understand what we need to perform during pregnancy for a nice diagnosis of this disease if it wasn't diagnosed before the pregnancy. Uh, some introduction about disease. Of course, uh, adrenal insufficiency is very rare in pregnancy, and the exact prevalence, of course, is unknown. It's difficult to calculate because of small amount of cases. And general population, autoimmune adrenalitis is the most common cause of primary adrenal insufficiency in developed countries, and tuberculosis is more common in the developing world. Of course, we remember about other causes include fungal infection, hemorrhage, bilateral metastasis, and infarction. Uh, secondary and tertiary adrenal insufficiency is more common. And the existence of Edison disease, especially if unrecognized, may be a life-threatening condition and requires medical attention, as Sir Osler told us in his presentations almost 150 years ago. However, some life events potentially dangerous may be anticipated and then prevented by adopting the substitution therapy. What about adrenal uh, Addison disease and fertility? Uh, of course, we need to remember about coexistence of chronic anovulation leading to infertility unless properly treated may explain the low rate of conception in uh, this disease, and also about associated autoimmune arthritis, 
which may impair fertility and lead to premature variant failure. It's of interest that in adult patients with organ-specific autoimmune disease, the prevalence of adrenal cortic autoantibodies was significantly higher in women with premature variant failure than in healthy control. So fertility problems and infertility is a very common problem here in this population. And there are many case reports of pregnancy in primary hypoadrenalism described in the literature, but the actual size of its occurrence is not known. Again, from the historical point of view, before 1953, only around 50 cases of Addison disease in pregnancy had been described in the literature, suggesting then untreated adrenal cortex hypofunction reduces fertility. And with the advent of cortisone and related compounds, which can be used very successfully here, pregnancy has become more common in women with Addison disease. And here is one case from the link. It's about situation, as you can see here, about some amount of pregnancy during Addison disease. And this is one of the first description of this process. Also, what is important, uh, all of us uh, knows about autoimmune polyglandular syndrome type 2 and of course it's a combination of primary autoimmune hypoadrenalism or Addison disease, type 1 diabetes and thyroid autoimmune disease, uh, more common in women and more common than other forms of APS in the general population and from my point of view I have five pregnancies in women with such syndrome and it's not a very very easy uh, clinical situation but several cases of APS type 2 in pregnancy with patients presenting with a diagnosis in the time of pregnancy are described and you can see the links here and go through them or ask me I will send send it to them and here a very important clinical issue is to remember about thyroid function evaluation with anti-thyroid antibodies measurement is recommended uh, because we need about correspondence between TSH and cortisol level. And what about clinical part and what should we do with pregnant women with Addison disease? And just uh, a small reminder about clinical difficulties. Uh, of course, most cases of adrenal insufficiency in pregnancy are diagnosed before a woman becomes pregnant. In the first trimester, diagnosis may be difficult to make because many of signs and symptoms seen in adrenal insufficiency are also seen in routine pregnancy, discuss it later. It, they are written here. Of course, if you were just thinking about signs of adrenal disease, Addison disease as fatigue, dizziness, syncopes, nausea and vomitings, weight loss, increased pigmentation, even in hyponatremia, of course, the symptoms and signs are very close to the symptoms and signs of uh, this condition. But of course, during excessive dizziness, syncope, nausea, vomiting, and weight loss should warrant further evaluation. So even if we just discussed before that it's a rare condition, clinicians should remember about this, because even discussing this hyperpigmentation in Addison disease comparing with Clasma gravidarum, uh, of course, uh, there are some differences. And here you can see the picture of Clasma here. But uh, in Edison disease, presence of hyperpigmentation of the non-exposed part of the skin creates the hands, the external surfaces, and the mucous membranes. And also the spots on the lips, gums, and the mucosal membranes of mouth, rectum, and vagina are more evident. So even here, we need to think about pigmentation because it's a common site between these conditions. Another important story is the level of electrolytes, and you just need to keep in mind the severe salt cravings and decrease in sodium which is greater than the normal five millimol per little decrease in pregnancy should also warrant further evaluation it's very important and hyponatremia with metabolic acidosis has been reported to cause pure fatal outcome and we need to remember that during pregnancy we have two patients with us a mother and a child and of course we need to about uh, safety of uh, a baby too. And in contrast to the classic presentation of primary adrenal insufficiency, reported pregnant patients with the disorder did not present with 
classical hyperkalemia here. And as an example from the clinical point of view is a case report from Lancet, which was published a lot of years ago, but the clinical condition here is uh, written in a very classical way about 33 years old women with severe hermesis in the 11th week of pregnancy with family history revealed that the surviving females on the maternal side had a diagnosis of autoimmune thyroid dysfunction and you remember that as a con connected condition and or systemic lupus erythematosus. On examination, she was thin, pigmented and dehydrated. The case revealed hyponatremia and a marked metabolic acidosis, but normal plasma potassium. So again, here electrolyte things are, are, are important. And um, however, diagnosis of Addison disease is often delayed, of course, and uh, we understand why, because closes of sinus symptoms, uh, because of non-specific way which is may manifest in any case such severe acidosis in indication of marked metabolic disturbance and should evoke the possibility of adrenal insufficiency. Please remember about it because it can lead to severe morbidity and mortality and should remain high on the list of differential diagnosis in any patient with significant deranged biochemical profile. So just keep in mind this situation because again, it can be dangerous both for mother and for, for a child. What about adrenal crisis? And uh, I have such experience with my patient because patients have presented in stress-induced adrenal crisis in the third trimester, triggered by illness or labor, and labor are often described as a reason for this. Uh, and fetal adrenal production may be protective during the pregnancy. That's why the situation can be easily be reached in the labor or in the end of pregnancy. Hansen adrenal crisis may only present in the postpartum period. And that's why careful attention must be given to the positive history of autoimmune disorders in the patient and the family members. And this would make the diagnosis of Addison disease more likely. So more attention from your point of view, from family point of view, and sometimes it can, it can save the life of the patient. What about laboratory screening for adrenal insufficiency? Of course, it's a story about low hormone cortisol level and numbers uh, are written here in the non-stress state and the setting of a typical clinical presentation confirms the diagnosis. In the first trimester and early second trimester, a morning cortisol level of 19, and in the clinical stable patients excludes the diagnosis. As normal pregnancy progresses, cortisol level rise two to three fold above non pregnant levels. Therefore, normal morning cortisol level is not normal for pregnancy in the late second and third trimesters. Patients with clinical presentation consisted with adrenal insufficiency and a plasma cortisol level from 3 to 30 should have further evaluation. When the plasma cortisol level is low for pregnancy and the plasma ACTH level is elevated, primary adrenal insufficiency diagnosed and cortisone synthetic ACTH stimulation testing should be performed using a 250 mcg IV dose. When you just need numbers, uh, which you can use as a value, you can bring it from Suri paper, which was published years ago, but the numbers are still true for this situation. Uh, the interesting story here is the after this publication postulates that uh, baseline and stimulated salivary cortisol levels to be a better measure of cortisol secretion, but you can find the numbers here. What about adrenal antibodies? Uh, may be helpful in confirming Edison disease, of course, because we, mem we remember the causes of this disease. And approximately 90% of patients will have 21 hydroxylized antibodies, and 30% of patients have synapsid alpha hydroxylized antibodies. So we can use this uh, knowledge for our diagnosis. The last part, what about treatment? What we can do here and how we can help our patients more successful? Of course, hetacartisone is the preferred leukotriol trait placement treatment as it's more physiologic than other available glucocorticoids, but, but we'll discuss during the next slide other options. And it's degraded by the placental enzymes. There, therefore, it does not cross the placenta and don't affect the mother. The recommended dose is written here, and you remember that we calculated from the body surface area. Uh, the daily dose usually is divided into twice daily regimen with two thirds of the dose given in the morning and one third of the dose given in the afternoon is the same like without pregnancy. 
routine replacement therapy can be continued until onset of labor, at which time the oral dose can be doubled. Alternatively, a parenteral dose of 50 milligrams of hydrocortisone can be given during the second stage of labor. And here we need to work with obstetrician because it's very important. And further dosing can be adjusted based on the course of labor. What about cesarean section? And if it's necessary, what should we do here? It's again about intravenous of in or intramuscular hydrocortisone and a dose of 100 milligrams should be given initially. And then every six to eight hour period with tapering of the dose over the next uh, 48 hours. If you prefer, prefer to look to these treatment guidelines in a table, uh, which is written here, and here is numbers from this brilliant re review, and I recommend everyone to read it from Ambrosi and Italian group. Uh, first trimester, it's about also possible to use cortisone acetate or hydrocortisone and fluidocortisone. Uh, when severe nausea vomiting, hydrocortisone 50 milligrams intramuscular or the, even dexamethasone, ideal, one milligram intramuscular bruise uh, plus IV saline administration. Another numbers for third trimester and very, very detailed uh, explanation about doses and possibilities during labor, during delivery and what we should do to correct hyperglycemia and hypokalemia with 5% glucose infusion and even with calcium chloride. So it just, um, also very, uh, maybe it can be very uh, useful to use this in a clinical way to print it out and have on, uh, because during our consultation with obstetrician, we usually discuss uh, on the same language, the same doses of the same, same preparations of uh, hormones. What about breastfeeding? Of course, hydrocortisone replacement therapy may be continued during breastfeeding as less than 1.5% uh, of the doses is, is cursed per liter of milk. So it's not dangerous for a baby. You shouldn't uh, say the woman that say she can do it. And uh, going to conclusion, oh, and I have one minute for this. Great. Uh, so first, in past years, the occurrence of pregnancy in women with primary adrenal insufficiency was considered dangerous, owing to the frequently reported maternal and fetal risk. A low rate of conception and a high abortion rate have been reported. <clears throat> but what we have now at present, pregnancy, labor, and delivery, if properly managed and uh, diagnosed, can occur without any risk for mothers and newborns. Again, the major problem here, as Dr. Assad said, is the early recognition of a pregnant woman in whom Addison's disease recently appeared because symptoms and signs are easily misleading and resemble the clinical picture of a normal pregnancy. On the basis of correct diagnosis, the treatment is adequate in nearly all cases, can we mention all cases, and pregnancy, labor, and delivery and eventually fully occur. Thank you for your attention. And I think that we have some time for discussion. I will be happy to see your comments and uh, questions. If you need a presentation or these uh, publications, which was cited, just tell me and I will send them to you. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Regina, wonderful lecture. And you, you summarize really the, this topic. So, uh, we have here uh, two questions uh, from Sayyid Ahmed Said. Uh, what is the diagnostic criteria for subclinical hypoadrenalism for both endocrinologists or anyone mm -hmm. like GP or internist? Um, so here, uh, my goal was not to discuss subclinical cases because the greatest problem here uh, discussing women uh, who are pregnant is uh, just not uh, go through the uh, real um, problems with Edison disease or another primary situation with adrenal insufficiency. So um, I think... I, I don't know, maybe in Bahrain community, we have the special list for subclinical uh, hyperadrenalism, but in Russia, we have a lot of um, different uh, things here and different opinions. So maybe we can discuss it during the next uh, 
presentation, or I can send you all these links to documents which discuss different levels for subclinical hypogenalism in my country, maybe international, something like this. I agree with you. Uh, we are looking for the difference, which okay. is not an area. So yeah. the best way to, to conduct the studies to have a reference in our area, then we can say what is the normal yeah. and it could be different. The second question uh, from Anne uh, Bahia. I have patients on Cortif 10 milligram morning, uh, means hydrocortisone, and 5 milligram afternoon, 5 milligram evening. Mm -hmm. uh, do I need to adjust her medication during pregnancy? And what is my That's reference of cortisol level? Uh, more, uh, what, what is the protocol for caesarean section surgery to follow? Uh, I, have I have shown this protocol, so you can just uh, uh, please write me by mail and I will send it to you because it was written on the slide. So that's the time for conference to go through this because we discuss it. Maybe you just need the numbers which will be printed to you, so I will send it. I, I, I just uh, can repeat what you say. It is a uh, two thirds of the dose in the morning and you split yeah. the dose for the evening and to be adjust to keep the level uh, acceptable to what you show on your slides. Mm -hmm. uh, by this, uh, I would like uh, to ask any other question from the audience. Or comments maybe. You can or just comments the from the, the faculty. Uh, Dr. Evgenia, most of them, they like your lecture and okay. they you. really commented on your lecture that it was uh, very informative and yeah. very uh, well presented. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you for the great. Thank you all of you. Thank and you. by this, we will have a break. Uh, Dr. Iman, break, isn't it? Yes, Dr. Assad, we have 15 minutes uh, break. 15 minutes break. And, and we will start uh, We would like to minutes. thank the uh, team working on uh, uh, the uh, back uh, Dr. Iman and Ahmed for their efforts to keep this uh, in the proper time and a proper, uh, really, uh, presentation. Thank you for all of you. Thank you, Dr. Asad. Thank you.
Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Now this session, I will. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce the uh, chairman of this session, Dr. Jamil El Mozan, is consultant uh, radiologist, uh, head of radiology department in uh, Gulf Diabetes Specialist Center uh, and Nur Hospital. He's a speaker of multiple uh, national and international conferences, and he was uh, also an uh, uh, a lecturer in Al Kindi uh, uh, College University uh, Medical School, and uh, Dr. Jamil, uh, you have a lot of uh, participation in many conferences and of uh, 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 journals. Uh, Dr. Jamil also uh, he has been participated with many uh, of our uh, activities. Dr. Debish uh, Battle. Thank you. Battle. Thank you, Dr. Jamil. Dr. Debesh is the uh, a consultant physician, diabetes and endocrinology, uh, the honorary associate professor in UCL Royal Free Hospital London NHS Foundation Trust, chair association of a British clinical diabetologist, ABCD, and uh, his collaborate uh, and research work with the departments of renal medicine and cardiology across UCL, have uh, many publications, abstracts, and presentation. Floors for you, sir. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Assad. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can hear all of you. Clear. Well, it's, it's great to be here amongst uh, esteemed uh, lecturers, presenters, and friends. So thank you for, again for the invitation. Uh, I'm going to in introduce the first speaker who you won't need any introduction. She's a bit of a star of the show uh, so far, uh, Dr. Patrick Kiva, who you've heard today as well as yesterday. Uh, Dr. Patrick Kiva is a consultant endocrinologist uh, at St. Petersburg uh, City Hospital, also a teaching assistant, a founder of, of an educational web resource for patients with diabetes. Uh, no doubt she's a, a popular senior lecturer for a number of courses, including uh, the European Association of Study of Diabetes. And she's gonna be talking to us uh, in this session about type one diabetes and technology. It's an area of much interest and, and uh, much proliferation. So uh, Dr. Patrick Kiva is with us. Uh, not yet, Dr. Yeah, uh, yeah she's, yeah, she started, oh. yes. That's great. Dr. Patrick Kiva. Yeah, I'm here. Thank you very much. Uh, Delight, delighted to introduce you. As, as I was saying, you're the star of the show. Tell us a little bit about the type one diabetes and uh, technology. Thank you. Glad to see you even virtually. It's a pleasure to meet friends in all possible ways now, but I still hope that we will meet real, in reality next year and years after. So another topic for today is a story about diabetes and about technology in diabetes. Oh, just... Is everything okay with the slides? Can you see it? Yes, we can see them. Great. So the story here is again very important. Why? Because for all our patients living with such a severe disease like type 1 diabetes, of course, life-saving care is a right, not a privilege. And when we talk about life-saving care, uh, it's a story also about technologies, not only about education and medicine. And this poster was published years ago by International Diabetes Foundation, but I like it very much because it's a really a very important part of diabetes care for last years. Let's start our discussion from typical things. Uh, we will discuss something about glucose monitoring and difficult things and fields around it. After that, we will go to the story of insulin pump and everything around it. And in the last part, we will discuss a little bit future and maybe some other technologies of diabetes care because of course it's not true that diabetes technologies uh, are involved, involved only CGM and CSII is much more in this field. 
So let's start from our story about hyperglycemia and glucose variability. Of course, there are a lot of pathological things now which are described very, very precisely about severe things which are happening due to glucose variability and hyperglycemia. And as an example, I like uh, this paper very much because it's about cognitive function, middle age, and also about coronary, coronary artery risk development in young adults, so-called CARTA study, which precise information about the post variability influence on this. And again, there's a story about, uh, we need to remember about the danger of physiologically stable metric. And of course, now uh, it's a clear goal for everyone working in the diabetes field that we need to rem remember not only about HbA1c level or some sort of average uh, mean of glucose level, but also about glycemic variability and is a key instrument now to use it because we have information about reduction of diabetic ketoacidosis and severe hyperglycemia also in pediatric type 1 diabetes during the first year of continuous glucose monitoring. Of course, this story is possible to be discussed only because of uh, presence of continuous glucose monitoring in lives of our patients, because without uh, such technology, it was impossible to discuss glucose uh, variability uh, which was also possible to improve by, by usage of this uh, type of monitoring. And of course, uh, there is now uh, understandable that we can use not only continuous glucose monitoring, but also flash glucose monitoring, which can lead to marked improvement of HB1C level. And uh, these things uh, uh, are also very good uh, described in, in such amount of uh, nice publication, but it's not enough. You know, the story here that for now, uh, for sure, we need to compare these technologies because now it's understandable that real-time CGM and flash monitoring are working good in our patients. And of course, there are still a lot of questions about insurance and possibility for our patients to buy these technologies. But uh, for the last couple of years, a lot of papers were published in the field of comparison of uh, uh, RTCGM and flash monitoring. And I will show the results after. But also uh, nowadays, it's understandable that psychological aspects of CGM usage is also very, very important because sometimes uh, family members and doctors said that patients doesn't want to use it. But of course, uh, we need to ask the patients about preferences. And of course, we need to remember about maybe mood disorders, any family conflicts, some diabetes specific emotional distress and uh, unrealistic expectation can also be a reason to stop using of continuous glucose monitoring or in flash monitoring about an anxiety and about some negative comments. And uh, uh, are we as healthcare professionals are really ready to work with uh, the devices because sometimes the level of knowledge in general practitioners or specialists in other specialties, not, not in diabetology, for such doctors, sometimes it's very difficult to work with all this information and all this data from continuous glucose monitoring system. So another story is the need to ask ourselves, do we know enough to use it successfully in our patients? And after that, all discussions with patients will be more successful. So the data now telling us that it's improved about HbA1c level, about timing range, because it's a great metric to, to know situation about glycemic variability. And of course, uh, usage of these technologies can change psychological problems and well-being, sometimes in a negative, uh, unfortunately, way, but usually in a positive way. Uh, but I promised you to discuss uh, comparison between these methods. And as you can see here, if you're going through the, this um, different uh, sort of studies, and we start with a heart about Dexcom G5, so the amount of patients here are not so much, it's less than 100, but uh, we can go from eight week study to six months. And if you go through the metrics, but uh, HB1C11 baseline, and here is a champion, but by observational study on Dexcom G4, about 8.1%. But if you go, go through this, uh, the more information about this are, are going from 
uh, time in range and time below range, and also about uh, hypoglycemia fear, because as we discussed yesterday, hypoglycemia fear is a very severe problem even now with all these devices. But of course, uh, we can just say that the real-time glucose monitoring is a successful tool for patients even with hypoglycemia fever. So it can resolve psychological problems, at least some of them. Uh, another story about comparison of these types of glucose monitoring is a story about exercise. And you know that physical uh, activity is a very difficult issue for uh, a lot of our patients because it's really difficult to be in range and you know the perfect guidelines which were published last year uh, from uh, the group of authors which um, advises around uh, physical activity started and finishing during the physical activity based on glucose uh, monitoring data but here in this publication if you can go through the data uh, an explanation why uh, real-time glucose monitoring is better for such patients, because sometimes we need to remember what the, what what does it mean for for the patient, what the what the patient should do during the exercise, and of course, all this amount of. Uh, times which are, it's necessary to perform a scanning uh, using during usage of uh, flash monitoring. It can be difficult for the patient and it fixed it to a disease. And for some of them, it's about increasing the burden of diabetes. So for now, the data uh, are telling us that real-time CGSM is superior to flash glucose monitoring and glucose control uh, during uh, physical activity. I, I think we need to remember, but um, to tell the long story shortly, of course, uh, I agree with um, this position that CGM for now is a community of family name. And because, we, of course, we have different products within the community with different beneficial effects and with individual preferences. And as we can just use such a metaphor as a bouquet, sometimes a beautiful uh, amount of sunflowers is better, but sometimes it's better to use only one of them because it's also very beautiful. So I am not want, I don't want to tell you that real uh, time continuous glucose monitoring is the only way to uh, improve the lives of our patients. We, of course, we need to use flash monitoring, but uh, it can be based not only about our knowledge on uh, HB1C level of uh, semi variability, but also on preference of the patients. And uh, about the future, of course, we have a lot of things around here. And uh, the stories we are going through last year's, it's about possibility to use uh, glucose monitoring even before diagnosis of type 1 diabetes. So it's a great field here. And another story is new technologies with uh, Sensionics, for example, which was approved by FDA. Uh, a few weeks ago, but uh, of course, even the thought that we can use one sensor, implantable one for 180 days for some patients is a really great uh, uh, miracle and they were happy about it because my phone was full of uh, callings from all um, regions of Russia asking me, is it true and when we will have it here? Because you know, all these patients are really waiting for some sort of renovation, renovative technologies in diabetes. And I'm sure that we will have it uh, very soon. So now is a new time uh, for us for new decisions, smart technologies, and of course, CGM based guidelines uh, will be an usual thing in diabetes care. For now, we have uh, such sort of guidelines on physical activity, new devices are coming, and uh, time and range concept is essential because it's the only way to understand what's going on uh, with glycemic variability. Psychological and educational issues are still the base of care, and future is here already. What about uh, CSII? Uh, because there are a lot of uh, publication here also, and there are a list of uh, things which, which we can compare about HB1C, severe hypoglycemia, diabetes ketacidosis, but I just want to emphasize that we need to think first about patient and the quality of life. It's very important and it's improving in adult and children and adolescents with diabetes, and of course insulin requirements are lower. And uh, what is very important to discuss here, I think that uh, when we're just talking about COVID-19 and all the situation about 
um, all these epidemiological issues everywhere. Uh, we need to think that it, diabetes education and education about insulin pumps are also going through these changes because everything around social distancing, disrupted routine and stress and concern for contact and this is uh, very true for now. Uh, what another option in CSI uh, last year is about integration to our office life and some, of, some things of this publication with what we can do with the patient enters the office and when we can just describe him or her the possibility to have a pump, but also about common medical condition during hospitalization, which can affect insulin pump management. And we uh, use it very widely because all our uh, teams in hospital are using this uh, and also this, because you know, for now, uh, there are so many uh, things which we need to perform as patients, even in severe conditions. Uh, and everybody now knows what, what to do with a pump. And I think it's a it's great thing because it's not like, you know, 10 years ago, 15 years ago, when the insulin pump was a miracle. Uh, another thing which is very important to describe in insulin pump things, it's a patient's role because of course, uh, patients, if the patients need more education on insulin pumps, we should give it to this. Uh, of course, we, we, we need to discuss everything with the addition because all these things around different types of boluses and insulin pumps needed to be discussed with the addition. Sometimes the story about medical health provider and about downloading for sure of all this information because it's, it can be very useful to analyze all the data from insulin pump. And sometimes we need to educate patients around data interpretation and uh, at least every three months. And I just want to stress here because even, even if you see the patient every three months, like uh, this health, healthcare system for diabetes care is organized in this uh, way in Russia, we meet our patients every three months. Uh, and even in this field, we can uh, very um, rapid improve glycemic control. And again, about uh, psychological issues, uh, of course, uh, it's a room to improvement here, but another story is about do-it-yourself system, and it's very popular in my country, but also uh, this system, which are commercially open for patients, it's also uh, have a great success with percentage of time with the glucose level target, which is very, very successful. And the new reality for all doctors who are working in this field of um, continuous glucose monitoring and, uh, and insulin pumps, it's a story about uh, digital diabetology because uh, of course we need to download everything to have a cloud decision and to use it, virtual clinic, teleconferences, and meeting with patients during online consultation. So even for now, it's not a future like we discussed before, uh, even five years ago, it's our new reality. To conclude, of course, uh, continuous subcutaneous insulin infusion play an important role in the treatment of diabetes. Of course, both technologies have been much more widely adopted. The data used in hospital setting is more limited, but we are trying to use it more widely. And it's a great promise in transforming all our glycemic management system for all our patients living with diabetes. And again and again, I will repeat it, the potential to psychological issues still needed. Education is a key, that's true. So I promised you that we will not only discuss the important topics of insulin pump and sensor, but I also to show you the story how we can use another technologies for improving lives of our patients with diabetes. It's example from my clinic and two or three weeks maybe ago, it was a patient from the region, from the far east of Russia, and he just came to discuss the problems of diabetes, which HB1C level more than 10, and you know why? Uh, because uh, these changes in uh, the, the uh, field which, which where he prepared his uh, injection was destroyed by lipodystrophy. And I just want to show you one example 
how you can help patients here because of course, of course when we're talking about such a prominent changes uh, it's possible to understand what's going on with insulin technique or infusion set technique uh, uh, but sometimes it's not very easy to understand that the time of injection is changed and ultrasound uh, method is very important here and as you can see this area with changing uh, adipose tissue you can understand that for sure there is impossible to use uh, this place to for injection of insulin and this archive of our doctor who working with my patient in this field and um, publications here our understanding is of course that it's like a weight because insulin injection techniques are very important we can use MRI but of course if we just going through the theoretical part of literature uh, it's easier to use ultrasound and you can just easily understand that something here is happening so the recommendation here for the patient is not to use this place for insulin injection and it's also technology in diabetes and we're trying to use it like a, some sort of maps for the patients where is a better place for using insulin and i think the technology here is very important to be remembered by us and another story is a story about uh, type 2 diabetes and technologies here and again and again we're going to these cardiac arrhythmias and understand that they are very correlated with the number of hyperglycemia and, and the abstract from last ESD meeting so we again here maybe for these patients continuous glucose monitoring is very important not only from from glycemic variability things but also from the cardiac point of view and about education again and again just can tell you that you can go and find all information about technology and type 1 diabetes or type 2 diabetes also in the, this uh, place on esd.org uh, site. And uh, what about news? And I started to discuss it yesterday. It's about new guideline on type 1 diabetes and adults. And it's a consensus report, which was discussed on last ESD meeting. And here, looks for now, we have an official uh, data in guideline for type 1 diabetes patients, which time in range, time below range, time above range, which is possible to, to measure only during usage, usage of continuous glucose monitoring system or flash monitoring system. So technologies for now are important official part of uh, discussing glycemic target for most adults with type 1 diabetes. And again, uh, even here, during the general principle for measurement of blood glucose and existing type 1 diabetes in adult, it's a story about patients who can use whatever they want, even systems, uh, such system like a insulin pump, continuous glucose monitoring, not only injection. And I wish you uh, all and all your patients um, good health, even in this difficult time. And I wish all of you to have such text messages from patient. It's a story of my patient. She is writing here, Spasibo. In Russia, it means thank you. Because uh, in a heart, you can see the time and rage, like 84%. And she is living her life with type 1 diabetes for the last 10 years. And hypoglycemia level is zero. So everything is possible uh, even to work with this correct uh, time and rage diapason. So I wish to all of your patients very best things, very, very good health and more time spending in time and rage period. Thank you for your attention. I think we, we have some time for comments or questions. Many, many thanks, Dr. Petrokiva. Lovely, lovely talk. And I really like the personalized patient uh, gratitude and feedback. We all, we all would like to do a good job for our patients. It's always nice once in a while when we're told we're doing a good job for our patients. That's great. Thank yeah, you. Thank you. So uh, I'm just looking at uh, some compliments to you in the, in the, the chat uh, box. I can't seem to see any questions in the Q&A box. Could, uh, has anybody got any questions to ask? Am I the only one that can't see the questions? No, doctor, there's uh, not uh, nothing okay. at the moment. Perfect. Well, why don't I ask a question? So, Dr. Patrick Eva, it, it's really helpful to have technology. It helps the patient, helps us. But how do we choose or help our patients choose which technology for which patient? Okay, so the number of CGM, there are a number of pumps available. How do we help our patients navigate that? 
I think that, and I think that uh, you also think the same way. The key thing here is education, because you know, for, without education, all these devices are only like a, I don't know, nice picture of something we can, you, you, which you can use during your life. But without understanding how you can use it and why, what is the reason for this? It's impossible to help yourself or to help the member of your family with diabetes. So I think the first part of the answer, my or my comment here is that we should use um, all different ways to educate our patients maybe not only about face-to-face -face, um, lessons or something maybe some online courses like ABCD in the UK uh, and uh, maybe we can use all these chats and groups of patients to discuss these, these things because peer support here is very important and sometimes our understanding what we can tell the patient about any device is just our way you know um, thinking from the doctor's perspective, of, uh, but uh, for patients, it's very important to discuss uh, it with the person in the same condition. So maybe we just need to support all this discussion in peer support groups for our patients. Uh, another fact, uh, maybe we can just do more with all these um, 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 groups of companies who are working with medical devices because sometimes uh, great support with all these uh, examples of devices and when, when it's possible just to show the patients during your consultation what and how you can use it and wh what about uh, all this downloading how we can deal with that and maybe just to give possibility to try such gadgets it also can be very helpful and of course our ac active involvement and in all this uh, I don't know, activities in social media everywhere when we just uh, start to discuss not, but it's it's very, I think it's very necessary to be very honest here because as I told you, we don't, um, we need to support realistic expectations from all these devices. So is, there is not no not true that just to say, that, oh, just have a pump and everything will be perfect in your, your life because mm -hmm. it's, it's it will not help the patient. So all these things so together with the addition and together with the psychologist, uh, can be very helpful here. So it's our common work, not only us as the doctors, but also the patient's community, peer support group, manufacturers, and everyone. I completely agree. It's a group effort, and we don't want to base it on our biases or our levels of familiarity with certain uh, devices and that sort of thing. So that, that's a great answer. Thank you for that. Uh, thank you. Uh, I think there are no other questions I can see. Uh, Dr. Jamil, would you like to introduce Dr. Dipesh, yeah. please? Yeah, it is of an honor to me to present Dr. Dipesh Patel. He is consultant physician, diabetes and endocrinology, honorary, uh, honorary associate professor, UCL, Royal Free Hospital London, NHS Foundation Trust Chair, uh, Association of British Clinical Diabetologists. Uh, collaborate in research work with the Department of Renal Medicine and uh, Cardiology across UCL. Have many publication abstracts and presentation, and we saw him also previous uh, years in our uh, conference. Thank you to present Dr. Tipesh Patel. It's, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you for the introduction. Uh, I'm sorry for the, 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 the ongoing friendly face you'll those of you who've been here before, you will recognize me. Uh, let's see if I can get my slides up. No, we don't need that slide. And thank you to the organizers, Dr. Assad, Dr. Iman. Without you, we wouldn't be here. Uh, I'm very pleased to be here to share uh, some of the work that, that we do. As well. We are happy that you are here. Uh, Dr. Iman, without you, we wouldn't be here. So thank you. Okay, hopefully, could you see, can you see my slides and can you hear me okay? All well and clear. The yeah, yeah, everything is perfect. Wonderful, thank you. So uh, I slightly shortened the talk uh, onto GLP-1 updates in diabetes. Uh, the reason being is I'm doing a talk at 9 p.m. this evening to give an update on SGLT2 inhibitors. And rather to rush through these talks, I can sort of concentrate on GLP-1, give you an update in, in those people who are treating people with type 2 diabetes. So what am I going to say? So there are just three aspects to this talk. 
uh, in my interpretation, what, would, what do I think is new? Well, we've got a new formulation of GLP-1, and I'm gonna introduce that formulation and show you some trial data. We've got new dose preparations of existing uh, subcutaneous GLP-1 therapies, and I'll show you some data with that. And we've got new combination medications with GLP-1 coagonists, uh, which are very exciting in my opinion, and I'd love to share some of that data with you also. So first of all, what are GLP-1s? Well, we all know they are, uh, are peptides. Uh, those of us who treat people with diabetes know uh, uh, a lot of them and use them in routine clinical practice for glucose reduction, but also weight reduction and cardiovascular protection. There are generally two types of GLP-1 therapies, those that are based on native human GLP-1 and those based on the structure of Extendin-4. And you can see the names there. Uh, they're both uh, daily uh, injections, but also weekly injections, which we use quite commonly. Uh, 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 terms uh, uh, and therapies such as dulaglutide, semaglutide, and liraglutide. You'll be very familiar with these medications. What's new on the block? We've got an oral preparation. For the first time, we have an, a tablet, a GLP-1 tablet, which is a real innovation in GLP-1 therapy. Remember, these are peptides. Insulin is a peptide. We don't have oral insulin yet, but we may do in the future. And this is certainly a major step forward in GLP-1 therapies. Uh, just to really quickly go through how GLPs work, we know they work on the pancreas to improve insulin production, reduce glucagon secretion. They work on the cardiovascular side to reduce cardiovascular risk. We know they work on appetite and they're now licensed in higher doses for obesity. And we know they work on the liver, improving insulin sensitivity and reducing the retention of fat. So really four main uh, uh, principles of action. So what is the new oral GLP-1. So it's the first oral GLP-1 uh, available. We know a lot of our patients are not comfortable with injecting uh, either on a daily or weekly basis. We now can give them an option. Uh, and certainly we can use these medications maybe slightly earlier uh, in, in people uh, uh, with type 2 diabetes. And it's based on the same drug as we know in subcutaneous form, name of semaglutide. So this is the same drug at uh, the same doses, well, the same levels in the blood, but in oral preparation. And why is this a big deal? Well, we know uh, peptides are degraded in the stomach because of the low pH and uh, proteolytic enzymes. Uh, and we know that really limits how much availability there is for absorption. Traditionally, GLP-1s have very little oral bioavailability, less than 0.01%. However, uh, we now have this formulation uh, which is formulated uh, with a fatty acid derivative, which is known as SNAC, sodium uh, amino caprolate. Uh, and this actually promotes the absorption uh, across the gastric epithelium. And it's co-formulated with 300 milligrams of this fatty acid. So how does it work? Well, it actually, uh, this actual uh, fatty acid, which actually causes an increase locally of pH. So it protects the peptide. Uh, and leads to higher solubility and also protection, some protection against proteolytic degradation. So again, uh, it can be absorbed in the stomach, in the stomach. And just remember, uh, very little of the drug is absorbed. So approximately 1% of semaglutide is absorbed, 99% is degraded. So remember, uh, absorption and telling patients to, to maximize absorption is really important. How do we do that? Or well, tell patients, to take it either on empty stomach upon waking or at any time of the day. However, it needs to be at least 30 minutes before eating and drinking. The longer you leave it, the, the higher the absorption. And to take it with a sip of water, uh, no more than 120 mils, because again, that will decrease the amount of absorption. And we're talking about a drug that's, uh, the, uh, there's 1% absorption of that drug. We want to make sure that that is optimized and not uh, uh, reduced in any way. So actually, we need to tell our patients exactly how to take this medication uh, uh, to make it uh, to give it the maximum chance of success. There are a number uh, of clinical trial, the pioneer program for oral semaglutide. The trade name is called Ribelsis. So you can see here uh, on, uh, on the left of your screen, diet and exercise, uh, uh, adding in this medication to existing oral anti uh, hyperglycemic medications, uh, add on to uh, uh, insulin and special populations in renal and cardiovascular outcomes. So there's a, there's a large program in thousands of patients uh, in terms of phase three clinical trials. I'm going to just summarize this for you in the interest of time. 
Uh, this is a number of pioneer studies. Uh, and what you can see here on the y-axis is HbA1c reduction in percentages. And on the x-axis, the number of trials. So monotherapy versus oral therapies versus luraglutide. So that's another uh, daily GLP-1 receptor agonist in a renal population uh, and et cetera. So what you can see in the blue here are two doses of oral semaglutide, seven milligrams and 14 milligrams. And if you just cast your eye across, it's a summary. You can see uh, we're getting good A1C reduction in excess of 1% of the higher dose of 14 milligrams. So you can see the variety of between 1.2 to 1.4 percentage reduction A1C. And that's average uh, on the number of trials in hundreds of patients. So we know it works. We know that GLP-1 also uh, helps uh, a weight reduction. And in these trials, uh, this was looked at also, and you can see here in the blue again, across all the trials, you can see from left to right, uh, you can see a reduction of, of weight in the top dose of 14 milligrams uh, between 3.4 and 4.4 kilos. And this is average weight loss in each trial. Remember, we can't really compare each trial to one another because it's a different population uh, and a different study. Uh, but you can see very good consistent weight loss, consistent HbA1c reduction, as one would expect with semaglutide, as we have been using semaglutide in subcutaneous form. I'm going to give you some uh, real-world data from the States uh, using uh, uh, oral stomaglutide or ribelsis. The reason I've chosen this is really is they, they've used this essentially, the FDA approved this in 2019. So they've had the longest experience uh, of use of ribelsis uh, in, in, many, in many areas. I'm aware that uh, ribelsis is not available here locally in Bahrain, but it is available in other uh, Gulf states. So again, this is a, uh, an observational a retrospective study uh, in the US and it aims to look at clinical characteristics of patients, but also efficacy in an observational way. So it looked at uh, patients uh, six months after treatment, but also looked at them 12 months before treatment. And it's based on databases in the US. And look at the time period on the bottom left here. This is October 19 to December 2020. So this is bang in the middle of COVID-19. Uh, so these patients were treated. Uh, most of them were probably in a remote uh, fashion, not coming to clinics, uh, uh, and it was really interesting to see how these medications made a difference during that time in the US. Uh, there's a lot of data here. I just want you to focus on the highlighted boxes. So average age, these are nearly 800 patients, average age of about 58. A1C categories, you can see 7 to 10%, 60%, but there are some patients, uh, nearly 17%, who had really bad diabetes control, more than 10% of HbA1c. As this is in the US, not surprisingly, 77% uh, uh, of patients have evidence of clinical obesity. On the right-hand side of the panel, you can see 30% uh, uh, of patients had uh, already had microvascular complications and almost 30% had established cardiovascular disease. So these weren't easy patients to treat. These were people with well-established diabetes and uh, complications. Uh, the treatment characteristics, we don't need to go through the detail, just the box tells you about 23% of patients were already taking GLP-1 therapy. So these were switched from subcutaneous to oral GLP-1 therapy. And on the right-hand side, you can see the initial dose used. Some started on the lowest dose, and we'll go through dosing in subsequent slides, three milligrams. Some started in three and seven milligrams. Some started at a higher dose because they were switching from subcutaneous to oral. So this is really uh, the crux of the uh, results. Uh, this is looking at HbA1c reduction. Overall, it was 0.9%. But if you look at the uh, on the left-hand side of the panel here, uh, so 0.9% is the first column. But if you go through the baseline HbA1c, you can see the higher the baseline HbA1c, the greater the reduction in A1c. And we see that in, in lots of patients with who initiate anti-hyperglycemic therapy. So you can see those who had a HbA1c in excess of 8% had a drop of 1.4%. And those people with the highest A1c uh, over 9% had a 2.1% reduction on average. That's really good glycemic improvements. On the right-hand side of the panel, you can see that splits up in those people who are naive to GLP-1, so who haven't had GLP-1 therapies before, average A1C reduction was 1%. And those who switched from subcutaneous to oral still had a drop, but a less of a drop of A1C of 0.6%. So you can see good efficacy in this retrospective study. 
Uh, lots of things to uh, caveat to just note, this is a retrospective small study. Remember there was no comparator and it wasn't a randomized controlled trial, but it gives us information of, of real world use uh, of uh, oral semaglutide in the US during COVID-19. So I thought that was useful data to share. Uh, you will know uh, that actually a real world study is continuing. We're one of the sites in the UK of uh, a real world study using Ribelsis to look at not only uh, clinical parameters, but also treatment satisfaction from patients in the real world setting. And we know locally there's a site in Saudi Arabia. Uh, uh, we're one of the sites in the UK. So we'll get more information about real world use and how that compares to the Pioneer clinical trial program. Okay, I told you about uh, dosing. So dosing is uh, starts at three milligrams. Uh, remember, uh, 30, at least 30 minutes before food or drink uh, uh, and not with too much water. So three milligrams for a month then the maintenance dose up to seven milligrams for a month, and then the top dose at 14 milligrams. So, so three steps uh, uh, in terms of dosing. Okay, so that's, we're gonna go switch from oral GLP-1 to new doses of existing GLP-1 therapies. So I'm gonna show you some data with dulaglutide. I know this is available locally, uh, otherwise known as Trulicity at the 1.5 milligram dose. Uh, we know now uh, availability is, is, is uh, uh, there are higher doses available, three milligrams and 4.5 milligrams. So let's see how that compares to the 1.5 milligram dose. You may be using these in your clinical practice. Uh, this is from the uh, Award 11 study. So this is an add-on to metformin therapy, uh, comparing the uh, 1.5 milligram dose in light blue uh, to the three milligram dose in dark gray to the 4.5 milligram dose in light green. You can see, in terms of A1C, an incremental reduction uh, from 1.5%, 1.7% to 1.8% in a 52-week uh, randomized control trial. Based on HbA1c in these patients on metformin therapy was 8.6%. So you can see additional benefits of the higher dose of dulaglutide. What about weight loss? Not surprising with GLP-1 therapies. As you rank up the dose, the weight loss continues to fall. So we've got 3.5 kilogram weight loss at a year. So average weight loss at a year, 3.5 kilograms uh, at the 1.5 milligram dose, uh, then 4.3 kilograms at three milligrams and five kilograms at the 4.5 kilograms. So a nice dose dependent reduction in weight. And the uh, baseline weight was 95 kilos, or almost 96 kilos. What about side effect profile? Is it that when we increase the dose of GLP-1, do we increase the rates of uh, GI adverse effects? Well, we do to some degree, but the overall uh, at the top here, the discontinuation rates, you can see they're very small, uh, uh, somewhere between 0.8% uh, and 1.5%. So most people tolerated the medication, did not discontinue the medication. And in the bottom panel here, you can see all reported GI side effects. So not surprisingly, uh, nausea goes up from 14 to 17%. Uh, vomiting from 6.4 to 10% and diarrhea 7% to 11%. So we're, we're used to this with GLP-1 therapies, nothing alarming here. We know the pen uh, with dulaglutide is preferred by some patients because the needle is hidden, it's easy to administer, it's once a week. So uh, now we can use the same pen, but at higher doses uh, uh, for those people on trulicity. Uh, I'm just gonna just make a point about cardiovascular outcomes trial. This is just a summary uh, in a sense that, that uh, in terms of three point uh, major adverse cardiac events, uh, the ones highlighted have shown uh, cate you know, categorically to be uh, uh, beneficial. And those are the ones that don't cross the line of unity uh, on this meta-analysis. You can see on the left-hand panel, a number of GLP ones that reduce uh, adverse clinical uh, cardiovascular events, but also in cardiovascular death on the right-hand side, uh, both uh, uh, liraglutide uh, as well as oral semaglutide showed benefits on cardiovascular mortality. So we know these medications are good uh, for cardio to preventing cardiovascular disease and cardiovascular death. Okay, and these are sort of patients we ought to be uh, are highlighting these therapies for. Uh, what about different types of patients? I thought this study was 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 an analysis was quite nice. Uh, it was looking at uh, a different ethnicity. Uh, Asian patients versus white patients, and it showed actually the, the benefits of, of a, to Asian patients was, was uh, uh, just as good, if not slightly better, compared to Caucasians. Uh, so uh, we're going to go on to combination medication. I hope you can still hear me. I'm not sure if my connection is okay or not. 
It's great, Dr. Dipesh, loud and clear. Perfect, wonderful. Uh, thanks, Dr. Iman. Uh, and uh, lastly, combination therapy, I think this is really exciting. So to Zepatide, you heard a little bit about this from uh, uh, Dr. Professor McGowan. This is a dual GIP, which stands for glucose-dependent insulinotropic peptide and GLP-1 uh, receptor agonist or co-agonist, uh, both receptors. It's a small molecule for weekly injections. Uh, and I'm gonna show you some, some data for this uh, medication that was developed by Eli Lilly uh, uh, for type two diabetes. And there are a number of uh, 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 clinical trial programs known as the SURPASS phase three clinical trial program in diabetes. So you can see here, I'm not gonna go through all these uh, trials in the interest of time. I'm just gonna show you a summary, but you can see there's uh, trial programs as monotherapy uh, versus uh, subcutaneous GLP-1 versus insulin uh, and, and, and other uh, trials. So you can see a comprehensive clinical trial program in more than 12,000 participants. These are ongoing. A lot of these studies have not reported as yet. Uh, they use three doses of the GLP-1 receptor agonist, uh, five milligrams to zepatide, 10 milligrams and 15 milligrams and versus an active comparator. Uh, uh, and the endpoint trials were either 40, 52 or 104 weeks. So randomized control trials for at least 40 weeks. Uh, and what did the people look like? Well, uh, you can see here, uh, the more therapies you're on, the, the longer the duration of diabetes. Uh, so the duration of diabetes from 4.7 uh, years up to 13 years, mean A1C around about 8% or 8.5%, mean body mass index around 32 to 34. And the background therapies are, are on the bottom here. So a wide variety of, uh, of participants. And you can see this is HbA1c reduction. Uh, and I just want to pause here. You can see uh, it, the three doses in blue, 5, 10, and 15 milligrams. And what you can see when you just scan HbA1c reduction across the graphs, you're seeing more than 2% reduction in HbA1c. This is sort of a land-breaking uh, glycemic reductions that we haven't really seen with previous treatments. So, uh, so this is, I think, this is a, a, a quite... Uh, uh, interesting, intriguing medication and very efficacious. So you can see uh, the comparator medication was at the bottom there in red. So you can see versus semaglutide one milligram, uh, uh, greater reductions in A1C compared to semaglutide, compared to basal insulin, and obviously compared to placebo. Uh, so very efficacious in terms of HbA1C reduction. Uh, and, and you can see here, uh, actually, uh, if you look at the HbA1c's, we're starting to see normal glycemia. We're starting to see not just antihyperglycemic medications, but actually reverting people back to normal glucose homeostasis. So HbA1c's of less than 6%. Uh, and you can see the clinical course of, of, of that treatment uh, in this trial. Uh, and, and then in terms of proportions of patients achieving uh, normal uh, glycemia, uh, if you can see in the blue here, we're, we're talking somewhere between 30 to 50 to 60 percent actually people going from type 2 diabetes to normal glucose homeostasis so this is, this is credit to to, to this uh, clinical trial program and medication what about weight loss uh you can see here in the blue at the three doses you can see dose dependent weight loss uh, of between uh, about 8% and up to 14% weight loss. So again, dose dependent with this co-agonist. So really impressive. Uh, and there's a separate clinical trial program for obesity uh, uh, with this medication. Uh, obviously, safety is really important. Uh, if we look at uh, uh, two trials in the SURPASS-2 and the SURPASS-4 trials compared to the comparator, you can see, yes, there were some discontinuations uh, uh, due to adverse effects, somewhere between 6 and 8.5% versus the comparator uh, medication uh, and versus on the bottom a trial shows you the SURPASS-4 trial uh, versus insulin glargine. You can see, yeah, some discontinuation of the order of uh, 8 to 11%. Uh, uh, but in terms of serious adverse effects, no different from compared to insulin. Uh, there was a slight baseline higher death rate, both in the insulin arm as well as the tisepatide arm, and that was probably a feature of the trial, but no major uh, uh, worrying signals here. I don't think this is a great slide. However, it just in terms of the y-axis, but it tells you that, that 
in terms of GI side effects, most were mild to moderate. And again, short acting as we expect with GLP-1 receptor agonists most of the time uh, by about uh, 12 weeks in most cases, uh, these were minimized. Uh, what about pancreatitis and gallstones? We worry about that in people, certainly people who lose weight rapidly. You can see small, small incidences of uh, pancreatitis, but not in all trials. So again, we're used to this uh, in GLP-1 receptor agonist trials. We see uh, cholelithiasis or gallstones and, and pancreatitis, but you can see the numerical numbers, they're very low. This is something that we warn our patients about uh, at the outset. So I'm gonna summarize here to allow uh, some time for some perhaps some questions. So I think the future is really bright for GLP-1 receptor agonist therapy, but also combination medications. I think GLP-1s are here to stay. I think more and more patients are gonna be treated with GLP-1 receptor agonists at an earlier stage to prevent complications, both cardiovascular and microvascular. I've showed you some data from new formulation of an oral uh, new medicines that hopefully will become available uh, uh, locally shortly. Uh, we've shown, shown you some data on subcutaneous uh, uh, GLP-1 at higher doses and also new combination medications. So I thank you all uh, to listening. I'm very happy to take questions. I'll unshare. Okay. There are two questions. One from Great. Dr. Jameen Nasser. Yes, you read it, I think. Uh, how do you switch from subcutaneous semaglutide to oral? That's a really good question. I don't think there's that much experience uh, in a sense. I, I guess uh, uh, the official way is, is to step down on therapy, start at three milligrams and go up. Uh, but certainly we've had some experience of using going from uh, one milligram semaglutide uh, to seven milligrams of oral semaglutide and then stepping up to 14 milligrams. It all depends on uh, how uh, uh, well tolerated the GLP-1 receptor agonist is. Uh, again, the official, I guess the official uh, way is actually starting at the lowest dose. A lot of us actually move from one dose directly to another. Remember, when we step up a dose GLP-1 therapy, people can uh, complain of GI, transient GI adverse effects. Um, the second question, uh, so cost is a factor. Yes, cost is a factor. Uh, you're right, uh, GLP-1 receptor agonists are more costly than other classes of medications. However, cardiovascular disease is costly. Uh, to the individual, uh, but also to uh, uh, the healthcare, different healthcare systems. So I think we need to target people uh, who are at high risk. Uh, so people, obesity, who are at high cardiovascular risk from this medication. And they're the ones I think judicial use of GLP-1 therapy is absolutely, uh, uh, I think, warranted. But you're right, uh, compared to other oral medications, uh, GLP-1 therapies are slightly more expensive. Uh, Dr. Dipesh, there is a question in the chat from sure. Mrs. Nagam. Was there a diet pattern followed on, uh, in these trials? So in all the trials, they will have at the outset, uh, you know, normal, usual care. So normal, usual care would, would be there would be some lifestyle uh, uh, advice at the start of the trial, but there's no active intervention with lifestyle throughout the trial. So most people, it's, it's basically like usual clinical care. They will have had some uh, advice on lifestyle measures at the outset, but not during uh, uh, the trial uh, in, in, a, in an intensive way. And as well, there are many compliments on a great lecture, Dr. Dipesh. Thank you. That's very kind. Thank you so much. Okay, so I think we're running uh, in good time. Good. So it gives our, our last speaker plenty of time to uh, go through our lecture. So we've got Dr. Jamil uh, al Mazan who's a consultant radiologist uh, here locally. He's head of radiology department, uh, also the Gulf Diabetes Specialist Science Center in the Kingdom of Bahrain. He again has multiple experiences of uh, presenting at uh, national and international uh, conferences. I think it's really great to have local speakers as well as guest speakers to actually mix it up a little bit to help the interaction. Uh, so uh, over to you, Dr. Almazan. Uh, you're gonna be telling us about bone disease. I look forward to your hearing your talk. Thank you very much, Dr. Patel. 
And I am waiting for Dr. Iman and uh, Mr. Ahmed. It is yes, Dr. Jamil, we are sharing. We are sharing, Dr. Jamil. Yeah, okay. yes. Thank you. If you want to start a little thing, Dr. Jamil, by the time it is uploaded, if you don't mind. Yeah. Well, I'll talk about, uh, in general, uh, osteoporosis, the new trains in osteoporosis. It is the trains that is clinically used, not uh, in diagnostic that. imaging of osteoporosis. Uh, I am Dr. Jamil El Mozan, consultant uh, radiologist, uh, head of radiology department, Gulf Medical and Diabetes Center and a North Hospital. The aim of this presentation is to discuss quantitative imaging uh, methods and the new practical, practical trends um, for osteoporosis and the fracture risk estimation as applied in clinical uh, care now. The studies and scientific research modalities for future application in this field are beyond the aim of the presentation. Before we start to speak about osteoporosis, let us a uh, few or brief uh, words about bone architecture. The human skeleton has 204 to 214 individual bones. It uh, weighs uh, about 10 kilograms and uh, accounts for about 15% of the body weight. A rough classification differentiates the skeleton of the trunk uh, to axial, uh, uh, which is from the trunk or, uh, or uh, of, of the skeleton of the extremities, which is uh, referred to as peripheral skeleton. In fact, bones either cortical or trabecular. Cortical bones uh, are compact, uh, gray of great uh, density, uh, main structural components uh, of appendicular bones and have more cortical bone. It makes about 80% of bone mass, while trabecular bones uh, are cancellous, uh, have a great uh, surface area, metabolically uh, active uh, and have more uh, the axial bones have more trabecular bones. Let us uh, note that uh, trabecular bones respond to, met to metabolic change eight times more faster uh, than does cortical bones. Osteoporosis affects millions of individuals across the world it is worldwide. Approximately 200 million women have osteoporosis. Prevalence is increasing uh, steadily, uh, proportional to the increasing uh, in aging pop population. It has been called silent epidemic because it is a frequency, uh, frequently undiagnosed prior to a fracture. The term osteoporosis um, was first used in France in the uh, used in France in the 18, in 1833. The French pathologist Jean Martin uh, Lopstein, who described postmortem uh, bones with abnormal hollow spaces, it um, had not used until Fuller uh, Albright's works. Uh, in Boston in 1940s. It had not used until, for, uh, uh, surprisingly, medical dictionaries and uh, reference books from 1972 uh, to uh, 1994 offer an uh, constant definitions. On 1994, WHO organization gave the definition uh, which had a wide world uh, acceptance. What was the definition? 
Osteoporosis is the most common metabolic bone disease. Uh, it is characterized by low bone mass or mineral density and microarchitectural -archit deterioration, which refer to as bone quality or bone strength. These changes lead to bone fragility and fractures and fra fracture risk and fractures. That is the main um, uh, definition of osteoporosis. Types of osteoporosis are uh, either primary or secondary. The primary uh, uh, osteoporosis is uh, the postmenopausal one, and uh, which is they refer to as type one, and the primary type two, which is referred as senile osteoporosis. Secondary are due to other medical diseases or so certain uh, medications. Rule of imaging, uh, diagnostic imaging, is uh, in fact to identify the presence of, uh, of osteoporosis, quantify bone mass and uh, microarchitecture, and also estimate the abnormality of uh, or probability of future fractures, which is a new trend in the last two uh, decades. Osteoporosis imaging, conventional radiography still play a main role in the diagnosis and in the diagnosis of, uh, of uh, fractures. It is uh, qualitative more than quantitative, and sometimes they try to use a semi-quantitative. But since the, uh, the, the use of dual uh, energy X-ray absorptiometry, which is DEXA, referred to DEXA, uh, it, it, is, uh, it is considered the main uh, quantitative uh, test for osteoporosis. Quantitative CT to qualify bone mineral content and assess bone loss. While morphometry, it is to, uh, to direct microfracture uh, in the spine mainly. Ultrasonography, which gives the bone properties and widely used uh, in uh, scanning, uh, but uh, popular scanning, but its uh, sensitivity is very low. Micro CT and the uh, high resolution MRI are used for bone micro architecture or PET scan to differentiate fractures of uh, osteoporosis from fractures due to uh, uh, metastasis. In fact, in the uh, X-ray, conventional X-ray of the spine, we will find increased radiolucency, uh, cortical thickening, which, which give a picture of framing or penciled um, uh, picture, uh, and sometimes the radiologists call, call, call it uh, empty box. In fact, prominent vertical trabeculae is one of the early signs in conventional radiograph of the spine. The last one is the anterior wedging, uh, compression deformity, or uh, uh, sometimes uh, uh, full compression. It can be, uh, it can be wedging, com anterior wedging as in the spine, or thoracic spine leading to, to kyphosis uh, and the main uh, thoracolumbar junction and mid-thoracic are typical for these fractures. Wedging, in, in fact, the fracture of the vertebrae of osteoporosis, uh, most common is the wedging, but also it can by, by concavity due to weakened end plates, and it can be also crushed, uh, crushed uh, fracture, which uh, all the height of the spine is affected. While fracture of proximal femur are the worst, and it, it is either intertrochanteric uh, inter or neck of femur and subtrochanteric, but it can happen anywhere in the pelvis, in the um, uh, in the pelvis, in the uh, humerus, in the radius, in the, the tibia, anywhere. Even femur can be. Uh, 
can be affected. In fact, vertebral fractures may go misdiagnosed as the clinical presentation can be not specific. And two thirds of vertebral fracture do not give a clinical symptoms. The, the, this may be only detected on radiological imaging. It increased the risk of a new vertebral fracture up to five folds and the risk of other uh, fragility fractures, other regions in the body, two to four folds at different studies. This is to show you how they try to make uh, the proximal femur to make it uh, more uh, um, quantitative um, by uh, detecting the uh, uh, trabeculae, which can be uh, uh, the principal compressive group, principal senile group, great rock enter group, and secondary senile group, and secondary compressive group. In fact, seeing, try to uh, make a, a classification uh, and grading for osteoporosis from grade six to grade one, where grade six is the normal and grade one when all these trabeculae disappear. But since the use of uh, DEXA, because of its simplicity and relatively low cost, bone mineral density measurement has been the main tool used to diagnose osteoporosis, according to criteria established by the World Health Organ Organization. It measures bone mineral density. Now it is uh, uh, the standard of reference for the clinical diagnosis of osteoporosis with bone densitometry. In fact, this is a DEXA equipment. Uh, 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 it is symbol equipment where we find the uh, mobile X-ray source, which give a fan beam radiation and the detector, uh, which a detection system, uh, you, you notice here the tube of X-ray is below the patient and the uh, detector is anterior to the patient. So we can scan the spines and pelvis by this way. For each region, we gain two measurements, bone mineral uh, uh, contents in grams and area of measure side in square uh, centimeter. And this one considered, that is why it's considered is not uh, totally accurate because it is 2D and not 3D. Then it is expressed in terms of a standard deviation as a T-score and a Z-score. What is T-score? T-score is difference between patient bone mineral density and the main bone min mineral density of a standard young adult population, which considered as peak bone mass. It's, it's, it's a mass study done in the United States, in Europe, in Japan, and then in other countries to get the peak bone density for bone mass for the young people between the age 24 to 30 years, who's con considered the, a normal person, who's considered the uh, peak uh, bone mass. And what is that score? It is Z, uh, uh, it's age matched bone mineral density, difference between the patient bone mineral density and the main uh, bone mineral density of age and gender match control. It's the same age and same gender. This set score, Z score is particularly important in young people, elderly uh, and elderly people above 75 years. This is the, uh, how we gain a scan for, uh, for a femur. And uh, you, you notice here, uh, there is a different uh, points of interest, but the most important, important is the make of the femur density and all total hip uh, density. While in the spine, uh, we gain the uh, 
reading of L1, L2, L3, and L4 by each one, but we don't depend for, on each one alone. We make the main of these four, or the reading of total of these four uh, spines. It is, in fact, uh, index spine, W H O uh, classification of bone mineral density based on T score mainly. It is whenever it is uh, more than or equal to equal to or more than minus one, it is considered normal. Whenever it is minus one but uh, more than minus two point five, is considered as osteopenia. And if it is uh, less than minus 2.5, it's considered uh, equal or less than minus 2.5, considered osteoporosis. And the osteoporosis is considered severe when associated with a fragility fracture. In fact, there are advantages and disadvantages for a DEXA study. The advantage look low uh, radiation dose, low cost, easy to use, uh, highly uh, reproducible. While uh, disadvantage is, is a two, as I said, two uh, D, and uh, it can uh, it can't diagnose fractures, uh, marked uh, osteo uh, uh, distortion of a skeleton architecture can affect the study, and it's. Uh, we gain by this study only bone mineral de uh, density, but not the architecture. So in diabetic patients, we gain a high bone mineral density, but in fact, the architecture of the bone is very weak and we have fracture risk while the bone mineral density is coming. It's also in uh, other, uh, as, uh, affected by other, like uh, spinal arthritis, spondylolisthesis, kyphoscoliosis, vertebral fractures, and also it's affected by our calcification, calcification or any nearby calcification to the spines. Uh, it's uh, uh, also affected by orthopedic metal devices and affected by bony grafts. It can sometimes confuse the physician, the physician as I said, as it is mainly an indicator of bone mass. It is poorer indicator of bone strength and the quality, which is more difficult to, um, to uh, be assessed. That is why they found uh, a, 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 a software, which is uh, assess fracture risk assessment tool or FRAGS. In fact, frag, fracture risk assessment tool, FRAGS, developed by the University of Sheffield on 2008, and then known as World Health, or Health Organization Fracture Risk Assessment Tool on to 2010. It combined bone mineral density measurement and risk factors. It is easy to use and can give the health professional a more accurate measure of a fracture risk, and hence a more objective method to determine the therapeutic intervention. These are, in fact, the uh, main uh, 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 clinical risk factors like age, sex, weight, height, previous fractures, parent uh, fracture hip, current smoking, uh, glucocorticoids, uh, rheumatoid arthritis, uh, secondary osteo, uh, osteoporosis, alcohol three or more units per day, uh, and lastly, and most importantly, bone mineral density. All these risk factors are by a software, give us a new reading for, uh, uh, for the osteoporosis estimation. Calculation tool is there, we can use it manually, or it is provided with the DEXA uh, machines itself. Manually, it is there online, and uh, depending on the country it is used, 
on the or population group it is you i tried on one of our patient tried um, on the uh, united states uh, tool it give us a t score of minus 2.2 which is the same we we studied by uh, our uh, machine uh, but it give us the probability of a fracture risk it is 22 percent for the next 10 years for this patient to have a, a major osteoporotic fracture and eight percent for hip fractures uh, probability of hip fracture for the uh, next 10 years in fact i i tried also on united kingdom tool i found with that uh, uh, with that studying uh, a view an OGG guidance. What is an OGG guidance? In fact, it's uh, the National Osteoporosis Guidance uh, Group, an OGG. It gives us a graphic picture for the uh, uh, next 10 to 20 years uh, probability of fracture. And we, uh, with that, we, you can see here uh, a treatment guide, and if the life of style of the patient is bad, it goes we give also advice and reassurance. That is uh, the other thing. Uh, but although um, algorithms such as FRAX represent major advance in clinical practice, these calculations do not uh, uh, accommodate all non risk factors and there are more fracture determinants remaining to be discovered. So they add to it another uh, algorithmic or a computer uh, software, which is Trabecular Bone Score, TBS. The Trabecular Bone Score, TBS, seems a promising quantitative imaging parameter in osteoporosis, to some extent independent of uh, DEXA or bone mineral density. Whereas DEXA is a measure of bone quantity, TBS provides information on the uh, biomechanics uh, and the uh, microarchitecture, which reflects trabecular structure. In fact, uh, a major uh, advantage, uh, uh, advantage is that it can be derived from DEXA scans using dedicated post processing software. Uh, and TBS is less expensive and more easily accessible than CT or MRI for widespread clinical impl implementation, or as an outcome in large research studies. Still, we are using the same machine. If you go to the previous scans you find uh, adjust with tbs if your machine have the software of tbs you can adjust it uh, and give it more accurate uh, study this is a sample of what we we can find if we have this software on your machine uh, these are two patients with the same bone mineral density by dexa study uh, if you go to the that tbs you will find the first patient in good microarchitecture and this will affect our study while the sec second patient more spaces and uh, it gives us uh, more spaces if you compare it and this one also the algorithm is showing you more spaces than this one and this is bone micro uh, arch micro architecture and this will give you extra um, uh, benefit in diagnosis and management of osteoporosis. Okay, now there is also limitation where the limitation is mainly here for the uh, uh, study of, of uh, diabetic patient and for uh, disc degeneration or vertebral degeneration, spinal degeneration. So the, the FDA recently approved volumetric quantitative computed tomography as a method of measurement of bone strength at the hip 
and the spine for special cases such as diabetic disease, as I said. As in this one, you see there is a phantom which is uh, give uh, a bone density and a structure like the bone, the bone. And here is the study uh, away from the aorta calcification, any soft tissue, other soft tissue calcification. calcification. And still, this, this is under study, still a minimal number of, uh, of uh, uh, centers use it. Why? Because, um, because higher radiation exposure, a special software for CT system and educated personnel are required. It takes a little longer to report result with uh, a quantitative CT computer to DEXA. Uh, compared to DEXA, overlooking any visceral uh, organ pathology might cause legal problems. Like, for example, you do uh, this volumetric quantitative CT study for a patient, and uh, but at the same time, the patient have a tumor and you didn't look for it because you are do doing the volumetric, and this one lead to a legal uh, problem. More. Uh, it is more expensive compared to DEXA. What's next? In my opinion, the most next research studies are also depend on DEXA machine, but they will add to it the lateral uh, exposure. So it will be in a 3D and not in a 2D. It will be in kilogram per liter and not uh, in uh, uh, gram in uh, square uh, centimeter. And this will add too much. And we can also more accurately by this 3D machines, DEXA machines, accurately uh, estimate the osteoporosis uh, uh, as uh, bone mineral density and as bone uh, architecture, microarchitecture. Otherwise, MRI, CT scan is still under study. It is expensive. Uh, the CT's uh, side effects is the uh, higher exposure. And also, it needs a big equipment and different other uh, side effects. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jamil. Uh, very clear uh, lecture uh, on osteoporosis, imaging osteoporosis, something that we all see in our clinics, whether our patients had uh, diabetes or not, or other metabolic diseases, we know bone density goes down with age. Okay, so I'm gonna bring up some of the questions and answers. Uh, there was a question here uh, asking, Osteoporosis and Paget's disease. Uh, what's your experience with uh, those two conditions? Uh, sometimes it can, can be associated, but in fact, for management, we, uh, we, I am a radiologist. So the radiologist always put it on the bird of, of the endocrinologist. So Dr. Batel maybe can help you more than me. Dr. Fadi, thank you. Oh yes, we in terms of Padgett's, luckily we don't see that very often uh, anymore, uh, but certainly to reduce bone turnover, the treatment is the same. We use a bisphosphonate to reduce bone turnover and osteoclasts, yeah. uh, either oral or parenteral. So that's the treatment that we use. Right, there's another, uh, I saw a question, some compliments, which is always nice to see. Uh, do you have any experience of osteoporosis by mast cells? It's a question. Is, this is for endocrinologist and not for me. I am radiologist. For the radiologist. I certainly don't have much experience in terms of uh, mast cell related osteoporosis. Uh, certainly we use treatments, a number of bone uh, anti-resorptive treatments, uh, both oral and uh, uh, injectable treatments for the treatment of osteoporosis. Uh, I had a question for you, Dr. Jimmel, if that's okay. Yeah. Something we see commonly in people treated with bisphosphonates. 
Yeah. So what's the best uh, modality, in your opinion, to, to pick up any micro fractures in people on bisphosphonate therapy? Uh, they use nowadays uh, lateral uh, x-ray with, with uh, uh, computerized, which is digital and computerized, to detect the uh, micro uh, morphology, in fact, and micro fractures. Okay. But right. CT scan also, it is, uh, as I said, uh, the quantitative one, volumetric quantitative one, is higher than the uh, X-ray itself to detect micro fractures. So quantitative CT sounds a good modality. Yeah. Is there any role of nuclear medicine uh, in in picking up uh, these micro fractures at all? Some sometimes uh, uh, for nuclear medicine. PET, PET scan, we use PET scan, in fact, not uh, where we use it to differentiate uh, the fractures due to osteoporosis from fractures due to metastasis, which is maybe in this age group of osteoporosis is high, the metastasis causes. Sure. Yeah. A very important differential, what's the cause of the osteoporotic fracture? Yes, is, is yeah. it a pathological fracture or is it just simple bone density and, and, and bone architecture? Now that that was really useful. Uh, I can't see any other. We have a question from Zahra Ahmad in the Q and A box, please. From Zahra Ahmad, very good. Thanks, Dr. Iman. You're always very good at organizing us. Uh, Pleasure, doctor. Trying to find the question. Uh, are bony changes of osteosclerosis weak and prone to fracture? What does it mean in patients treated with anti-cancer therapy shown in PET scan? Dr. Jamil. Yeah, uh, yeah. sometimes we find that the bones, not only in, in, in the patient who are taking uh, uh, chemicals against cancer, uh, it is also we can see it in the diabetic patients. We found that the bone is sclerosed, but at the same time, it is contain micro fractures and uh, very wide spaces within the bone. So it is uh, easily fragile. That is my answer for this question. Sure, well, I guess we see osteosclerosis quite a lot in falsely increasing bone density, don't we? Yeah. How, yeah. Do, we, how do we interpret that, Dr. Jamil? How do we interpret those measurements? The, of, of what? Of uh, when we see osteosclerosis, yeah, falsely increasing bone density, giving bone us reassurance. Density, yeah, we will have uh, we will have very high bone density, but but at the at the same time, the micro architecture architecture is very weak, because there is a lot of spaces, a lot of micro fractures leading to fragility of these bones, and uh, this this is sometimes lead to difficulty for the physician. We send for him a high bone mineral density while the patient is susceptible for a fracture, like for, for example, diabetic patients. Also, the patients who are taking chemotherapy, some certain chemotherapies. And even nowadays, by, by, by sulfonate, which you, you use it for the treatment, can lead to uh, uh, even uh, femoral fracture. Mm. It is in some paper mention it. So what, what modality would you use in these patients to accurately gauge? Uh, is the volumetric. volumetric. Volumetric, yeah, CT scan. Is CT the best. Scan. Yeah. Okay. But under studies nowadays, uh, the MRI, and they consider it higher because it's going up even to the molecular level of study for the bone. Great. Okay. But still under study. Wonderful, wonderful. Well, thank you very much for the, uh, the lecture and also the informative question and answer session. I'm sure we'll bring you back to give us an update on imaging, has things changed and improved uh, in terms much. of other modalities. Excellent. Thank you, thank you so, Dr. Thank you. Jamil, Dr. Batil, for your uh, interesting lectures. Uh, now we will uh, start the uh, second session uh, with the, uh, Professor uh, Maher Jalou. Is the clinical professor of medicine, senior consultant in internal medicine, uh, diabetes and endocrinology in Gulf Medical University, faculty in Canadian Academy of uh, Natural Health, 
examiner for the Royal College of Physicians, MRCP, establishing the Diabetes Endocrinology Unit in Thampi Hospital, 2004. From June 2020, joined the Internal Medicine and Technology Center in Thampi University Hospital, affiliated to Gulf Medical University. Editor in, uh, in chief, Diabetes Digest from Iraq, editorial board members and reviewer for uh, many international diabetes and technology journals with many publications in medical periodicals. Awarded twice a special honor and award recognition of uh, uh, exemplary achievement in the field of internal medicine and chronology and for the uh, invaluable service to the community. So Prof Professor Maher Jalou, he will talk now about the uh, COVID-19. Uh, Dr. Mm -hmm. Maher with us? Yes. Yeah. And uh, the, this topic, the evidence-based focus on vitamin D during the uh, pandemic to uh, be presented earlier than uh, other colleagues because of another commitment. Thank you, Professor Maher. Those for you. Thank uh, Good evening, uh, my colleague. Thank you, Dr. Asad, and thank you for organizing committee of the fifth Internal Medicine, Diabetes, and Obesity Conference, uh, which is approved year after year to be a fundamental uh, uh, education, gathering the, the regional and the international speaker. Uh, my screen is it clear. It is clear. Okay. We can see. Yeah. So my talk will be about evidence-based focus on uh, vitamin D during the pandemic, which is very hot topic. This is the campus of our university. This is my disclosure. I have no disclosure for this presentation. So my objective will be describe the physiologic function of vitamin D and the influence of vitamin D deficiency on health. Focus on the practical tips for management of vitamin D deficiency in clinical practice and fully elaborate on the clinical data on the link between vitamin D and COVID-19 and take home message. So let's start. What do we know about vitamin D? We live in a sunny world, but we are sun deprived. So the common sense says vitamin D deprived too. The hunter gatherer have vitamin D level of around 45 nanogram per mil. For now, fair to presume that these are the level humans should have. And the CDC reported the average American have a level of 22 nanogram per mil. Serum level of up to 100 nanogram per mil are safe. This means doses of up to 10,000 international unit daily are safe and probably much higher in some patients. So considering the widespread distribution of vitamin D receptor in the human body, should it be surprising that research is continually uncovering the new rules and beneficial effects for vitamin D? Given these circumstances, given what vitamin D has been shown to do, I believe vitamin D should be monitored and treated in a clinical setting. We know the metabolism of vitamin D when up to 90% of the total vitamin D from the sun, just 10 to 20% of total vitamin D from the diet. So treating deficiency with diet is definitely not sufficient. It's two stage of, of activation in the liver, the 25 hydroxylation and in the kidney, to produce the 125 hydroxy vitamin D. And the main action will be the calcium homeostasis and the bone metabolism and also the neuromuscular function. But it is a pro-hormone with safe endocrine and autocrine and paracrine function. In the endocrine uh, uh, action, apart, apart from the intestinal calcium transport and the bone metabolism, and the renal calcium reabsorption, blood pressure regulation, and insulin secretion. At autocrine and paracrine action, inhibition of the cell proliferation, promotion of the cell differentiation, and the immune regulation. We need to differentiate between active and inactive vitamin D. The 125 dihydroxyvitamin D is physiologically active and the serum half-life is four to six hours. 
while the inactive 25 hydroxy vitamin D3, most often measured clinically in the serum, it is an indicator of vitamin D stores in the body, reflect the amount of vitamin D derived from both food and sun, and have a half-life of two to three weeks. Should vitamin D level be major? This is since 2012 for the clinical practice guidelines in the UK. Numerate the adults at risk group, people over 65 years age, people not exposed to a great deal of sunlight, people with darker skin and the pregnant and the breastfeeding women. Then the National Osteoporosis Foundation add the elderly malabsorption, patients with celiac disease, chronic renal insufficiency, the housebound people chronically ill and limited sun exposure. And the list included now the high risk group for vitamin D deficiency, which really included any patient with, with disease. The chronic disease, particularly the kidney, heart, liver, failure, in particular patient with transplant and patient recipient, uh, 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 kidney recipient and dialysis, gastrointestinal, especially the Crohn disease, inflammatory bowel disease and malabsorption, the granuloma forming disorders, including sarcoidosis, tuberculosis, any hospitalized individual in the ICU, hyper and hypoparathyroidism, the obese children and adult particularly, those after bariatric surgery, the oncologic patient, the pregnant, and also the reduced ultraviolet B exposure and psychiatric. And never forget patient taking medication implicated in low vitamin D, several antiretroviral medication, antifungal medication, several Caesars medication, cholestyramine, and the glucocorticoid therapy. And now accumulating evidence that vitamin D is linked to many chronic disease, a long list that vitamin D play an important role in. So what cutoff value defined low vitamin D? For the nanomole, 25 is below 25 is deficiency, 25 to 75 is insufficiency, more than 75 will be sufficiency. And the optimal level, for the nanogram is 30 nanogram per mil determined at the Caucasian population. But variability of vitamin D concentration by the geographical location and difference in the assay methodology. How much vitamin D is enough? Mounting evidence indicates that the optimal level should be 40 to 60. And this is as seen in the sars cov Zero positively study by the Kaufman and colleague. In the open label vitamin D supplementation, a breast cancer incidence study, and in the open label vitamin D supplementation, a blood pressure study. Vitamin D and the COVID, why the controversy? I think this is my main focus of this presentation. This is nice article in the rheumatic and musculoskeletal disease, uh, evidence for a potential role of vitamin D in the COVID-19, and explain how vitamin D may impact the outcome in patient with COVID. And he mentioned that, you know, apart from the stages of activation, the calcitrol, the vitamin D, decrease the inflammation through decreasing the prostaglandin biosynthesis or action, especially, prostaglandin 2, decreasing the pro-inflammatory cytokine, different interleukin 12, 6, 17, INF gamma, TNF alpha, and this is, will help in decreasing the effect on the respiratory system, decreasing the inflammatory process and the acute respiratory tract injury. The active 4, through the, act, the action of the D, uh, vitamin D receptor, modulate the immune cell through the macrophage, leading to the increased defense against infection, the T regulatory cells and the interleukin 10 increase and have an antimicrobial peptide increase and also the autophagy in the macrophage increase. And this is will lead to modulate the asthma 
COPD exacerbation, decreasing, decreasing lung fibrosis and increase the lung function. On the other, that the vitamin D, apart from the immune modulating, which decreasing the cytokine storm, which is considered the main pathogenesis for the mortality in COVID, is also have an impact in, in increasing the ICE2 and decrease, modulate the RAS, which is lead to decreasing acute lung injury and uh, uh, IRDS, in addition, have an impact to decreasing the viral entry and the viral replication. So we know that angiotensin II through the, the, the uh, act as a pro-inflammatory on various levels from monocyte, dendritic cell, T lymphocyte, uh, T regulatory cell, and the B lymphocyte, and vitamin D, the active form through vitamin D, uh, work as an anti-inflammatory through normalizing and neutralizing the bad effect of the angiotensin II. This is a nice review, vitamin D deficiency, an update on the current status worldwide. This is in January 20. And you know, vitamin D in the media, with the beginning of the pandemic, every day there is news about vitamin D. So let us start with some facts that evidence linking vitamin D deficiency with COVID-19 severity is circumstantial, but considerable. The links with ethnicity, obesity, and age, and all have an impact on mortality in COVID. With people living in an institute and different latitude. Association evidence from experimental model of respiratory pathogen. And the preliminary reports of association with COVID severity in hospitalized patients. In addition to the basic biology study showing extensive vitamin D impact on the immune system underlying various antiviral and inflammatory response and vitamin D responsive gene altered in the lung lymphocyte from patient COVID-19 patient. Yes, there is a link, but we need to look, I mean, on the study uh, published during the pandemic on vitamin D. How COVID has fundamentally changed the clinical research and publication. You know, the, the medical research community response result in overwhelming of large number of clinical trials have been registered and done with a questionable methodological quality. Either they are too small in a scale to provide conclusive evidence, necessitate investing in more large study to have a high quality data impacting a change in a clinical and public health practice, especially in an, a pandemic like COVID. Preprint research reports that have not yet been peer reviewed and accepted for publication have increased rapidly during the COVID pandemic, leading to high profile. Described the study have raised concern that speed the priority over the quality and the credibility of evidence. What Lancet say about its preprint? Preprint available here are not Lancet publication or necessarily under review with a Lancet journal. These preprint are early stage research paper that have not been peer reviewed. The finding should not be used for clinical or public health decision making should not be presented to a lay audience without highlighted that they are preliminary and have not been peer reviewed. And I think we circulate anything like peer, uh, preprint without taking in consideration these from Lancet. So we need to read spectacularly the research during the COVID era. Low vitamin D level have been linked to so many things. It's either the most important vitamin in the world, or it is a stand in for some other important thing. When we have tested all of these existing link, the randomized trial giving some people vitamin D and some placebo, they almost always not showed uniform, a clear effect. So we need to read 
spectacle. This is the Medscape warning about the scientists say health warning needed on vitamin D COVID preprint. Why? After the publication of this study from Spain, cancer treatment and COVID-19 related outcome from the Autonomous University of Barcelona. The conclusion of the study, the calfisidiol administered shortly after hospitalization markedly reduced the recruitment in the ICU admission and decreased mortality by more than 50%. Strong conclusion. The baseline level negatively correlated with the ICU admission and mortality. These findings point to the relevant attention in adequate vitamin D status. This is particularly attractive in the current epidemiology. Then, the, this reprint from the Lancet removed because this study, after evaluation by the National Center of Biomedical Research and the Frailty and Healthy Aging in Spain, the report conclude in the elaboration of the manuscript and the corresponding of the author with the journal, there was a series of mistakes made by the author in the qualification of the study. So it is removed. The authors will improve it and send it back to publication in the Oxford Academic. And we need to read behind the headline. Dramatic positive findings are presented, but the important methodological details are missing. It was a cluster rather than individual randomized trials. They just whole of, of, of admitted word. It wasn't balanced in number. With that, different data analysis is needed. It is not registered with the clinical trials before starting, so which reduces their credibility and means there is no benchmark against which to assess the outcome. 50 people originally in the control group changed to receiving vitamin D at the ICU. This is a clear contamination. And participants in the two groups were not equally matched. 53 of participants in the treated group were male compared with 60 in the untreated group. Male have higher mortality. And the baseline level is also not the same. Another study from Indonesia, and this is coming in April 20. And this is fundamentally mentioned that majority of COVID cases with insufficient and deficient vitamin D status died. The odds of death was higher in older and male cases with a pre-existing condition and below normal vitamin D level. When controlling for age, sex, and comorbidity, vitamin D status is strongly associated with COVID-19 mortality. Use more than one, sorry. This is used more than 100,000 times, downloaded more than 17,000 times, mentioned in the social media and through Google scholars, and then it has taken by the internet. This publication had not been peer reviewed. And the problem, they couldn't track down the author of the study, which didn't mention the name or number of hospital involved, no ethical approval, plus vitamin D are not normally checked in Andalusia. So it is unclear how the author have acquired that information. And now this paper is no longer in the preprint. Another study from Iran, vitamin D sufficiency and serum vitamin D. Then just after one month, there is expression of concern in the same journal because there is impact of, you know, the study of the sample size, there's on the robust statistical analysis and the co-founders, they mention of the causal relationship, but only 31 had PCR test confirming COVID-19 diagnosis and the other diagnosed clinically by the infectious disease. How we can depend on data of such a study? And also the competing interest for the authors and conclude that they are cannot explain the cause and effect of relationship between vitamin D sufficiency and the COVID-19. So I think we need to be worry 
about any study which is not peer reviewed and don't you know evaluated fully for the impact of vitamin D during the COVID. What data have we have from the Gulf? Uh, I choose the three study from Saudi Arabia, from United Arab Emirates, and from Kuwait. This is from Saudi Arabia, the effect of two weeks, 50,000 versus 1,000 of vitamin D3 supplementation on recovery of symptoms in patients with mild to moderate COVID-19 randomized controlled trial. The study that they give group of patients 5,000, another group of patients 1,000, and they follow them as outpatient because they are mild to moderate uh, for many criteria. Only 70 patients involved of this, and they give the medication just for two weeks. And the COVID symptoms were noted on admission and monitored by phone until full recovery. So what's the impact of these 5,000 and 1,000? There is impact of body, uh, not a statistical difference on the impact of body mass index and interleukin-6 level. But they mentioned that 5,000 international group has significantly shorter time to recovery per days than the 1,000 group. What is recovery of what? Resolving of cough and the loss of test how strong this outcome. The study limitation, the assessment of symptoms at follow-up were collected over the phone by a blinded data collector, which sometimes, you know, subjective. The beneficial effect of 5,000 in this appear only on mild or moderate cases with mild vitamin D deficiency to insufficiency, not applied to severe COVID-19 with worse vitamin D status. The duration for intervention is just two weeks. And at the baseline difference in the parameter, 5,000 was significantly younger compared to 1,000 group. And in contrast, the 1,000 group has significantly higher body mass than the 5,000. Both these will impact the, you know, the severity of COVID. So this is in, in conclusion that give 5,000 better than 1,000 for those patients. The other study from United Arab Emirates, COVID disease, severity, and death in relation to vitamin D status among COVID positive in the UAE resident. This is the study data on vitamin D plausible rule in preventing and treating COVID. The study examined the relation between vitamin D status and the COVID severity and mortality among multi-ethnic population in the UAE, 522 participants tested positive, one of the main hospital in Abu Dhabi and the other in Dubai. Smaller number for death most likely affected the analysis. Socioeconomic status for all participants was not assessed, as well the dietary habit and availability of the fortified food. The use of supplement and the sun exposure were all not recorded and could have an impact. Optimal concentration of the serum vitamin D for overall using different cutoff might slightly change the result. And the bone sanitary guidelines recommend a target of 20, while the guidelines focus on the pleiotropic effect of vitamin D of 30. So the conclusion that our data showed that the serum 25, vitamin D are strongly associated with COVID severity and mortality among a sample of affected people in the UAE. Such findings suggest important implication that vitamin D supplementation could help reduce the severity disease at risk of infection. Further larger observational study and randomized control trial are necessary. The last study from Kuwait, which is probably give another data, in hospital mortality in SARS-CoV-2 stratified by the serum vitamin D level, a retrospective study. So this study is done to estimate in hospital mortality in patient, sorry, mortality in patient with severe acute stratified by vitamin D level. Total of 230 patients were included. 
patient will stratify the coding by the serum vitamin D into below 40 nanomole and above 40 nanomole. The mean age, 49 plus minus 17 and 76 were male. The medium length overall stay 18 days. Vitamin D level were seen as deficient in 63 of patient, insufficient in 25 and normal in only 12. So the length of time spent in the ICU was higher in the individual with a higher level of vitamin D in contrary to all the data, more than 40 than in those with lower level of vitamin D, statistically significant. Elderly patients have higher level of vitamin D, despite they have the higher mortality. Overall mortality was 17 patients, 7.1, but statistically not significant among the group. So the Kaplan-Meier survival analysis showed no significance based on the alpha of 0.05, indicating vitamin D level was not able to adequately predict the hazard of mortality. This is the conclusion. So the final thought to be remembered. There is any clear whether patients were able to be efficiently convert 25 hydroxyvitamin D to the active form during the acute event, because this conversion is inhibited by the osteocyte-derived hormone fibroblast growth factor 23, which is elevated in acutely ill patient like COVID patient. The calcifidiol that boosts the circulating level more quickly and to higher level compared with a standard form of vitamin D called the cholecalciferol have an impact. It is important to remain open-minded to the emerging result from Con rigorously conducted the study of vitamin D. Prospect for the future, a search of clinical trials, more than 40 and now more than 50 ongoing intervention trial on vitamin D. Whether vitamin D is helpful in preventing infection, reducing disease progression, and reducing mortality in patients with COVID remain not clearly known. There is a need to improve coordination and collaboration in a clinical trial research for global health. So my conclusion, my dear colleague, vitamin D deficiency is common, particularly in people living well away from the equator and can persist throughout the year in individuals who have little sunlight exposure. Vitamin D deficiency is readily preventable by supplement that it is very safe and relatively cheap. The current definition of vitamin D deficiency less than 25 is low by international standard and evidence from the parathyroid hormone status, which rises with vitamin D deficiency, as well as large population study of all cause mortality suggests that a target blood level of at least 50 is more appropriate. This would require supplementation of at least 800 international unit per day, not the 400 as currently recommended to bring most individual up to the normal range. The growing evidence suggests that regular daily supplementation is more effective than intermittent high dose bullets. Giving injection of a 300, I don't think it will benefit more than giving, for example, 10,000 every day. Vitamin D supplementation at level needed to avoid deficiency is extremely safe and reasonably cheap and randomized placebo controlled the trial of vitamin D in the community in vitamin D deficient individual will be difficult to conduct and will wait the data of the ongoing trial. And thank you very much. This is my reference. Thank you very much. Thank you, Professor Maher for uh, this review and uh, really the data you use uh, from the uh, area. And uh, it's really informative. I have a question until we get questions from the audience. We used to know that osteomalacia and uh, to have low vitamin D, then uh, calcium low and phosphorus to be uh, associated with uh, high alkaline phosphatase. Do you uh, have your patients and in the clinical practice 
observing the similar scenarios or now we are looking only for the level and we are beyond the bond. So if you can comment on this issue. I, I, I think we should educate uh, ourselves as care provider that when we face a patient with severe vitamin D deficiency, not just, I mean, rush and prescribe the vitamin D, check the calcium, check the phosphorus, check the alkaline phosphatase, probably check the renal function, and probably you uh, end by discovering another problem rather than simply vitamin D deficiency, which uh, sometimes not enough to, to, to correct the patient to problem without, for example, the supplementation of the calcium and good dietary and proper follow-up. Yes, I think, you know, the, 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 the propaganda probably of the vitamin D is, is overcome the practice that sometimes we are missed to check for other parameters, which is so closely uh, related to the function of vitamin D. Yeah, another question for me, in case of hyperparathyroidism, of course, we know that hyperparathyroidism, they will have uh, hypercalcemia. So if it is associated with vitamin D deficiency, what will be your next step? I think for those patients, we need to, to uh, I mean, no, first of all, it is a primary hyperparathyroidism or it is secondary due to the renal, uh, I mean, CKD. And if it is a primary, I think, you know, the proper uh, step is to correct the underlying pathology on the first, because, you know, just giving the vitamin D to correct the vitamin D, you are promoting probably more elevation in the calcium and you are not able to correct the original pathology. I think the priority for those patients is to treat hyperparathyroidism first and then look for vitamin D. Or you should give the daily requirement just to be cautious and not the higher dose uh, for, for reaching the level of, you know, as we mentioned, the 40 or 50. And there is a question from uh, delegates uh, from uh, Samia Mustafa Mustafa. Uh, she's asking that 800 units for prophylaxis, is it for all age, for all time, or it should be uh, adjusted accordingly? I think this is, uh, for, for we can uh, say 12 years and above, this is the recommended minimal dose if we need to achieve the target, probably not. Also, also some of the nutritional advice is still they mention the 400. But if we are aiming, aiming to the higher level rather than just the minimal 30, I think 800 is needed. In the pediatric age group, probably, you know, our colleagues, the pediatrician, maybe uh, adjust, you know, probably a smaller dose. But it is safe even to give this daily requirement for all age group. For patient, which is probably to maintain a healthy vitamin D, this is probably not enough for the management of deficiency or insufficiency. There is another question from uh, uh, Dr. Madiha uh, uh, Tanmuir. Uh, looking, uh, uh, can we switch? from uh, 50,000 unit to uh, vitamin D to 1,000 unit daily for adults? 50,000 to 1,000, this is depend on the level you need to treat. You know, 1,000 is, is, is very low dose to, to manage any deficiency or insufficiency. As we mentioned, the daily requirement is around 800. But I think if we need, if, if we, you can switch from the 50,000 per week to give 10,000 every day, five days per week, I prefer this method rather than giving the higher dose uh, intermittently. And definitely, I am not advocate to give the 300 injection for vitamin D. So uh, there is a, a comment from Tahani Al Aradi. And she mentioned that we cannot find 800 uh, milligram in the pharmacy. What is your choice to do? Two tablets of 400. Yeah. Okay. 
By this, uh, if there is no more questions, I would like to uh, thank uh, Professor uh, Maher for his nice presentation. And we will introduce uh, next speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Asad, and thank you for the organizing committee. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I think the Professor Maher, he will have commitment and you need to leave. Thank you for your uh, kind uh, participation. Thank you for uh, understanding and rescheduling my talk. Thank you. Thank you, thank Asad. You. Hope see you next year in, in, in Manama. Sure. Physically, we should see you next year. Uh, Dr. Ahmed uh, Salahuddin is an ENT specialist in North Specialist Hospital, holder of master degree in auto uh, rhino Laringe, uh, Alexandria, uh, Alexandria University, previously worked as ENT specialist at Bahrain Medical Sleep Lab, El Gharib uh, Medical Center, ENT Unit Coordinator, Alexandria uh, New uh, Medical uh, Center. Uh, Dr. Ahmed, he will give his talk about the anosmia in COVID-19 uh, pandemic. And uh, I think it is a recorded uh, lecture. So Dr. Iman, Ahmed, if you can keep it ready. Hello. Yes, doctor, we are sharing now. Doctor okay, Ahmad. thank you. The specialist hospital, honored to participate in such a distinguished event for the third year. My presentation to you today will be upon uh, anosmia and COVID pandemic. I will start by giving a brief and rapid introduction about the physiology uh, of uh, olfaction. Starting to talk about olfactory nerve, which is the first cranial nerve that contains sensory fibers relating to the sense of smell, transmit nerve uh, impulses above the odor to the CNS in the process called olfaction. Drive it from embryonic nasal placido, the olfactory nerve is capable of some, of some re uh, regeneration if damaged. The olfactory nerve is sensory in nature and originate in the olfactory mucosa in the upper part of the nasal cavity. Uh, these nerve fibers lacking myelin sheaths passing through the uh, small passages in the cribriform cr uh, cr 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 blade uh, of ethmoid uh, to reach the olfactory bulb of the brain uh, and uh, in turn project the olfactory information to the olfactory cortex. Uh, from the olfactory mucosa, the nerve actually many small nerve fasciculars travel through the cribriform blade to reach the brain surface of uh, here. These fascicles enter the olfactory bulb and synapse there form uh, from the bulb, one on each side. Uh, the olfactory information transmitted to the brain via the olfactory tract. The structure of olfactory system is peripheral and central and how the olfactory information is transduced in between these two parts. The peripheral olfactory system uh, consists of uh, nostril, small bone, nasal cavity, and the olfactory epithelium layer of uh, thin tissue covered by in mucus that line the nasal cavity. The primary component of the epithelial layer uh, are the mucous membrane, olfactory gland, olfactory neurons, nerve fibers of the olfactory nerve. Other molecules can enter the peripheral uh, pathway uh, to reach the nasal cavity either through the nostril uh, or during inhalation of air in the process called olfaction or through the throat uh, when the tongue push the airway back to the nostril and na nasopharynx to reach the nasal cavity in the process called red through nasal olfaction. Inside the nasal cavity, mucus lining the wall of the cavity dissolve the odor molecules. Transduction, the olfactory sensory neuron and the epithelium detect the odor molecule dissolved in the mucus and transmit the information about the odor to the brain in the process called sensory transduction. The olfactory neural neurons have cilia, these uh, small tiny hairs containing olfactory receptors that bind to the odor molecule causing electrical response is spread uh, through the sensory neurons to the olfactory nerve fibers back to the nasal cavity. 
central olfactory system, the main olfactory bulb transmit pulses both mitral to both mitral and tuft cells. These uh, cells uh, help to determine the odor concentration based on the time certain neuron cluster file. This is called the timing code. These cells uh, also know the difference between highly similar odors and use the data to aid in the later recognition of odors. These cells they are different uh, with uh, mitral having low firing rate, being easily inhibited by the neighboring cells, and tuft uh, have high firing rate and more difficult to be inhibited. The ANCAS houses, houses the olfactory cortex, which include Biriform cortex, or posterior orbitofrontal cortex, amygdala, olfactory tubercle, and parahypocampal gyrus. The olfactory tubercle connected to numerous area of, uh, of the amygdala, uh, thalamus, hypothalamus, hypocampus, brainstem, retina, auditory cortex, and the olfactory system. And over a simplification for its role, it uh, says that it checks to ensure the odor signal arises from actual odor uh, rather than rely irritation. Regulate the motor behavior brought by the odors, integrate the auditory and olfactory sensory information to complete the aforementioned task, play a role in, in transmitting positive signals to reward the sensors. By this, it is involved in addiction. The main olfactory bulb pulses in amygdala, amygdala used to, to bear order to the name and recognize order to order difference. What are the general causes for olfactory dysfunction? It decreased by age, viral infection, exposure to toxic chemicals, head trauma, and neurodegenerative disease. Now, what is the effect of COVID uh, pandemic on the sense of smell? Total or partial loss of olfactory function called anosmia or hyposmia has been formally recognized as a symptom for uh, of COVID infection and maybe the most common sign of infection due to the virus. For sure here we are talking about the uh, early pandemic. The variants occurs in early pandemic, not the later uh, recent uh, variants of the virus. Anosmia may appear without uh, any other symptoms or sign in patients with COVID-19 infection. The extent of potential olfactory dysfunction due to COVID infection is still unclear. Anosmia related to COVID-19 typical has typical duration of 8.96 days. Also, COVID-associated olfactory dysfunction classified to anosmia, which is the total incapacity for odor perception, hyposmia, which is increased odor detection threshold, which is the most common type of olfactory dysfunction, hyperosmia, which is decreased odor detection threshold, this osmia, which is qualitative alteration in the sense of smell, which is fiber subclassified into barosmia, which is altered perception of odor when there is a stimulus present, or phantosmia, which is perception of odor without real stimulation. The pathogenesis of anosmia and associated to COVID-19 characterized by total loss of olfaction due to uh, affection of the olfactory bulb. The extent of potential uh, of uh, olfactory dysfunction due to COVID-19 is still unclear. Until now, more than 200 types of viruses identified to cause anosmia, coronavirus strains, seven of them responsible for 10 to 15 percent of cases, pathogenicity, virology, predilection of infection size, infection site uh, are different from uh, every different for every virus. The main pathogenic site for COVID infection is the throat and nose. Uh, it is thought that genotype A and C of uh, COVID have uh, greater pathogenicity in the nasal cavity in humans, and this explains the higher instance of anosmia in European countries with these variants prevails. Viral load in COVID-19 are higher in nasal cavity than any other site of infection like throat and lungs on both symptomatic and asymptomatic patients due to special anatomy of the factory system. The COVID-19 virus may invade the CMS uh, through the cribriform reform plate. It is thought that goblet cells and ciliated cells in the nasal mucosa may be the initial site of COVID uh, infection when it's transmitted through airway. 
Studies just suggest that virus may propagate from the nasal cavity to the olfactory bulb through neuron to neuron axonal transmission or passive diffusion uh, of the released viral particles or hematogenously. Several theories have been given to explain variations of incidence of the olfactory dysfunction among different uh, countries. Uh, the reason uh, where pathogenicity mutation capab uh, capability of the COVID-19. Here to explain the variety uh, of anosmia related to COVID, uh, how it's vary among different countries. For example, in March 26, it was in Italy, it was 33.9%. In April 16, in uh, 2020, in France, it was 47%. In May uh, 1, 1st of May 2020 in Italy, it was 75.8%. The virology of infection and uh, of COVID infection. Uh, the COVID-19 virus uh, was established to be RNA virus. This virus has glycoprotein S proteins with uh, S1 and S2 uh, proteins with, uh, which have uh, N and C terminals respectively. N terminal bind to the host receptor through uh, the uh, receptor binding domain C terminal uh, contain heptated uh, domain HR1 and uh, HR2 uh, that cause the formation of six helix bundle fusion core structure during reception. The receptor is a spike interaction that uh, allow the viral uh, RNA to enter into the cell, like in this video. What are the proposed mechanisms for viral anosmia pathology? Angiotensin converting enzyme 2 has been detected in, uh, uh, as a functional receptor for COVID 19 virus, and priming protease transmembrane uh, serine protease 2 facilitate viral uptake. Uh, these receptors have been seen in several organs like lung, heart, oral mucosa, kidneys, skeletal muscle, respiratory cells, and the CNS. This indicates that COVID uh, virus can uh, cause multi-system disorder. Uh, the epithelium of the respiratory system is the primary site for coronavirus attachment and the viral impact on the sense of smell and taste was uh, not being surprising. Several probable mechanisms for anosmia caused by COVID-19 uh, was uh, seen uh, during the early study and hospital of, of observation, observations. For example, uh, olfactory cleft syndrome, early apoptosis of olfactory cell, damage of microglial cells, epithelial olfactory injury, local inflammation of nasal epithelium, change in the olfactory cilia and odor transmission, effect of, on the olfactory pulp, and damage of the olfactory neurons and stem cells. Here to see the interaction with viral uh, particle uh, and the uh, angiotensin converting enzyme receptors and the nasal epithelial uh, cells and test receptor cell and neuronal cells. This interaction activate macrophages to release cytokine and storm with all the inflammatory mediators, especially interleukin 6 that uh, make uh, the effect on uh, olfactory receptors and the test receptor and neuronal cell damage. Here, comparison between uh, the proposed mechanism, uh, for example, the, the determining the expression, uh, for example, it's a study on determining the expression of uh, angiotensin converting enzyme 2 and transmembrane serine protease 2 in olfactory sensory tissue uh, done through biopsy of the nasal endoscopic surgery. The outcome suggested that sustenucular cells had high amount of angiotensin converting enzyme 2 and transmembrane serine protease 2 with possible outcome that olfactory uh, epithelium inflammation can depend on personal immune system and uh, causing anosmia. Uh, example of other uh, study uh, that one that uh, discussing the percentage of expression of angiotensin converting enzyme 2 and transmembrane uh, serine protease 2 done through nasal uh, biopsy sample with uh, quantity, uh, quantification of gene expression. 
the outcome was uh, a angiotensin converting enzyme two detected uh, only in the supportive cell. Uh, the possible effect on the olfactory system was uh, the olfactory epithelium inflammation can depend on base uh, personal immunity system and causing anosmia. Also, injury of the olfactory bulb uh, was done by uh, brain MRI. There was uh, micro bleeding uh, or abnormal enhancement on MRI imaging that uh, suggests that damage of the olfactory bulb can cause long duration anosmia. Uh, also, uh, uh, olfactory cleft measurement, uh, olfactory uh, cleft measurement uh, was done by CT uh, imaging. Uh, that the outcome was total olfactory cleft with. Uh, was significant wider in uh, anosmic patient uh, that cause uh, short duration anosmia. Now we go for a special consideration. Uh, the correlation between the olfactory loss and mild or se uh, severe form of corona. Uh, epidemiological study uh, related to COVID uh, anosmia demonstrate olfactory involvement is uh, in patients with moderate to severe uh, infection. Uh, recent study proposed that patients suffering from mild form of COVID-19 have stronger local immunity where the virus replicates in the nasal and olfactory mucosa. The infection causes inflammatory reaction in the olfactory epithelium and bulb region Therefore, a T pattern of the disease take place. Also, immune, uh, immune histological analysis found that angiotensin converting enzyme to expression in airway uh, higher in uh, upper airway rather than lower airway. Um, differentiating COVID uh, other causes uh, of anosmia rather than COVID infection. Uh, anosmia associated with COVID must be different, differentiated from other causes that causes uh, smell loss or anosmia. Uh, like acute smell loss, common in upper airway, by other viral infection and head injuries, chronic smell loss, normal aging or uh, rhinitis or uh, sinonasal polyps or neurodegenerative disease, intermittent, intermittent smell loss, in allergic rhinitis or use of topical drugs, congenital uh, smell loss like uh, Clamant syndrome. What are the risk factors? Are we talking about advanced age, female gender, genetic susceptibility? Uh, the COVID infection is influenced uh, by some degree by host genotype, making 47-fold uh, heritability for uh, anosmia. Uh, why the olfactory loss uh, is different in different age groups or age categories. Study have demonstrated that COVID, uh, COVID infection uh, vary among uh, different uh, age group. Most common uh, group was between 40 and 50 years old. There is a correlation between age category and the volume of expression of angiotensin converting in some receptors as well as, well as uh, other entry proteins or sustenucular cells. Because of su sustenucular cells express a high volume of angiotensin converting enzyme 2 receptors in the olfactory epithelium, degenerative injury secondary to aging uh, for these cells could explain less major incidence of anosmia in old patients. Uh, although this hypothesis need further research or, uh, uh, because it provides potential mechan uh, mechanism for the age-related difference prevalence. Is it difference between infect, uh, affection, uh, anosmia related to COVID between men and women? Uh, epidemiological data report that female more likely to suffer from COVID-19 anosmia or uh, factory dysfunction and less likely to suffer from a severe form of COVID. It can be related to different in innate immunity, steroid hormones, uh, factors related to sex hormones, 
or sex chromosomes. Also, there is evidence of estrogen reduced expression of angiotensin converting enzyme to in female. Uh, now we are talking about the history, complication, and uh, prognosis. Early clinical feature uh, before developing uh, anosmia related to COVID include cough, fever, and arthralgia. Approximate, approximately 82% uh, of patients with anosmia related to COVID recovered within two weeks and 89% within four weeks. Intensity and the duration of infective dysfunction associated to COVID uh, variable, highly, highly variable depending on capacity and rate of regeneration of the neuroepithelium. Diagnosis depend on first uh, diagnostic study is olfactory function test, either the model of Pennsylvania or Barcelona, uh, with either 40 or 24 uh, used kits for large uh, population of uh, patient or screening patient, we can use only 12 items. Also, what is the other uh, signs and symptoms? Uh, occurring with the anosmia. Approximately two-thirds of confirmed COVID-infected uh, patients uh, suffer from anosmia and dysposia at some point of the disease. Anosmia may occur suddenly, uh, only without any other symptoms, uh, only in 16% of individuals. Uh, in one study, there was 74.4 uh, reported uh, complete loss of smell. Anosmia occurred more commonly after onset of other symptoms. Uh, a study uh, reported anosmia typically developed after 4.4 days uh, of starting COVID infection. The most common symptoms uh, accompanying anosmia are fever, headache, nausea, neck stiffness. Less common symptoms are myalgia, confusion, and seizures. Also, we have to do physical examination to exclude any other cause. Uh, also to rule out any other comorbidity, uh, inspect nasal cavity, paranasal sinus, neurological examination, uh, fundoscopy for uh, increased intracranial pressure and head trauma. Uh, also we have to do lab test, CT and MRI imaging scans. Now we move to the therapeutic option. Olfactory exercise cons uh, consisting the, of repeated and uh, deliberated sniffing of odors, including lemon, rose, clove, uh, eucalyptus, uh, have been shown to be symptom symptomatically improve the, the dysfunction. COVID-19 uh, related anosmia persists for over than two weeks a significant need to consideration for medical treatment. Olfactory training suggests a small to moderate benefit for patient uh, for post viral uh, dysfunction. Repeated smelling two minutes for three or four times per day uh, and may need to uh, be regular on this training up to six months. Medical therapy uh, like oral corticosteroid uh, useful in patients with anosmia related to COVID-19 after careful uh, evaluation of benefit and risk if the duration uh, of anosmia exceeds two weeks. However, WHO recent guidelines advise to avoid it where to use oral corticosteroid when possible. The dose 40 to 60 mg per day for 10 to 14 days, or at prednisolone, have shown to improve the mean olfactory funk recognition threshold uh, in post viral anosmia. The main problem uh, for study the anosmia related uh, treatment, anosmia related COVID treatment, is that the majority of patients do not give importance to these symptoms and recover spontaneously uh, without medical attention. So little evidence to support pharma pharmacotherapy exists. <clears throat> Here to comparison, comparison of different uh, therapeutic uh, option and the uh, possible outcome. Uh, nasal uh, betamethasone drops, there was no significant improvement. For example, corticosteroid nasal spray, 
there was no uh, statistically significant uh, difference between uh, group use and the, uh, not using this uh, nasal spray. Uh, intranasal platelet rich plasma, uh, PRP, all patients reported subjective improvement uh, of their uh, smell shortly after inject uh, injection uh, and then stabilized. Oral corticosteroid, there was a anosmia was a reserve. Uh, uh, reverse it after six days. Oral and intranasal corticosteroid have been proposed for the treatment of post-infection anosmia. Infected case, uh, in infected case, corticosteroid treatment recognized the initial step uh, for of the disease to prevent inflammation in the olfactory system. The future treatment option or advanced treatment option, we are talking about nanotechnology that provides safe and controlled the drug delivery system for treatment of COVID-19 related anosmia. The fabrication of smart drug carriers can provide drug release uh, compatible with the stage of the disease that minimizes the side effect. Also, intranasal insulin therapy has been considered for the treatment of uh, anosmia uh, or hyposmia, and several studies investigate that intranasal effect of insulin showing positive results. Also, tissue engineering is a promising approach for regeneration of damaged uh, tissue. And the current research proves that stem cell therapy also uh, as uh, a potential treatment for approach uh, for uh, COVID-19 related anosmia. Uh, take home message or a conclusion Based on the current literature and the hospital observation, uh, concluding outcome is that the significant high percentage of COVID-19 patients have symptoms of anosmia, which uh, the cellular and molecular mechanism remain unclear. Angiotensin converting enzyme to receptor expression level significantly uh, high in olfactory epithelium. Inflammation in this area can be one of the main reasons for causing anosmia. Although the olfactory neurons uh, don't have angiotensin uh, converting enzyme receptors, inflammation may propagate to these cells uh, or stem cells through supporting cells and cause damage of the olfactory bulb and certain brain systems, and uh, resulting in anosmia. The majority of COVID-19 anosmia cases recover rapidly, olfactory epithelium injury and inflammation, or changes in the olfactory cilia and odor transmission are likely to the most crucial causes for this anosmia. Uh, currently, therapy considered uh, only if anosmia persists uh, more than two weeks. Treatment options include olfactory exercise, intranasal and oral corticosteroids, there are several promising novel therapeutic options under development, including tissue engineering and stem cell therapy. At the end of my presentation, I would like to thank you all, and uh, we should all uh, remember and uh, be uh, most thankful and gratitude for all with the, uh, those who, with uh, the aid of their sacrifices, uh, help to make the world a much more uh, safer place now. Uh, thank you all and wish you to see you next year coming to Emedo. Thanks. Thank you, Dr. Ahmed, for a nice presentation. It's really interesting. I will start to uh, give you a question before uh, we get the question and the, and the uh, system. So it's really uh, good to have a uh, really review for this uh, articles. My question, if patient has anosmia, can have reverted to normal and then uh, uh, after the COVID infection, is there any review article for the reversal of this uh, anosmia? And the second question is, 
uh, how we can uh, prevent patients from getting the anosmia? Uh, Dr. Asad, I'm not sure uh, if Dr. Ahmed can have a connection. Ah, I right see. He's not with us. No, okay. No, no. So there is uh, a question already, also. Sorry, Dr. Asad, you already answered the questions in the Q&A box, but I don't yeah. think you can manage to answer okay. live. Okay. Yes. Thank you for all of you. Now we will shift to uh, next speaker. Uh, it's my pleasure to introduce Dr. Tabish Hussain. Dr. Tabish is a consultant, anesthesia and ICU, head of Department of Anesthesia and ICU at uh, Cantonment General Hospital, uh, Pakistan. He has graduated from Rawalpindi Medical College, Pakistan, 2007, with the 74 gold medals in clinical subjects. Uh, availed Pakistan government prestigious cultural exchange scholarship for higher studies to complete MD in critical. Hello, uh, well, uh, welcome to everybody on the occasion of the fifth Indo uh, conference uh, 2022. And uh, uh, evident from the front scenario of my presentation that I'm going to talk. Uh, with you over one of the very important topic uh, in the perioperative uh, period in the hospital, that's the perioperative management of pain among patients undergoing uh, surgery inside the hospital. So in this presentation, I would primarily cover uh, the first half will include the physiological response to pain and the second half would be uh, focusing on the pre-operative, intraoperative, and the post-operative management of pain in the healthcare facility. And uh, my uh, scope of presentation is primarily focusing on the paramedics that have been involved in taking care of the patient in the perioperative period. Well, to begin with, how you can define the pain? Pain is actually an unpleasant sensory and emotional experience that has been associated with or resembling with actual or potential tissue damage. So this is the universal definition of pain that has been accepted universally by all the physicians have, that have been working in uh, different uh, uh, fields of medical sciences. So the first half would uh, cover the physiological response to pain uh, in the body and uh, the first uh, uh, response that comes uh, in response to the pain is the decreased uh, reserves of the body, uh, primarily in terms of the cardiovascular and the respiratory system. And it may exacerbate the comorbid conditions like increased chance of or increased risk of myocardial infarctions in patients who are already prone to coronary artery disease. Also, it leads to a complete complicated pulmonary uh, uh, conditions uh, because of the decreased FRC, because of the decreased lung capacities. So that's why it is considered to be one of the important modality uh, to be focused in the perioperative period. It impairs the rehabilitation and the functional outcome of the patient. Uh, the de development of chronic pain syndromes, primarily the chronic regional pain syndrome that is called as causalgia, leading to chronic neuropathies is one of the very uh, important modality, uh, rather the complication of the uh, uh, ongoing pain uh, that is very, very difficult to treat. Uh, the pain causes increased hospital stay, which in turn causes the increased cost of the patient care, ultimately leading to decreased patient satisfaction. As far as the neuroendocrine system is concerned, it causes increased levels of the circulating catecholamines uh, the adrenaline and noradrenaline that in, eventually leads to tachycardia and hypertension, uh, which is not desirable in the perioperative period. And uh, this tachycardia and hypertension causes increased cardiac workload and uh, the imbalance occurs between the myocardial oxygen demand supply, ultimately leading to increased consumption of oxygen by the myocardial cells, which eventually leads to different ischemic heart conditions like angina pectoris or uh, myocardial infarction ultimately leading to catastrophe, maybe heart failure or the cardiac arrest. So
دكتور ايمان دكتور اسعد ارونو واي ذا كونكشن هير at the office yeah ahmed is working on it okay so we can use this few minutes to uh yeah doctor you can go ahead please no no because yeah. it's a recorded uh, lecture we we'll yeah. restart now yeah so we will wait to correct the connection Uh, Dr. Asad, do you want to mention that uh, in the uh, next uh, one hour, we're going to have a sponsored lectures for Dr. and Dr. Nasreen Sayed? I think if they are in the, anyone over here, if they are inside, we can. Uh, Ms. Rehab is here, but she will, uh, Tell at their time. Yeah, if they want to start earlier. No, 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 we can manage this, that, Doctor. We will finish, Dr. Tabish. But okay. I want, I, I, I meant if you would like to say that. These two responses. Increased blood glucose level not desirable, especially among patients who are already diabetic with a poor cardiac, uh, poor glycemic index. Uh, there is a retention of sodium and water, again, not desirable among patients in the elderly age group uh, having cardiovascular uh, uh, abnormalities like uh, ischemic heart disease or uh, the heart failure. As far as the musculoskeletal system is concerned, the pain causes muscle spasm, uh, ultimately leading to immobility uh, that causes the both effects causes increased chances of deep venous thrombosis. That is one of the life threatening condition that can cause a big catastrophe even in the recovery. Uh, psychologically, there's, there are chances of fear, the development of fear among patients, increased levels of anxiety and insomnia that again causes the sympathetic stimulation that causes a vicious circle again. Uh, release of more catecholamines, increased levels of uh, uh, heart rate and tachycardia and uh, blood pressure. So it's a vicious cycle. If you control it, you uh, you will get uh, out of all these complications and the patient will recover very quickly. Uh, and again, uh, finally, not uh, uh, this is the uh, not the final uh, outcome, but if the patient persists with the pain, that it can lead to chronic pain syndrome. Uh, which uh, one uh, one of the very notorious pain syndrome I uh, earlier mentioned is that uh, that complex regional pain syndrome uh, CRPS and uh, known as Cosengia that is one of the very uh, difficult modality of pain to be treated that causes an extra burden on the health system and as well as the extra burden on the finances of the patient. Uh, what are the main differences in between the acute pain and the chronic pain? Acute pain is actually immediate pain that comes in the immediate post-operative period or after trauma or surgical trauma or uh, uh, which I have discussed earlier in the definition of pain and uh, it serves as a warning sign. So it's a blessing that if there is a patient is complaining of acute pain, so there is something going on and we, it's a, it is serving as a warning sign and we must have to emphasize and treat it, treat the actually cause. It is easier to treat because generally it is easier to treat because there is always a cause. So you treat the cause and the pain goes, goes out, pain uh, vanishes out. And uh, uh, usually it has an end because it has a cause. The cause, once you recognize it, you treat it properly, then the pain vanishes. As compared to the acute pain, the chronic pain is definitely a complicated uh, 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 mechanism. It lasts long, uh, more than three to six months. And usually there is no purpose or you cannot find uh, the, the grass root, what is actually going on inside the body. And uh, it is very difficult to identify the cause of this chronic pain. And once there is a difficulty in identification of the cause, then uh, definitely the treatment is very difficult. Now, as far as the management of the pain is concerned, uh, pain is not that modality that once the patient is complaining of pain post-operatively, then you have to control the pain. 
any patient who is coming to the hospital for an elective procedure for an elective surgery we must have to create a proper plan of management for the pain and it starts right from the pre operative phase or pre operative period of the surgery so once the patient comes up to the hospital to the physician for uh, anesthesia assessment and for just for the planned surgery or the elective surgery then the surgeon and the physician and the anesthetist both uh, can sit together and make a proper pain plan if there the patient has some uh, challenges or in specific age group so the pain management management starts right from the pre operative phase of uh, surgery then uh, there are certain modalities we can do it in the intra operative phase and definitely the post operative phase is very important and all these phases are based primarily on one of the guideline basic guideline that has been given by the who uh, world health organization and that is uh, commonly known as the step ladder pain pattern or uh, the pain ladder guideline so one by one we will discuss this in detail as far as the pre operative phase of pain management is concerned uh, we have to do a directed pain history uh, just like other histories we have to take the history in detail that uh, what kind of pain patient already have or what kind of patient uh, pain patient may expect after surgery depends on the uh, uh, on the type of surgery on the nature, nature of surgery uh, and also we have to identify uh the location of pain the description of pain uh, how much time period it may or it is already there the duration of pain uh, and uh, the uh, exacerbating and the relieving factors the factors that increases or relieves the pain of the patient in addition to that history we have to do a directed pain examination in which we can elaborate the uh, the causes or the the factors that increases or decreases the pain or uh, we have to coordinate or correlate it uh, with the whole systemic system of the body in addition to that the discussion of the post operative pain control plan is discussed in detail with the patient at the same phase we have to take informed consent for the surgery for anesthesia and for the pain management at the time of presentation of the patient in the hospital in the pre operative phase period we can discuss the uh, different modalities of pain management with the patient with the uh, guardians of the patient if the patient is a minor or uh, with the patient's attendants or relatives if the patient is in the uh, geriatric age group but definitely we have to uh, uh, consider all the uh, factors that have been beneficial for the patient ultimately that may include the oral or the parenteral Uh, uh strategies or medications for the pain management that may include the nerve blocks or the regional blocks like epidural analgesia or that may include uh, the step ladder pattern according to the who guideline that like use of uh, uh, potent opioids in the post operative period pcas uh, uh, the patient control analgesia system or the continuous Uh, uh infusions of pains different modalities are available in the in the medical sciences different hospitals are uh, observing uh, different protocols for the management of pain so whatever it is available in your hospital we the, it is the prime responsibility of the surgeon the anesthetist and the primary physician to discuss in detail with all the available modalities of pain and then get an informed consent so that the patient can pass through this perioperative period of surgery very smoothly in a pain free fashion again uh, the pre operative phase of pain management includes the education of the patient and the family uh, and discuss the uh, plan of management in detail i have already elaborated in detail uh, then use of alternative methods of pain control uh, like uh, hydrotherapy or massage therapy or acupuncture therapy different uh, non medicational uh, modalities of pain uh, management are also available so we can discuss in detail with the patient and also educate uh, uh, the patient on the use of pca it is again a uh, different and detailed topic which can be uh, discussed uh, uh, with the patient in detail uh, explains the block and its importance the side effects and uh, um, uh, then the patient can get the uh, give us the informed consent 
as far as the intraoperative phase of pain management is concerned the therapy selected should reflect the individual needs of the patient ideally speaking uh, being an aesthetic i think this is the most easiest uh, uh, phase of pain management because patient is inside the operation theater all the as standard monitoring is there we are monitoring the heart rate the blood pressure the response to the uh, uh, stimulus uh, the surgical stimulus and all sorts uh, of the physiological changes that has been going on inside the body during the surgery so we can manipulate and especially usually uh, don't face a, a difficult time in in management of uh, pain as far as the patient remains in the intraoperative phase uh, the only thing is that we have to uh, be vigilant regarding the therapy which we are giving according to the individual needs like the patient is in the pediatric age group or the geriatric age group so we should be very so careful about the use of opioid medications uh, special caution during continuous infusion modalities and we have to also consider the drug accumulation uh, especially among patients with poor cardiac uh, respiratory uh, reserves having compromised liver or kidney functions so uh, ideally speaking this is one of the easiest modality or the phase of pain management as far as the perioperative uh, pain management of the patient is concerned now as far as the post operative phase is concerned this is very very important because if you you, you your plan of uh, uh management of pain management has been discussed earlier with the patient in the pre operative phase adequately then uh, you will not feel any trouble uh, in maintaining or in managing the uh, post operative pain uh, and now uh, this is one of the part of the uh, iras iras uh, is actually the enhanced recovery after surgery it is one of the society that gives guidelines or recommendations as far as the post operative recovery of the patient after surgery is concerned so adequate management of pain is now a proper recommendation rather a guideline of the iras society that if you are going to manage the pain adequately then your patient will get discharged quickly from the hospital without complication and if you are not going to focus on this point or aspect your patient will definitely get either psychological or physical trauma in terms of uh, side effects of the pain so uh, definitely th there is an increased comfort if there is no pain increased comfort that leads to quicker healing of the wounds there is an increased activity increased strength of the body and decreased complication which definitely increases the outcome and definitely it will uh, have a positive impact on the patient and the family the uh, proper post operative management of pain in the post operative uh, period uh, decreases the risk of myocardial ischemia tachycardia and dysarrhythmias impaired wound healings uh, collapse of the lung or at atelectasis uh, the dvt or thromboembolic events and the peripheral vasoconstrictions all these uh, are the risks that have been related with uncontrolled pain which have been discussed earlier in detail uh, now we discuss the challenges that have been linked with the special age group as far as the perioperative management of pain is concerned the first group earlier i mentioned is the pediatrics or the children age group because there is a difficulty in communication there is a difficulty in expression of pain so uh, what we we can do the basic points uh, that have been recommended by the pain society is that we have to observe the children frequently and then we have to give all the medication the pain medications according to the weight specific weight uh, then we can do the guided imagery uh, the distraction uh, therapy or the distract distraction regimes are available music or video uh, uh, distraction regimes are available and definitely we have to take uh, into consideration the allergies the common allergies among the pediatric age group because our medicines may uh, uh, react with all these aspects the second challenge in group is the geriatric age group definitely these patients are on higher risk of developing the compromise in the renal and the hepatic system so uh, uh, our drugs particularly the opioids they are quite uh, sensitive uh, these patients are quite sensitive to the opioids especially the potent opioids so we must be very vigilant about that in addition to that again we should be very sensitive we should take into consideration uh, the allergies or the opioid sensitivity among this age group and uh, uh, definitely opioids are the red flag drugs among these patients you cannot give uh, these opioids uh, frequently or uh, injudiciously to this age group 
we need specific monitoring specific designated area of the hospital that is either the uh, high dependency uh, dependency unit hdu or the pain wards where the uh, pain medicine staff is uh, frequently available with proper monitoring and we should be very very vigilant regarding uh, the use of combination medications or the multimodal analgesia therapy among the, this age group now pain assessment the the basic question is that if someone is feeling pain then how do you grade the scale of the pain that how you assess the pain whether how much is the intensity what sort of pain it is so how do you assess the pain uh, it all depends on that if your medication if you are giving some sort of pain medications or an lgc and the perioperative group first of all you have to see the patient before how much the pain he was or she was feeling and you have to assess the patient after giving the medications so and we have to document it in patient's own words that is very important because patient will tell you how much the intensity of pain he or she is feeling also you can assess for the norm uh, non verbal uh, cues uh, like the pain grimace or the face and also uh, uh, you should be uh, aware of the special needs of the cognitively impaired patients like patients with autism Uh, there are different uh, scales for the special people uh, we can use many scales are available but we can use the commonly used scales that have been uh, uh, frequently used by many hospitals and the pain physicians and uh, last but not the least is that document all this stuff in the proper uh, record of the patient so the common assessment tools uh, for assessing the pain in the perioperative period used in the um, hospitals are vas vas is the visual analog scale that has been graded from 0 to 10 10 0 is the minimum with no pain and 10 is the maximum pain score with the maximum or the worst pain uh, again um, another scale used is pain faces in which we have to see the patient's face and then we have to uh, give the marks according to the uh, facial expressions another score uh, with patients having uh, dementia used is pain add that is pain assessment in advanced dementia it has also some certain parameters uh, and can be used among patients uh, in the old age group with dementia another pain score that is flac uh, in which we have to monitor the facial response the leg the activity cry or consolability and then we have to give the scores but uh, the most commonly uh, used uh, pain score is the vas score that is uh, frequently used by the pain physician in the post operative and the perioperative period this is the who uh, step ladder approach to the management of the pain and from here you can see that the first uh, step in management of pain is that giving the non opioids uh, uh, non opioid drugs to the patient that primarily involve the paracetamol the most frequently used all around the globe and uh, Uh, the nsaid the non steroidal anti inflammatory drugs so if the patient uh, uh, responds to these uh, two group of medications it's pretty good and uh, you can uh, rate that uh, most of the patients with mild pain respond primarily to these two medications but if the patient has moderate pain or it is not being controlled or managed by managed by these uh, nsaids and paracetamol then we have to add uh, less potent opioids along with non uh, adjuvant therapies uh, so uh, uh, the patient may uh, get benefit of this uh, fentanyl uh, many medic oh, non uh, opioid medications are available in the market like fentanyl lotrimol um, so that can be combined with these nsaids and paracetamol to get a proper pain response and uh, the third step is that this for severe patients uh, the pa patients with severe pain Uh, who are who do not respond to the uh, second step of therapy so the third step of therapy is that uh, we can give very potent opioids like uh, morphine available in the market uh, uh, that uh, uh, works uh, quite well among the patients especially the patients having cancer pain or like uh, pain due to extensive surgery so this is the actually the step ladder approach that has been given by who so again uh, Uh, for the mild pain the, if if the vap uh, pain score is ranging from 1 to 3 out of 10 then you can give the non opioid uh, nsaids uh, along with acetaminophen and uh, adjuvant analgesic agents can be added like ice therapy or uh, therapy through the heat uh, if the patient is experiencing mild to moderate pain with a pain score of 4 to 7 out of 10 then uh, this step builds upon step 
uh, treat with the opioid combination as early mentioned hydrocodone uh, less potent opioids along with uh, acetaminophen or paracetamol always watch the ceiling effects and uh, in the pediatric age group definitely you have to give every medication through uh, according to the weight of the patient and uh, we should be very vigilant among the uh, elderly age group as far as uh, the third step is concerned it includes the patients having a severe pain with a pain score ranging from 8 to 10 out of 10 and you we have to use very potent opioids uh, like morphine and you have to add uh, adjuvant therapy like anxiolytic therapy anti anxiety drugs uh, anti emetic drugs maybe muscle relaxants uh, and it starts with actually the short acting opioids to determine the pain relief and uh, you can switch to the long acting use a equo analgesic dosing chart for the conversion the common uh, first line opioid that have been available in the market are codeine uh, morphine nalbufen uh, very frequently used inside the operation theater uh, fentanyl and ramifentanyl again very frequently used these days uh, one of the very uh, good analgesic agent few words about morphine uh, it is very potent analgesic agent very commonly used inside the hospital uh, very uh, one of the very controlled drug uh, onset uh, starts uh, from 15 to 20, 60 minutes and it reaches its peak peak effect uh, within half to 1 hour and the half life is uh, 1.5 to 2 hours almost and uh, the medication dose is 0.05 to 0.1 mg per kg body weight and uh, you can give 5 uh, minutes prior to the procedure and uh, the maximum safe dose is 15 mg uh, per dose what it causes it causes sedation the respiratory distress or depression and pruritus so we must use a proper monitoring with a backup of all the oxygen and emergency equipment uh, once uh, this morphine ad uh, is administered uh, primarily uh, intravenously and uh, how to reverse it if you are suspecting an overdose then you can give naloxone 5 to 10 microgram per kg and a single dose should not exceed the maximum recommended adult dose of 0.2 mg few words about uh, fentanyl fentanyl is uh, more potent uh, rather 80 to 100 times more potent than morphine and it is i think one of the wonderful uh, drug uh, because its onset starts quite early 1 to 5 minutes and the half life is 1.5 to 6 hours the dose is 0.5 to 3 microgram per kg and it can be repeated after 30 to 60 minutes and the maximum safe dose for this fentanyl is 50 microgram per dose and uh, you can use the lower doses when used in combination with other agents like uh, anxiolytic like midazolam because it causes the synergistic effect as far as the respiratory depression is concerned again uh, the effects primarily causing the uh, respiratory distress or depression it may lead to apnea seizures shock chest wall rigidity uh, primarily linked with the rapid infusion or high doses and uh, if you are suspecting uh, overdose or fentanyl sensitivity then you can reverse it by naloxone the safe dose is 5 to 10 microgram per kg and single dose should not exceed maximum recommended the uh, recommended adult dose of 0.2 mg so uh, in the end uh, ladies and gentlemen what important points uh, to remember and to take home is that the dosing intervals are determined by the duration of action as well as the half life of the drugs or the pain medications which you are using inside the hospital so uh, we must know the uh, physiology uh, of the patient or the altered physiology of the patient any patient who is undergoing surgery along with the pharmacokinetics and the pharmacodynamics of the drug which we are using inside the hospital also we should know the route of elimination because most of the drugs that have been eliminated inside the body use either the renal or hepatic route so the, the, this is very important among elderly patients or the geriatric age group patients in which the renal or hepatic functions may be compromised and that drug accumulation may cause severe respiratory depression leading to uh, rather more hazards to the patient uh, in 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 contrast to giving positive impact or controlling the pain of the patient Uh, the adjust the dose and the frequency for special population as earlier and mentioned for pediatric and the geriatric age group and be aware of the prior surgeries involving bowel uh, stomach liver and kidneys 
that these organs may be compromised and the analgesic drugs particularly the potent opioids can cause very deleterious effects among these patients so vigilance is the prime safety for the patients thank you very much ladies and gentlemen i hope that uh, this presentation has cleared many aspects uh, of pain management in the perioperative group and uh, i hope that uh, this presentation and the points that have been discussed will uh, really help uh, especially the paramedics involved in the perioperative pain management inside the wards and the recovery uh, of patients who are undergoing uh, minor to major surgery inside the operation theater if anything is not uh, clear then my email is uh, written here and then you can uh, email all the relevant questions and i will try my best to answer uh, thank you very much and uh, very good wishes for the other participants or and the Uh, presenters of the endo conference thank you very much have a nice day bye bye thank you for dr ahmed and dr rabish uh, for their lectures and as they stated uh, questions uh, next speaker will be dr uh, fariyal sabr it's my pleasure to introduce dr fariyal she is a consultant physician and endocrinologist uh, md and frcp head of endocrine unit dr asad Medical. sorry Can yeah. you ask uh, Ms. Rehab? You yes. can introduce uh, Ms. Okay. Rehab, please. Okay. Ms. Rehab uh, is there. And then I will just finish this. Uh, uh, she's uh, uh, head of endocrine unit at Royal Medical Services, BDF, RCSI, trained in Ireland and published more than 10 papers in diabetes and endocrinology, has a special interest in polycystic ovarian obesity management. Uh, Mr. Rehab, uh, the floor is for you, and welcome, Dr. Ferian. Thank you, all of you. Um, thank you so much. Um, good evening, everyone. Uh, this is uh, Rehab Qutb, and uh, on behalf of AstraZeneca, I would like to welcome and thank you all for joining us today for this very interesting topic where, where, where we will rethink the approach to managing type 2 diabetes. Since type 2 diabetes is closely related to cardiovascular and renal disease, it's very important to consider a treatment option where you can help your patient today and give him a better tomorrow. I'm so excited and so honored to introduce our speaker for today, Dr. Feriel Al-Sabr. Dr. Feriel has a long-term experience managing type 2 diabetes, which makes her an expert who will add a great value to this topic. Uh, as Dr. Asad mentioned, she is a consultant endocrinologist. Uh, she's the head of the endocrine unit in the Royal Medical Services Bahrain Defense Force Hospital and RCSI. Um, doctor, uh, she has over 10 published papers and a special interest in PCOS management and obesity management. Please, if you have any questions, you can type them in the Q&A box. And now let's welcome Dr. Friel. Dr. Friel, the floor is yours. Thank you. I don't uh, think you still can see me. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, Dr. Asaj and Rehab for this uh, very nice introduction. And today I'm going to share the my slides. Today, I'm going to talk about uh, rethinking to the approach of type 2 diabetes management. As we all know that type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular and renal disease are very uh, closely interconnected. Uh, and if you remember in my uh, talkings uh, before, I always say that treat diabetic patient as a cardiac patient because this is very true. Any diabetic patient, whether they have symptoms or diagnosed as having the cardiovascular disease, they sh we should be treating them to prevent, or as a cardiac uh, patient, putting in our mind their heart and their kidneys uh, as a priority. So if there is any acute or chronic disorder or fun, either the, the cardiovascular system or the renal, then this can induce dysfunction in the other which will start, we don't know, but they are interconnected uh, to each other. 
So the type two diabetes management, uh, if we say that, it is more than HbA1c control. The patients were first presentation of type two diabetes related cardiovascular events at median follow up of 5.5 years. We can see that peripheral artery disease, heart failure. Uh, Dr. Faryal, sorry, could you please yes. share your presentation? We cannot see it. Um, sh I've shared it already. Uh, you cannot see it on the screen. You just have to oh. press the button, please. Mm -hmm. Go back. Sorry for uh, yes, doctor, excellent. Can you just put it in the slideshow, please? Yes, yeah, because I was talking. Mumtaz, doctor, thank you so much. Okay. So I'm not going to, uh, this is my second slide anyway. So we see that, that the events of uh, first cardiovascular events after diagnosing the uh, type two diabetes within five years, uh, cardiovascular death is 4.2%, heart failure, is a very high percentage, 14.1. And uh, if we see here the percentage of type 2 diabetes, uh, diabetes developing uh, over uh, 15 years, we can see uh, the kidney is affected as well. And as an albuminuria or renal impairment, or a micro or macro albuminuria or CKD. The mortality improvement in, uh, in the recent years has only been seen in major cardiovascular disease, but uh, atherosclerosis, not heart failure or arrhythmias. What do we uh, mean by that is that the changes in mortality or with a patient with diabetes over 10 years, here the maroon is with diabetes, the blue is without diabetes. So it is a major cardiovascular disease in diabetic patients, uh, but as well in non-diabetic, this is because of atherosclerosis, but in diabetic, because of the diabetes, it is a more percentage. But we didn't see the heart failure or arrhythmia, uh, arrhythmia improvement. That with, this is what I said in the first slide, the diabetes management is not only the controlling of the HB1C. There are a lot of things which are hidden. We have to control them. Uh, those are heart failure and arrhythmias. So again, despite what we are, uh, the advances in management of the type two diabetes, uh, it remains as the malignant disease. As we can see here, uh, men and women uh, diagnosed with heart failure continue to have worse survival than patients with one several common cancer. For example, in men, as we can see here, heart failure is the blue. It is as common or more, more like the prostate cancer. In women, it's the same. This is the uh, lung disease and breast cancer, but, uh, but diabetes and heart failure is more common as well. Yes. So diabetes can be to heart failure throughout the either with atherosclerosis or independent of uh, atherosclerosis. As we can see here that the patients with type two diabetes at risk of heart failure partially due to atherosclerosis events and patients also with type two diabetes at risk of heart failure due to direct inflammatory effect on the microvascular endothelium. And both of those would lead to heart failure. So heart failure can be independent uh, of atherosclerosis or directly related to the inflammatory reaction of the blood vessels. The left ventricle dysfunction is an early complication in type two diabetes. The patient, uh, there are 68% of patients with type 2 diabetes have evidence of left ventricular dis uh, dysfunction within the first five years after diagnosis. As we can see, that 
only 32% of those 68% have normal left ventricle function, 16% have diastolic left ventricle dysfunction, systolic dysfunction is more than the diastolic, and systolic and diastolic combined is found in about 25%. The heart failure they develop, either it will be a preserved ejection fraction or reduced ejection fraction. And both of them, either, uh, both of them, whether preserved or reserved, has the uh, cardiomyocyte abnormalities. But in the, um, in the reduced ejection fraction, it is shortening of the uh, cord and the cardiomyocyte. But in the preserved is the fibrosis and uh, stiffness. The type 2 diabetes is a risk factor of developing of the heart failure and increased hospitalization for heart failure. It is a very important issue, and I'm going to talk about it a lot, is the hospitalization for heart, heart failure. The development of heart failure in diabetes is very high. Heart failure hospitalization is high as well uh, in five years after diagnosing type 2 diabetes, and it has a very poor prognosis. So hospitalization because of heart failure is associated with very poor prognosis. The mortality after discharge, here we can see the mortality is with the maroon. Non-heart failure hospitalization is much less and no hospitalization for any type. This is the cause of mortality in the general population normal without diabetes. So heart failure hospitalization represents a marker for significant adverse effect uh, and prognosis. These prognostic data remain true irrespective of ejection fraction, whether it is reserved or reduced, uh, thus heart failure hospitalization prevention overall, and especially in high-risk patients, represent an important therapeutic goal. So all patients should be uh, investigated, and we try to control the uh, side effect of uh, the diabetes in the cardiovascular system, especially the heart failure. And our goal is to decrease the mortality because of the uh, heart failure and cardiovascular disease. And in all the parameters, whether it is the blood sugar control or the uh, prevention uh, as a medication or therapeutic. So what is the glycemic efficacy or uh, efficacy of DAPA? You know that DAPA is the uh, uh, SGLT2 inhibitor. It is one of the newest drug, and it is one of the most important drugs uh, or a group of uh, anti-hyperglycemic agents. Uh, the reduction in HB1C when used as initial therapy or as an add-on, whether we use DAPA alone or with metformin, as we can see here, uh, the HB1C 91.0%, it was dec decreased by minus 1.98% when it's combined or added to metformin. In this paragraph, please note that the higher the HB1C, the higher is the uh, lowering of the HB1C after starting medication uh, with DAPA. DAPA added on to metformin, or in, in greater, uh, it, it has improved the uh, or contributed to further reduction in HP1C weight and systolic pressure. All of those are a goal uh, in our view as an endocrinologist or diabetologist. We all aim at reducing the weight of the patient in order directly or indirectly it will affect their glycemic control, especially HB1C, and uh, further on the complications, especially the long-term complications. You can see here that the HB1C was reduced by minus two, the weight was reduced by minus 3.55, and the systolic blood pressure, which is uh, another risk factor in diabetic patients, was reduced by minus 4.3. So SGLT2 inhibitors and cardiovascular outcome trials. No. Sorry. As we all know that DECLARE, which was the, uh, uh, the study which uh, has the highest number of 
population included. As you can see here, it's about uh, 17,000 patients, which is a very high uh, number of uh, patients included. The, the, it was studied on type 2 diabetes more than 40 years, uh, plus multiple, more than two risk factors, or established cardiovascular disease. The patients were uh, divided into two groups, whether they were given placebo or DAPA, 10 milligram per day. As we all know that the primary endpoint was the cardiovascular death as a maze, the major uh, adverse uh, cardiovascular uh, events, or hospitalization for heart failure and cardiovascular death. The secondary endpoint was the renal composite. And you can, uh, as we all know that uh, the, uh, this study has included patients, majority were cardiovascular naive. So prior to the first interim analysis, clinically relevant secondary endpoint of hospitalization, secondary to heart failure was elevated. Uh, and DECLARE provides a comprehensive assessment of the impact of DAPA on a common and clinically uh, important diabetes-related cardiovascular disease. And I just want to remove this actually cannot because welcome. Yes. So DECLARE has the largest type two uh, primary prevention population among the SGLT2 uh, cardiovascular outcome trials to date. And the type two diabetic patients, as I told you that uh, more than 99% uh, declare, 40.6% uh, uh, only, uh, they were, I, I mean, 40% of the patients, sorry, they were not with cardiovascular disease. If we compare it to the other cardiovascular outcome trials, the MPAREG, uh, the patients, uh, the, they were included more than 99% were with cardiovascular disease, Canvas 65.6% with uh, cardiovascular disease, while DECLARE has the lowest number of patients with cardiovascular. So DECLARE demonstrated cardiovascular safety with DAPA in the broad cardiovascular risk type two diabetes patient uh, population earlier in the cardiovascular risk continuum. DECLARE included patients with type 2 diabetes and either multiple, more than two risk factors, uh, like more than 55 years old male and more than 60 years old female, plus at least one of the following dyslipidemia, either hypertension or current smoking. As we can see here that the baseline for DAPA with the placebo were similar in age, BMI, HB1C and uh, the renal function, EGFR, was similar in both, uh, in both arms. The uh, patients in the DECLARE trial had better baseline renal function than the MPA reg outcome or CANVAS, as we can see here. Those are the other cardiovascular outcome studies. DECLARE has the best EGFR and the uh, the micro or microalbuminuria status or renal function was much better than the other patient's uh, renal function. What is the cardiovascular outcome? As we can see, uh, we can see here in this uh, broad cardiovascular risk population, DAPA patient has significant, uh, significant reduction of hospitalization because of heart failure or cardiovascular deaths and fewer maze events compared to the placebo. As we can see here, the gray uh, graph is the placebo, while the uh, maroon is the uh, DAPA 10 milligram. And the heart hospitalization because of heart failure or cardiovascular death, or the major adverse cardiovascular events, it was the DAPA arm was better. The primary, uh, as we can see here also, patients with prior MI or patients without uh, MI, the, this is a prior MI and this is no prior MI. The uh, DAPA has prevented uh, the beneficial on the MACE outcome in high cardiovascular risk type 2 diabetes. 
it has a prevented and um, improvement in the outcome. The DAPA reduction of the maze here, as we can see, this arm is in favor of the DAPA. Uh, we can see that the, uh, uh, the, whether the patient has the MI less than 12 months prior to the study has a better also outcome, but for those who had it more than 24 months, uh, they are, uh, they have improved, but not as those patients who had a recent MI in the last, uh, uh, in the last 12 months. This is uh, the hospitalization, whether there's, uh, there's a, a previous uh, atherosclerosis, sclerosis, or there's no history of prior MI, uh, all they went into favor of DAPA when it is used. It has reduced and it has uh, prevented some of the uh, renal uh, function as we, I'm going to discuss later. For patients with type two diabetes and hospitalization secondary to heart failure, the, the benefits of DAPA appears much earlier than the uh, placebo. So here is the hospitalization of heart failure and cardiovascular death. We can see that it appeared very early and stayed steady all the, the way through the studies, whether it is hospitalization, cardiovascular death, or all cause mortality. All of them has stayed, but it didn't drop during uh, the study or the usage of the uh, DAPA. SGLT2 inhibitors prevent hospitalization uh, because of heart failure in a group of type 2 diabetes and reduce the maze only in high risk patients with atherosclerosis. This is this, uh, this is a study which uh, uh, this is a study which has compared with the other uh, cardiovascular outcome trials. As we can see here, the established atherosclerosis disease, the declare has a better uh, better outcome in the base as well and in the multiple, those with multiple risk factors has improved great, greatly or no MRF patients here. So there's all the favor, the treatment of uh, the uh, declare and declare with DAPA. This is, uh, this diagram shows no matter how the DAPA cardiorenal protection across the broad range of type two diabetes patients, whether the patient has a previous MI in less than two years, it will decrease the hospitalization as a complication uh, because of heart failure or the renal and the major adverse cardiac events. You know, if they have prior MI, it will uh, also reduce both and improve both. And to a little extent, the MACE. Atherosclerosis disease, but no prior MI, it has no effect on the major adverse effect, but it will, uh, uh, it will improve the heart failure and hospitalization second to heart failure and the renal uh, outcome. Primary prevention, it has the major effect on both cardio renal protection. So no matter what is the patient falls in these groups, the diabetic patients, they will have the benefit as the cardio renal protection from the SGLT2 inhibitors. The renal outcome, as you remember, the first slide I showed you that we said that uh, diabetic patients are cardiac, cardiac patients. And if one of them is affected, the other definitely will be affected too. In the presence of type two diabetes, lowering uh, the, uh, the, the, uh, the albuminuria independently predict higher cardiovascular mortality. As we can see here, the cardiovascular mortality, according to the EGFR, whether they, it is the, uh, it will keep it, the SGLT2, it will inhibit the progression or the, uh, the uh, pro progression. It will keep it steady or prevent it. This is here the EGFR, and this is the uh, albumin creatinine ratio. If it is high, so the, the, uh, in diabetic patient, it will uh, get better and it will keep on steady line. 
and this is non-diabetic patients, uh, the aging and uh, the other causes of renal uh, dysfunction. Declare has a greater uh, proportion of type 2 diabetic patients with normal EGFR, as I said before, uh, than the MPA break outcome or the CANVAS trials. Uh, so the DAPA is the maroon, the CANVA, uh, the CANA, I mean, the CANA is the blue, the green is the MPA uh, break. As you can see here, the EGFR categories, the patient with better age of R, uh, this is mild impairment, and this is a normal. It has uh, better uh, renal function to start with in comparison with all the other studies. This is, as we showed you before, we said that the age of R and the album creatine ratio in the declare uh, studies is uh, almost uh, the best of all the studies uh, from the beginning. So DAPA addresses the cardiovascular risk across the spectrum patients with and without type 2 diabetes. In type 2 diabetes, it is preventive and if without, uh, without the diabetes uh, as a, in diabetic patients as a treatment. So DECLARE has the largest, broadest SGLT2 inhibitor, cardiovascular outcome in patients with type 2 diabetes, early intervention patients with type 2 diabetes to prevent cardiorenal uh, complications. As a treatment, DAPA, it will uh, help in the heart failure, the first SGLT2 inhibitor heart failure outcome trial. So the confirming DAPA as the new standard of care for patients with hospitalization second to heart failure with or without uh, type 2 diabetes. With those who has no type 2 diabetes, as you know that the majority of the cardiologists nowadays, they are treating patients with heart failure uh, with SGLT2, even if they are not diabetic. This is the same. We say that the heart failure overview, the uh, DAPA 10 milligram and the placebo, uh, there, uh, there were type 2 diabetes 45, no type 2 and 55%. So there was a consistent benefit across broad and retro and a representative uh, population, uh, the baseline uh, LVAF, and there's the risk of both first and rec uh, recurrent heart failure. There was a reduction in all cause mortality and heart failure, a symptom improvement. So there was significantly reduced risk of cardiovascular death or worsening heart failure in patients. And DAPA, as we all know, that it was well tolerated in patients with and without type 2 diabetes. So we're, we're not, uh, nobody should get uh, surprised when we see that a cardiac patient taking SGLT2 inhibitors just to prevent the, uh, the heart failure or to decrease the attacks of heart failure and hospitalization since it has a very poor prognosis. In DAPA heart failure, the benefit of DAPA on cardiovascular death or worsening heart failure started early in patients with heart failure uh, reduced ejection fraction with or without type 2 diabetes. So in the reduced ejection fraction uh, patients, it has uh, the improvement and the good prognosis started much earlier uh, when used the data. Uh, this is also repeated, as we know that it, it, uh, the effect of the DAPA has started very early in day 28 of usage, and it keeps on improving and uh, continuing to improve. So it's not just the first time when we use it. Uh, it will start very early, and it will continue to improve the outcome of the heart failure. This is a repeat, whether the patient has type 2 diabetes or no type 2 diabetes, the improvement will happen when we use the, uh, 
the SGLT2. As we can see here, the, the relative risk uh, response uh, when, uh, with the, the DAPA is very good. And here, with type 2 diabetes, a 25% reduction. So in summary, in DAPA, uh, heart failure summary, DAPA is the first and only SGLT2 inhibitor demonstrating a reduction in cardiovascular death and all cause death and hospitalization because of heart failure in patients with uh, reduced heart uh, ejection fraction with and without type 2 diabetes. This is a repeat of what we said. There was a 26% reduction of the relative risk uh, uh, factors in cardiovascular death or worsening heart failure. In cardiovascular death, there was an 18% reduction. Worsening heart failure, there was 13% reduction. And in all cause death, 17, 17%. And heart failure symptoms improved was significantly more common and deterioration was less common. And it happened uh, very early and very safely with the uh, using of the GLT uh, DAPA. This is the scene. So uh, as we said that DAPA is a very safe drug to use, whether the patient has type two diabetes or uh, no diabetes and uh, why it is uh, safe. This is because all the studies uh, comparing uh, DAPA 10 milligram to placebo showed a similar side effects, especially uh, the, at the beginning of the SGLT2 uh, management, uh, a lot of papers or a lot of side effects were repeatedly, and it was a little bit scary for us uh, to continue or to, uh, to see. The application was very similar in both. DKA uh, is almost similar. Fracture secondary to osteoporosis is similar in both the group. Malignancies, there was no uh, significant difference in both. The volume depletion, depletion uh, dehydration in both. And this is, uh, as we all know, that patients is always advised to replace the uh, water loss by drinking a lot of water, acute kidney injury, uh, as we all know that even if the patient has renal impairment, there was uh, all the studies showed a very safe outcome and there was no uh, worsening of the uh, kidney function during use of SGLT2. Genital infections were similar, UTIs, uh, foreign years, uh, gangrene, and major hypoglycemia. And this is the beauty of, the, of this group Actually, always, always we are happy that, and we always have to satisfy the patient and uh, relieve them by telling them that this uh, drug will never cause you hypoglycemia unless, and we have to be very careful as a consultant endocrinologists, family physicians, uh, any, anybody who can use this drug uh, should be, be aware in diabetic patients by stopping or reducing the other medications such as insulin and sulfonylureas. Otherwise, the drug itself or this group will never cause hypoglycemia per se. Uh, Dr. Ferial, if you don't mind, uh, we have passed our time by uh, extra five minutes. Any uh, more slides? Uh, no, almost, I'm, I'm almost done. Yeah, we, we started, uh, <laughs> started uh, late. And, no, no, I'm just joking. Uh, actually, we'll, uh, I'm almost done. Victoria, tfaddali. I'm not going to repeat. The, uh, the, uh, the, uh, as we all know, I'm, I'm going to have only a few minutes. Uh, as we all know that the guidelines now take the SGLT2 uh, inhibitors as a first choice in any diabetic patients uh, because of the safety and the uh, cardio, uh, cardio renal protection. As we can see that there's established a atherosclerosis disease in any patients, which drug we should use if the HB1C wasn't met. So uh, DAPA has proven cardiovascular disease benefit, has label indication of reducing hospitalization, secondary to heart failure, 
uh, this is another thing, the heart failure, uh, particularly in patients with uh, reduced ejection fraction, the DEPA is uh, the first choice in those patients. If we are not, uh, whether we want to use it as a, a primary uh, antihypoglycemic agent or add on uh, medication, this is the same. Uh, patients with uh, renal, uh, renal disease, whether it's established albuminuria or, D, or chronic kidney disease, we should go ahead and use this uh, drug as all the um, evidence-based medicine show its priority to uh, prevent and improve the patient's cardiorenal uh, function. Uh, this is the same, it just, it's just one slide showing which uh, group to go when we are failing to control the blood uh, sugar. Uh, metformin, as always, Ben, is the first line. If we don't control the HB1C or if we don't achieve our goal, we should uh, use SGLT2 inhibitors and or nowadays as GLP-1. And uh, you know that secondly, because of the weight loss in those patients aim uh, to achieve better HB1C. So SGLT2, we can use it uh, alone, or we can use GLP-1 in obese patients to reach our goal uh, much better. We have to be very careful in sulfonylurea uh, with the use of GLT-2. And if we are going to use if the, uh, thank God we are in a country which, uh, uh, made this medication or this group available free for their uh, their people in all the hospitals, whether it's government uh, or health center, it is available in all the hospitals. So we don't have the limitation of the uh, um, the budget. So patients can have it at any time. Just be careful, please, uh, in patients with the insulin on insulin or urea. So in summary, the heart and renal complication uh, as kidney disease are frequent, early, and under-recognized in patients with type 2 diabetes, resulting in significant mortality and morbidity in the general population. In DECLARE, DAPA has demonstrated a cardiorenal protection, a reduction in the composite of uh, hospitalization for heart failure or cardiovascular death, New declared data sets preserve, uh, presented at the uh, American Card um, ACC further support the consistency of the effect of DAPA in heart failure. Would declare DAPA provides the evidence for early cardiorenal event prevention beyond glucose control in type 2 diabetes? And thank you. And sorry for rushing the last uh, few, uh, a few slides. And um, I'm expecting if there's any questions, you're most welcome. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Friel. Thank you for sharing your knowledge with us. This was very informative. Um, I have one quick question here. Uh, according to the recent guidelines, um, SGLT2 inhibitors are recommended as uh, the first line of treatment, uh, especially the pagliflozin. Do you find this to be um, beneficial uh, uh, from your experience? Oh yes, this is why I'm saying that we are lucky to have this uh, available everywhere. Uh, it is a very good drug. Uh, usually, uh, actually, it's not because uh, of this lecture. Uh, I'm I'm using nowadays uh, SGLT2 inhibitors as the first line management in any patients I I have if there is no contraindications, uh, i.e. Uh, the weight loss, uh, the uh, because the patients, some of them are thin, I don't recommend that we use it because one of the beneficial side effects of this group is weight loss as well, but not as much as the uh, GLP-1, as everybody knows. Thank you so much, doctor. Thank you for your time today. Thank you for everyone who attended the session and uh, goodbye. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Asad? Uh, 
It's uh, my pleasure to introduce uh, Dr. Nasrina Sayed, uh, as a consultant hydrologist and lipidologist. The Dr. Nasrin, she's well known for all of you. She's the uh, president of the uh, American uh, Golf uh, chapter. She's the uh, consultant in the uh, Golf Diabetes Specialist Center and uh, AGU assistant professor previously. Uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Nasreen, she is well known in her research in uh, lipidology and again in diabetes uh, management and treatment. It's uh, floors for you, Dr. Nasreen. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Asad, for this kind introduction. Uh, good evening, uh, everyone. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be with you uh, this evening. Uh, and I think I have like, um, I lost like maybe 10 minutes of my, uh, of my talk, but we will try to finish on time and as, as much as possible to cover some questions if we have time. And I would like to thank my uh, colleague, Dr. Ferrial for this uh, informative talk. And we are gonna be in line with what uh, Dr. Ferrial presented, uh, a fascinating class of agents that we use to treat uh, diabetes. So here we're talking about the approach, the unique approach that we are adopting now to treat diabetic patients, and that is triple protection and understanding the CRM concept. So the cardiorenal metabolic concept, and this is my disclosure. So I think Dr. Ferial covered much uh, on this aspect, the interplay between the three important systems in the body, and in particularly when it comes to type 2 diabetes. Now, we know that liver and pancreas are the main areas for uh, regulating um, energy, metabolism, and so on. But the kidneys also play a very key role in glucose and volume homeostasis. And the heart is the most metabolically demanding organ susceptible to changes in volume and metabolism. So we know that this, these systems are so interrelated that any acute or chronic dysfunction in the heart, kidneys, or metabolic system may induce dysfunction in the other one. And each dysfunctional organ has the ability to initiate and perpetuate disease in other organs through different hemodynamic and neurohormonal uh, and biochemical pathways. And diabetes, type 2 diabetes, is actually a risk factor for diseases related to the cardiac and renal system systems. So when we look at the interplay between the cardiovascular diseases, uh, CKD, and type 2 diabetes, looking at diabetes alone, we know that 55% of patients with type 2 diabetes have NAFLD, and that is the non-alcoholic non fatty liver disease, over half of patients with type 2 diabetes are reported to be obese, and type 2 diabetes actually itself reduces life expectancy by six years. And now when you have these sort of three combinations together, you could imagine that type 2 diabetes further reduces life expectancy when you have all these cardiorenal comorbidities. And if we look at the type 2 diabetes and uh, you know, systemic cardiovascular diseases, approximately one in three patients with type 2 diabetes has cardiovascular disease. And there is actually a two to five fold increased risk of hospitalization for heart failure in these patients. Now, if you look at the normal uh, life expectancy and looking at the life expectancy for diabetics, it is already reduced by six years once a patient is diagnosed with diabetes. But imagine having a combination of diabetes and cardiovascular disease, then this is further reduced by 12 years. And when we have this sort of interplay between the cardiovascular disease and CKD, up to 67% of patients with heart failure are estimated to have CKD, and the risk of cardiovascular death increases as kidney function declines. And having said that, the CKD affects up to 40% of patients with type 2 diabetes. And we know that diabetes and hypertension are the main leading factors to end-stage renal disease, but the life expectancy significantly reduces when you have even type 2 diabetes and CKD by uh, 16 years or more. And if we look at the mortality across the type 2 diabetics and chronic kidney disease, you could see that it is 
um, uh, remarkably um, uh, in, uh, increased by 47%. When you have all the end uh, sort of uh, component of the renal uh, failure components, such as albuminuria and uh, reduced uh, glomerular filtration rate. So here comes the, uh, the two important uh, classes of agents on the board to target these cardio or the CRM uh, sort of interplay in these patients. And these are the GLP-1 receptors and SGLT2 inhibitors. So just 15, 20 years back, we were primarily relying on ACE inhibitors and statins and reducing albuminurias and cardiorenal protection. But we have now more powerful agents to really target all these systems. So the GLP-1 receptor agonists and the SGLT2 inhibitors, like Dr. Ferial presented earlier, we have proven reduction in three-point maze, uh, cardiovascular death, a hospitalization for heart failure, heart kidney outcomes, albuminuria, and GFR worsening. So this takes us to one uh, a very important agent in this class, which is the NPA glyphlosin. And, and the importance of this agent comes because it was the first agent in this class to really prove it's not only cardiovascular safety, but a, a remarkable cardiovascular outcome uh, results uh, that was uh, published through the EMPARIC outcome trial back in 2015. So this trial was a randomized double-blind placebo-controlled cardiovascular outcome trial that involved type 2 diabetes patients with established cardiovascular disease. It was carried out in 42 countries, more than 7,000 patients, and patients were assigned to three arms, uh, placebo versus the low dose of EMPA, 10 milligram, and the 25 milligram EMPA glyphlosin, and the patients were followed over a median observation time of 3.1 years. And the primary endpoint was the three-point maze, cardiovascular death, non-fatal MI, non-fatal stroke. And there were other pre-specified outcomes, um, such as hospitalization for heart failure, all-cause mortality, and incident or worsening nephropathy. So the inclusion criteria for this huge trial was that adults with uh, type 2 diabetes, A1C, between 7 and below 10%, and patients were the majority with established cardiovascular disease, at least following like a CAD or a PAD or MI or stroke, and a BMI uh, not more than 45 kgs per square meter. The exclusion criteria were GFR below 30. So patients included in this trial, uh, the GFR up to 30 uh, were included in this trial. And of course, acute coronary syndromes or stroke or transit ischemic attacks within two months prior to the trial were excluded as well. So the study population were really basically high risk patients with cardiac events. And uh, the average A1C in this study was 8.1%, BMI of 30. Established cardiovascular disease, as we said, 99%. The average GFR was 74 and the blood pressure 135, 76 and LDL of 84. And if we look at the, the type and the quality of the um, high-risk cardiovascular profile, more than 75% of patients had CAD at baseline, but one-third also had no prior MI or stroke. So these were like a single vessel coronary artery disease or peripheral artery disease, uh, um, cardiac failure. They were also included in this trial. So the results of this uh, was really fascinating because they wanted to test the cardiovascular safety of this uh, first of, uh, agent in the SGLT2 class, but it showed a really um, a significant and remarkable um, outcome. So uh, this trial showed a 38% relative risk reduction in cardiovascular death and a 35% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure, along with 14% reduction in three-point maze, 32% reduction reduction by any cause uh, and 39% reduction, reduction in nephropathy and 46% reduction in renal uh, composite endpoints. And 
the important thing that the reduced risk of cardiovascular death actually occurred early on, as you can see, the early separation uh, of the curve. And not only that, it was sustained throughout the trial. And that was uh, a very significant result for the cardiovascular death for the impagliflozin. So the summary of this trial showed that this agent was not only powerful in improving the glycemic control in diabetic patients by reducing the HbA1c by um, anywhere between 0.8 to 1% uh, uh, below baseline, but it had a positive impact uh, all, in all these cardiorenal metabolic profile, as I mentioned earlier. So 14% reduction in three-point maze, 38% reduction in cardiovascular death, 32% reduction in all-cause mortality, and 35% reduction in hospitalization for heart failure. And really, uh, based on this um, MPREG trial that uh, really um, had a great impact on uh, how the guidelines are shaped now. I mean, the guidelines were updated immediately back in 2019, 20, and recently the 2022 update from the ADA uh, with a great emphasis uh, to implement the results of these guidelines. Uh, I mean, the results of these trials and the guidelines. So as you know, the ADA a recommendation uh, from the 2020 um, lifestyle modification is important at the beginning and metformin uh, yes or no you could start with metformin but it's not really a must what they want you to do is individualization so you look at your patient if your patient is especially a high risk a patient and the SGLT2 is available and affordable uh, or, you know, covered uh, somehow by government or by the, you know, insurance companies or affordable to the patient, then that would be really scientifically uh, um, uh, correct to uh, uh, recommend these agents. So looking at these high risk patients, cardiovascular, established cardiovascular disease, here you go. The guideline is recommending GLP-1 and SGLT2 inhibitors based on these uh, trial results. For heart failure, we have uh, extensive and excellent results for the heart failure results uh, for the SGLT2 and especially also for the empagliflozin. And to tell you the results of the heart failure was so impressive in both uh, reduced ejection fraction and preserved ejection fraction. So that's why SGLT2, as you can see, they're taking that unique sort of indication for the heart failure. And if you have CKD, whether albuminuric or non-albuminuric, again, the, the guidelines are sort of recommending SGLT2 inhibitors and or GLP or both together. Now, we know that these RCTs uh, were uh, designed specifically to look at the outcome of these agents. And we know that these had great implications on the, uh, on the guidelines, but always it's very important to see see the implications of these, the results of these RCTs in the real world. And I believe that it's very important to pay attention to real world evidence studies as well, even though they have some limitations, but at least if it gives you more or less a similar results to the RCTs, that would be sort of a confirmatory and you have a more confidence in prescribing these agents. So Emprise was one of the real world evidence study for empagliflozin. So it was a non-interventional study of the cardiovascular effectiveness, safety, healthcare utilization, and cost of, of, uh, and cost of care of empagliflozin in routine clinical practice in type two patients across the cardiovascular risk continuum in different continents. So it was the Emprise US and the Emprise uh, EU and Asia. So the background of Emprise came uh, when the Emperor rig result was out there. So it started with, with Emperor Gilflozen being launched in, in August 2014. And then in 2015, the Emperor rig outcome trial was out and it demonstrated these fascinating results that I have shown you. Then additionally, uh, the analysis 
uh, was consistent across the cardiovascular risk continuum for the empiric, and it showed these powerful, uh, not only cardiac as well as renal protection. And when they, they did an economic analysis based on the empiric outcome, and it suggested that empagliflozin has the potential to provide economic benefits to the healthcare system because you will be preventing nephropathies, uh, cardiomyopathies, and cardiac events and definitely that this would be projected in um, you know uh, economic benefits in the future. So what they did in Emprise, uh, they primarily compared empagliflozin uh, versus uh, two classes of agents that uh, are currently sort of uh, fashion and in, in, in prescribing to treat type 2 diabetes. So empagliflozin versus DPP-4 inhibitors. And after, you know, randomization, exclusion, and uh, getting uh, the patients matched, uh, the two arms com were comparable in terms of the number, more than 17,000 patients were assigned to empagliflozin versus a DPP-4 inhibitor in addition to standard of care. And the other group was that the empagliflozin was uh, compared to GLP-1 receptor agonists. And again, after uh, matching, they had in two arms more than 26,000 patients assigned to empagliflozin versus GLP-1 receptor agonists. And these were like liraglutide, exenatide, deliglutide, and albiglutide. So in terms of the effectiveness outcome for the EMPA and versus uh, DPP-4, we know that um, more or less the glycemic uh, uh, effect, it was uh, very much comparable between the agents, but really what we are looking for beyond the glycemic control. And that's the, the, the idea behind uh, this talk tonight, the triple protection uh, aff uh, afforded by these, um, by these, uh, by these group of agents. So, when compared to DPP-4 inhibitor, empagliflozin was associated with a significant reduced risk of hospitalization for heart failure and routine clinical practice to com compared to, to DPP-4 inhibitor, as you can see. So remember, this is a real world evidence. This was a real practice and it showed it did better than DPP-4 inhibitors. And uh, guess what? This was um, um, uh, consistent in all patients with and without cardiovascular disease. So whether your patient had cardiovascular disease or not, the risk for hospitalization for heart failure was significantly lower for empagliflozin versus DPP-4. Now, what about empagliflozin versus a GLP-1 receptor agonist and uh, routine clinical practice? As we said, uh, again, it was compared. Uh, these were agents that were tested for their cardiovascular protection, but we wanted to see also what about in terms of heart failure aspect. But empagliflozin, looking at a broad sort of group of hospitalization for heart failure, empagliflozin did better than GLP-1 receptor agonists, uh, significantly better in terms of hospitalization for heart failure. So the, in, in summary, looking at the EMPA-RIG outcome and the hospitalization for heart failure reduced by 35%, the EMPRISE real-world evidence trial came and confirmed and showed that 44% relative risk reduction of heart failure compared to DPP-4 inhibitor and 26% relative risk reduction of heart hospitalization for heart failure compared to GLP-1 receptor agonists. And very importantly, and prize, which includes three quarters of patients, even without cardiovascular disease. So you would argue that the Emperic had patients with cardiovascular disease, but Emprise had three quarters without cardiovascular disease, still showed that versus DPP-4 inhibitor, the reduced risk of hospitalization for heart failure with empagliflozin was consistent in patients with and without established cardiovascular disease. So again, uh, fascinating classes, SGLT2, GLP-1 receptor showing a reduction in three-point mace. We can see that uh, very significantly for EMPA-RIG uh, EMPA trial over here. And for the cardiovascular death, and look at that, look at the EMPA uh, compared to the other uh, agents in the um, SGLT2 inhibitor class, 
uh, had a more sort of powerful and significant uh, reduction in cardiovascular death. And in terms of looking at the different classes of agents, SGLT2, GLP1, ACE, ARBs, and statins, and the different uh, outcome components that we normally care for in our diabetic patients, such as maize, cardiovascular death, hospitalization for heart failure, heart kidney outcomes, albuminuria, all-cause mortality, you can see that, that beautifully the SGLT2 inhibitor class met all these uh, complicated uh, endpoints by proving and showing that they were able to reduce all these uh, adverse outcomes that we see in uh, type 2 diabetic patients and constitute these CRM sort of, uh, you know, triple protection, cardiorenal metabolic protection. So um, in summary, the CRM or the cardiorenal metabolic systems are interrelated. Dysfunction in one organ or system can induce or contribute to dysfunction in the others. Type 2 diabetes, cardiovascular disease, heart failure, and CKD are interrelated. And the presence of type 2 diabetes is associated with cardiac and renal disease progression. A holistic approach to type 2 diabetes care is necessary to address the cardiovascular, renal, and metabolic aspects of the disease. And finally, guidelines and societies recommend the use of agents with CRM benefits, such as SGLT2 inhibitors and GLP-1 receptor agonists for the treatment of patients with type 2 diabetes. And with that, I would like to conclude this talk. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, thank, thank you, Dr. Nasreen, for your presentation. And you just made it on time. Thank you so much. That was great. I think, I think there is a question over here. So, Dr. Nusini, what is the role of aspirin and type 2 diabetes for reducing mace and whom to use? Yeah, now we know that the controversies with the aspirin use in general, um, but in type 2 diabetes, the criteria have been changing uh, in the different guidelines. Uh, in general, because of the risk associated with aspirin with increased bleeding, so uh, it is more sort of indicated now with certain age group, 45 and above, uh, diabetics and uh, diabetics with long duration, diabetics with evidence of comorbidities or evidence of uh, other diabetes-related complications, especially cardiovascular disease or renal disease. In these patients, usually, aspirin would be of benefit. I, I think if there is no uh, questions, I have a question for you, Dr. Nisreen. Uh, is there any uh, difference between uh, uh, SGLT2, whether, uh, let's say, IMBA, uh, DAPA, and if you can just summarize uh, what is the, the best way for uh, choosing the, the, is it a group, I mean, class related or it's a group of effect? Yeah. Now, in general, as I showed you in the last slide, the SGL22 as a class, they have proven benefit, no doubt in terms of you know, heart failure, uh, cardiovascular protection, and nephroprotection. Now, um, it's very difficult to say that this agent, uh, you would go with this versus this, because you need to look at the trial designs for different uh, SGLT2 agents that were used. So some of the trials included patients with established cardiovascular disease, others uh, without established cardiovascular disease, and others even without diabetes. So uh, all of the trials agree that uh, these agents um, prevent hospitalization for heart failure, whether it is in preserved or reserved, uh, uh, the, the HEFREF and the HEFPIF, and maybe with some uh, differences in degrees of the protection, but it is it is evident uh, among them from the trials that we have. Um, they also, in terms of three-point uh, maze, um, uh, most of them showed, um, especially in patients with established cardiovascular disease or high-risk patients, 
but the benefit of three-point mace in a diabetic without high risk or without cardiovascular disease is uh, sort of uh, almost there. And we know the, the renal protection and the albuminuria, we have um, data from the CANA, we have data from the DAPA, we have also the data from the, uh, the empagliflozin. So um, I don't think you would go wrong with uh, any of the agents uh, uh, that you would use in your clinical practice in your high-risk patient, especially in your high-risk patient. Thank you, Dr. Nasreen. And now we will have a break and uh, uh, we'll wait for the next session. Thank you for all of you. Sure, thank you. Thank you.
Okay, great. So uh, welcome back everybody from the break and thank you uh, for joining us uh, for this last session of the day. Uh, so uh, thank you for, um, you know, for uh, holding on right till the very end. So we've got some uh, excellent sessions coming up and uh, we've just had to um, change the order just ever so slightly. Um, so what we will be doing for this session is that uh, Dr. Ali um, Alamadani, um, our last speaker will actually start first, and that's because he's very busy um, uh, operating this evening at 10 o'clock. Uh, but before I uh, introduce Dr. Ali al Madani, I'd like to also welcome um, um, the moder our moderator to tonight, Dr. Saeed Raza. So uh, thank you, Dr. Raza, for um, uh, moderating today. Um, and without further ado, uh, I'd like to start the session. Um, and so Dr. Um, Ali is a very, very experienced bariatric surgeon in London. He's uh, performed many, many procedures. So there's no one better than him to introduce uh, uh, this next lecture. And Dr. Um, uh, Ali will, will tell us uh, about the mini gastric bypass. He's going to explain to us exactly what that's all about and what went wrong with the mini gastric bypass. We're very much looking forward to hearing uh, from such an expert as yourself. So the floor is all yours. Thanks a lot, Barbara. Can, can you hear me clearly, yeah? I can, thank you. Thanks a lot for that. That's really kind of you. Very kind presentation. I'm not sure if I worth all that, but that's really kind of you. And again, very thanks for all the uh, organizers to give me this opportunity to present uh, tonight again. It was it's really a pleasure, really a pleasure to be here. Uh, fine, so let me start then. Right. So the, um, so is it shared, guys, or not yet? Uh, not yet. Okay, give me one second. That's Better? promising. Yeah, absolutely. And if you can put it on uh, presentation mode, that would be great. Thank you. Right. Excellent. So again, many thanks again for this for this presentation for giving me the time to present these presentations. I think I'm going to give you some rest after we had all the nice lectures from uh, about diabetes and hearts and um, and endocrine. This is completely different. This is really a very surgical topic, and it's really dedicated to. Uh, to surgeons, as well as I think non-surgical people. I think the non-surgical people may be even more important to, to see what we are dealing with so they can understand and, and, um, and, and, and maybe also participate in the, in, the, uh, uh, in the surgical opinion regarding this patient. Um, great, excellent. Um, again, I do about 20% revisions and 80% um, primary procedures. So the, the lecture called uh, mini gastric bypass was what went wrong. And I maybe start by giving you some background about this case. So this is actually a, a patient who, who was referred to me from uh, outside UK. Uh, she had multiple complications after her mini gastric bypass. She came to me and asking, what was the problem? What, why did I have these problems? Why, why, my, why my operation went that, that bad? What was the problem with my operation? Why did my surgeon take me to the operation three times after the procedure? And now the patient said to me that I really have significant problems. I cannot swallow. My, the heart burn is killing me. Uh, my weight is only going down. And this is four years after the procedure, after the primary procedure. And she's nearly malnourished when I, when I saw her again at about a year and a half ago. Obviously, this case was a medical legal case, but we've taken the permission from the patients actually to, um, to get uh, um, this lecture done because it's obviously a medical legal and uh, the patient was very happy to share the educational part of it. Obviously, all the identification of patients was been, was been taken out from this lecture. So... But maybe when I first start to explain, I might maybe tell you what is the mini gastric bypass. So obviously it's a weight loss surgery. What we do with the mini gastric bypass, it's a form of a gastric bypass. What we do with the mini gastric bypass, we separate the stomach into two parts, as you can see here. This is the top small part and the main big part. We separate them completely away. And then we connect this top part of the stomach 
directly with the small bowel. And by doing that, we're going to bypass the big stomach. And that's why it's called a gastric bypass. The difference, we call it mini gastric bypass because instead of having normal, a normal gastric bypass, we have two joints between the bowel and the stomach. And this operation, we have only one joint. And that's why we call it mini or single anastomosis gastric bypass. However, there are significant uh, important surgical techniques in this procedure. The first principle is if you can see here, the pouch is a long pouch. So you can see this pouch is really long. And it's really starting from the end part of the stomach all the way to the top. So that's number one. Number two is because we have only one joint here. So the orientation of the joints have to be really clear. The preference of the food have to pass from the, from the stomach down into this limb, which is the common limb, where the secretions from the pancreas and duodenum and everywhere comes and mix with the food. So the food then goes here. The food does not go back here. Otherwise the patient will keep vomiting. So two principles, number one is a long joint, long pouch, long stomach pouch. And principle number two is that the preference of the food have to go to the common limb. If the preference of the food that we swallow go to the biliopancreatic limb, which is the secretion limb, then the patient will be, will be vomiting all the time. This is, this, is, this is just maybe like a quick nutshell about uh, the mini gastric bypass. So let's go back to our case now. Let's go back and discuss our case. Um, this is a 46 year old lady, very well educated um, uh, and she's still working in, in, uh, in her country. She had a mini gastric bypass in 2019, but after the mini gastric bypass, she had a problem. Her, her weight kept dropping significantly. So literally over four months time, she lost more than her uh, original size, more than half of her original size. So for 110, she's down to 41 kilograms within four months, consistently vomiting. And whichever she, she eats, she just, she just vomits. Now, during these four months, obviously the surgeon was not quiet. The surgeon who did the operation was not quiet. He, he done all the investigations that you could think of. He done the CT scan few times. He did the OGD, he or she did the OGD few times and all of them were normal. So the OGD was normal twice or three times. The CT scan was normal, no problem at all. However, the patient kept vomiting consistently. And we're reaching a stage now, the patient is emaciated. She is malnourished, she is malabsorptive, becoming malabsorption. She has, mal she has mal she having malabsorption, she continued to vomit and it's very dangerous now for the patient. So the patient came back to the surgeon and said, can you please find a solution for me? Can you revise my surgery? Put me back to the original anatomy, otherwise I'm gonna die. And that's very sensible. The patient is thinking sensibly. And, and the surgeon at this stage said, it must be psychological. Let's let's put you under the psychology. Let's refer the psych, let's refer you to, psych, to our psychologist. Anyway, so I'm gonna here show you her original operation. Um, you know, it might not be the best pictures or the best operative technique, but that does not matter. Let's let's see where is the problem. What was what what was the problem here? What exactly went wrong here? So. Uh, if you can imagine, this is the liver. This is a machine that we use, a gun that we use, or a machine that actually divide each part of the stomach and seal each part of the stomach. So you can see here that this is the remnant, remnant stomach or the, the big stomach. And this is the new pouch that we were talking about earlier. And the surgeon is dividing the stomach now, and he, in a second, gonna divide the small part left. So this, so the disconnect completely the remnant stomach, which is this bit, or the big stomach from the uh, stomach pouch. Uh, so he's putting this gun, and this gun actually, as we said, is gonna uh, cut the stomach into two parts and seal each part. Um, and maybe one of the things to note is that this, the surgical exposure is not excellent because you cannot see all the details. You can see that, for example, the liver is falling always on the operative field. Uh, there should be a liver retractor to help to help to hold the liver up. Um, so this is now the stomach completely separated. This is the remnant. This is the big stomach, so completely separated from the pouch, which is here. 
um, the surgeon here decided to take this part of the divided stomach away. I can't find the reason why we took this part away. Um, it looks absolutely normal to me. It's good to have a good, it looks like I have a good blood supply and, and it's raining normally. But anyway, the, the surgeon decided to take it out. The advantage that we would like to keep this part always after we do the bypass is in the case we would like a revision surgery, this part, this part of the stomach will help us in the revision of surgery. So we can put back the stomach to where it was before if required. However, the surgeon here decided to take it out. But again, um, that's not the main problem, but it's one of the problems that actually um, participated in, 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 in the patient consequence at the end, but it wasn't the main problem in, the, in this operation. And if there was a problem in the, when we, when we form this pouch, we can still take it out. But anyway, that's happened. Now let's go back to the original operation. Uh, this is the pouch, and you can see it's a very long pouch. It's going underneath the liver. And what the surgeon he's doing now is going to connect it to the small bowel, as we said. So we're going to make a hole into this pouch, as we can see here. And he's using this method of opening or making a hole, and he's pushing the orogastric tube. So actually, he can direct exactly where the uh, where the hole will be. Now he's going to now count the small bowel. And this is crucial. This is the crucial step here. Now, when he, you're going to see now, this is the, this is the beginning of the small bowel or the, uh, the jejunum. And if you can see here, this is, this is the proximal part. This is the distal part. Again, this is the proximal part that leads us to the jejunum. This is the distal part that's going to lead us to the anium. Yeah. And then the large bowel. So he count, if you continue counting, that's fine. That's, that's fine. There, there is a problem in that, but that's out of the context of this lecture. Let's make it as simple as possible because I know you're already tired and you would like to uh, have some dinner now, maybe. Uh, so again, let's let's let's. This is really crucial here part that this is the proximal part, and this is the distal part. Yeah. Again, this is the proximal. This is the distal, and we said that we always wanted the the joint that we create having prefer preferentially draining into the distal part, yeah? So when we do that, the food will predominantly will fall into the common limb, does it not go to the biliopancreatic limb where the secretions is. However, look what's happened here. The, the surgeon here gonna make up a, a hole in this limb, which we said that this is the proximal limb, this is not the distal limb. So you make a, you're gonna make a hole here. And again, he used this technique to make a hole, which is maybe okay. And then he will connect this part. This obviously the liver, because again, he doesn't lose your retractor, but that's not a problem. Um, you're gonna connect this part. We said this is the proximal limb. And you're gonna connect this part to the pouch which is this one here is on the lateral side of the picture. And, and he just used this suture just to, to help him in the anastomosis because you can see the reason he's using this suture because he does not have an assistant. That's why he's using the suture. But if there's an assistant who could hold the bowel here, he will not, he will not have using the suture. But that's okay, that's, that's also an acceptable technique, it's fine. That's not the main problem. But the main problem here again is we, if he make the joint between this one, which he unfortunately is making now, and this part of the bowel, which is the biliopancreatic limb or the proximal limb, then the food preferentially will go that way. And now we can maybe understand why she's vomiting. She is really vomiting because the food is going that way. So what's the problem? Why the food, if the food goes that way, it's going to, it's going to be a problem because the, the, when the bowel works, it have only one direction to work. It's go from proximal to distal. So the food, the food always go from proximal to distal. It doesn't go from distal to proximal. So when you eat, the food always go into the duodenum and the duodenum to the jejunum and duodenum to the allium and then to the large bowel. It does not go backwards. So if you can imagine the bowel here, the way it's gonna empty, is gonna go that way. It's gonna push the food that way. So whenever you push food into this limb, the normal motion of the bowel will push the food backwards into the stomach. 
obviously some of it will fall into this limb, but some of it also will go back to the stomach. And that's why the patient was vomiting. Anyway, he made the joint now, and then the last step in this operation, he's gonna close that joint. So you're gonna see now, uh, he, he uh, again, he's suture. He already made the joint, just made a matter of closing this, uh, this hole, which is the last part of the uh, operation. So two things to mention here about this operation is that the surgeon, instead of making the joint having more preferentially draining here into the distal limb, he make it mainly preferentially draining here into the proximal limb. That's, that's the problem here. Um, and because of that, the patient will keep vomiting, unfortunately. Fine. So he's, he's only going to close it here. And that's, that's problem number one with this operation. Problem number two, as we said, that he removed the large part of the stomach, which he does not require to be, remo to be removed. I'm not sure why he removed it out. Anyway, so we, now we understand uh, why the patient kept vomiting and becoming malnourished after, all, after the first procedure. Now, don't forget, it's four months down the line now. The patient is malnourished. Um, all her, all, she's, she's hypoproteinemic, she's, she's, um, she's kept vomiting and she's referred to psychologist to, to treat her craziness according to the um, surgeon. Anyway, so, uh, but the patient kept lost weight and she had physical evidence that she's malnourished. Her, all her protein is low, she's anemic, she's, she's um, all her electrolyte, electrolyte is, is abnormal. So the surgeon has to do something. And the patient came back to him and said, please put me back to the old anatomy. To my old anatomy. I just would like to back to be normal. I don't care. I, I would like to put weight more on, which is really fair enough. We understand now, as we said, this was the, the joint was not made that way. The joint was not made to be drained into the common limb. The joint was made to drain into the video pancreatic. That was the problem. Now, now what what does the the, 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 the options now, what can the surgeon do now? Now, the best way to deal with this operation is the patient specifically malnourished. It's really simple. You can literally just disconnect this joint from here. So the small bubble will fall down. So if you just, dis if, if you put a, a gun here and separate these two lumens, this part of the joint will fall down. And then you have only this pouch and you can connect this pouch to the old, old, um, old uh, stomach and that's it, it's solved. Everything's solved. Patient will back to normal absorption and he can um, go back to normal. However, don't forget this patient, this stomach from here to here is taken down. So all what's left for this poor patient is the entrum of the stomach to anastomose it to the remaining pouch, which is okay as well. That's not bad. However, let's see what's happening in the second procedure now. So this is the second procedure. We're gonna admit a patient who is mainly malnourished. I think she had TPN in the, in the meantime, which is a really sensible idea, uh, to have an operation. And our options are really simple, is to put her back to normal anatomy. And the, and the anatomy we have now is this pouch and the antrum to connect them together after we disconnect this, this loop here. It, it seems simple, yeah? Or achievable, at least. It's not simple, it's achievable. All the revisional surgery are difficult. And it's not criticized for anyone, but the revisional surgery are difficult and you have to be really meticulous because when we do revisional surgery, which is not the primary one, if you can imagine, let me explain it as simple as that. If you have a cut in your skin, the first time it will heal perfectly. Why? Because the skin is very elastic and they have very good blood supply and it will heal perfectly well. Now, if you have a cut again on exactly the same part of the skin, which is not skin anymore, it's a scar tissue, the healing in the scar tissue is not as good as the original procedure. And therefore, the chance of having a leak or bleed will be much higher in comparison to the primary procedure. And similar, when you cut the stomach on the first time and do the first procedure, the healing rate will be great. The leak rate is not than one to 2%. And the bleeding is dissimilar. But if you cut the stomach on the second time, you're not going to cut muscle anymore. You're going to cut the fibrous tissue. And therefore, the healing of this fibrous tissue is, is, is much lower than the normal tissue. Fine. Second procedure. And as we said, the surgeon gonna rightly um, 
this connect so this is the this is the loop this is the this is the old stomach sorry this is the, the new stomach pouch and this is the loop and the surgeon here gonna cut or separate this stomach or the new stomach or the stomach pouch from this loop here um I'm sorry, there's a, a marking on the form on the on the film, but this is the way I received it really from the uh, from the patient. So what the what the surgeon now going to do is pass this staple line along this um, this small bowel uh, and try to separate it from the uh, stomach. Again, again, you can see here the one of the things that the you can see always that the liver overlying the joint so it's not very clear um, and again he could actually the surgeon could for example put the liver retracted to help him to see the liver clearer uh, but you can see also the surgeon is not very meticulous maybe because there are some bowel lacerations happening while he was dealing with it but that's again that's not that's not the main problem here this is the second operation he's going to fire the second stapler so he can completely separate this small bowel and the small bowel will fall and that should be fine. And you can see now he's gonna fire the second stapler. And you can see here, you can see in the background, so that that's the spleen here. Uh, and now he separates completely. And now this is the stomach pouch. Now, this is a crucial step. What's he gonna do now? This is the pouch, this is the stomach pouch. He's gonna connect it to the Antrum. This is the antrum, this is the stomach pouch. And you can see there's no tension. There's plenty of space to join these two ends together and should be fine. However, he creates a hole in the stomach pouch now. And he also gonna create a hole into the uh, antrum and he gonna connect, connect them two together. What's the problem here? Why do I think there's a problem here? If you can see this tissue, this is the original tissue that was used to, to form the joint. And you can see here, look, all this tissue is, is ischemic. You can see here, it's very ischemic. This is healthy tissue. Look at the color here, it's very bright red. Look at this color here, it's very ischemic and, and, and scarred. Now, when we do any joints in the original surgery, you have to freshen the joint. You have to take the scar tissue away. The scar tissue will not heal. So you have to resect this part away, he has to. Otherwise, this will leak. This will not hold. Obviously, he made a hole in the antrum again, and he's making a hole here, in the, and he's going to join these two together. But this is a, a, a big problem here, because when you're going to anastomose or join this tissue, which is the healthy one, with this black ischemic tissue, it will not hold. It will not hold. It will leak. Because this tissue that has no blood supply. Obviously, the... the he did the joint here, uh, and now he's just closing the holes uh, that he made. And you can see that. I mean, the surgeon has got. He's got. I mean, I mean, he's. I mean, he can suture. I mean, he's fine. I mean, he's got. He's got skills. But the principle here is not been stick to. So you're going to see it at the end of it. You can see again. This is very healthy. This is this is ischemic bluish color. And, and then he closed everything. And so let's see what's happened after the second operation. Within 24 hours, the patient, the patient is septic. Within 24 hours, the patient is septic, tachycardic. Uh, she's very short of breath. She had high temperature. Uh, when the surgeon went to examine her, the, the first day after the operation, when he touched her tummy, she's very sore. She's peritonitic. She's got generalized peritonitis. And and we can, we, can, we can already predict what you're gonna find in the third operation now. Fine, so let's go to the third operation now. Obviously now it's completely different. This is a life-saving operation. Now that we know this patient is septic, we know this operation is malnourished, uh, we know this patient is, uh, um, got very low physiological reserve. After This is the third operation now within five months. And not surprisingly, uh, when he goes laterally, he can see now this part of the tissue is completely, as we expected, it's completely ischemic, is dark, is 
Look, this part of, this is where the leak is. And you can see this is dead, is dead tissue. Now, what is the choices? What do we have to do? Well, we, we don't have plenty of choices. We have to take this dead tissue away. And again, now this is a life-saving operation now. We have to do what's right for the patient. And now the surgeon now rightly did, taken this complex, and we can show this in a second, taken this complex of ischemic tissue away, this part completely taken away. One minute, Dr. Ali, please. Okay, then. And then he, afterwards, and maybe it's not the best um, nice feature, obviously disconnecting it here. And taking it to a healthy tissue, then. And resecting this part completely away, which is right, that's the right thing to do. Fine. What he does afterwards, he 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 brings the small bowel to connect it to the proximal stomach. So he does uh, again another mini bypass. I'm gonna stop here and go with the next. Now the patient now the patient come back to me now to the UK saying that I'm still vomiting. I'm still having bioreflux day and night. And when, when I scope her, I saw actually an area of Barrett's here. So you got esophagitis, Barrett's, and what shall we do next? And the problem here is in the mini bypass, as we said, when we create the joints, it has to be a long pouch. This gentleman, or this surgeon, sorry, on the, on the last operation, remember he resected all that, so he had a small pouch now, a short pouch. And therefore, there was significant bioreflux, as you can see, the bile comes all the way from here, goes to the stomach and goes back to that. So she's coming with esophagitis and bioreflux. And uh, simply what I did is just convert her back to, diverted the reflux back to normal. So diverted the reflux from here down to the stomach, down to the uh, small bowel here. So simple joint, take me about an hour. But it's, again, this is really, this has, should have been done by the primary surgeon because this is, a recognizable problem as well, fine. So this is the patient's story. The whole point, the, my, my main point here is bariatric surgery is a new, a new field of surgery. This has only been there over the past 15, 20 years now. So it, we don't have plenty of experience and therefore the surgeon who need to do this procedure, he have to be trained well. I mean, I give you, I can, can you only give you an example for myself? I mean. I've, I've trained to do 100 procedure under supervision until I managed to do another 100 procedure as a, with a mentorship. So I done 200 procedure, 200, until I deemed fit to practice surgery alone, to practice this surgery on my own. So that's for, because these are really powerful tool and it can kill the patients. So done 10 or 20 procedures is not enough. These are really complicated procedure. It's not like doing an appendicectomy or doing a, Aposcopic cholecystectomy, it, it has a, a long learning curve. And the whole point, the whole point of this lecture, sorry, I took your mind away, I know, it's completely irrelevant maybe, but I think it's really crucial point for everyone who's advising about bariatric procedure uh, or wanting to have a bariatric procedure as a patient, that they know the surgeon well, they trust the surgeon. The surgeon has enough experience. He's not been, he hasn't done, he's not like a cowboy that would have done, 10 or 20 procedure, then he says he's considering himself as a, as, a, uh, as, a, as a bariatric surgeon. It's really crucial to have the right training because as we said, simply by missing on the joint orientation and by mixing the limbs, patient was nearly dead. And thanks a lot for listening. Thank you very much for that. That's a, a really powerful message to everybody uh, who, is, uh, who has patients and, 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 and who's referring them for bariatric surgery. You're absolutely right. The surgeon's uh, expertise is uh, really, really important. You know, as, as a obesity physician, I need to trust my surgeons as well. Um, and, uh, you know, and, and they need to be competent, experienced and, and, and safe. Uh, and so that's a really strong message. Can, can I ask a, a question, actually? Um, please do, please obviously, do. We, we do, even in my centre where I am, some surgeons do uh, the mini gastric bypass and, and and some surgeons prefer the more sort of traditional room wide gastric bypass in your experience um what do you think is you know 
who would you choose for what patient? Um, and, and, you know, tell us a little bit more about you, you know, your thoughts with regard to the type of surgery. Patient choice. I mean, it's, it's uh, patient choice for an operation. Absolutely right. I mean, the, in general, just because it's really a long, a long talk about what's the best opportunity for, for which patients. But in general, I, I depend on three main factors. Number one is uh, what is the type of patient medical problems? For example, if a patient had reflux, then choosing a sleeve or a, or a mini bypass can make this one worse. So therefore we have to go, for example, for the normal Roman Y bypass. If the patient had no reflux, then maybe a, a sleeve or a mini bypass would be good. Patient number two is patient, psycho, patient um, eating habits. Sweet eaters are different than volume eaters or mixed eaters. So that also depends on, our, that will also um, dictate our choice for surgery. And number three, which is really crucial and it's always missed, is the patient's psychological history, which is crucial for choosing the operation. Because we know now the bypass is not a restrictive or malabsorptive operation. Bypass is a hormonal procedure. So if you're gonna offer a patient who's psychologically disturbed a hormonal procedure, what do you expect? They will revert back to the unstable psychology. So patient psychology or patient's social background is crucial to choose the operation. So it depends on these three factors to choose what's the best operation for the patient. Brilliant. Thank you very much for reminding us um, uh, of all the uh, different uh, complicated factors and why also it has to be a multidisciplinary decision as well, uh, which I think is important, of course, taking the patient into account. Absolutely. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much for that session and I wish you very happy operating at 10 o'clock tonight. Thanks <laughs> and, a lot. Uh, thank, thank, you. thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, so we'll move on to our second speaker uh, of the session today. So I'd like to welcome Dr. Deepesh Patel. And, and Deepesh is a consultant physician, uh, uh, diabetes and endocrinologist based at, uh, at the Royal Free Hospital in London, where he's also a, an associate professor. Deepesh is the chair of the Association of British Clinical Diabetologists, so he's very, very busy uh, sort of running, running the ABCD, and his research interests are mainly within sort of cardiovascular uh, outcomes and, and diabetes. So I'd like to welcome uh, Dipesh to talk to us about the an update on SGLT2 inhibitors in type 2 diabetes. We've heard quite a lot. Let's see what uh, Dipesh has to add. Thank you very much, Dipesh. Uh, thank you, uh, Barbara, and thank you to the organizers. I'll just put my slides up. I promise you I won't show you any gory pictures to put you off your dinner. Can you see my slides and hear me okay? Yes, we can. Excellent, I've got connection problems. So in case I freeze, just do bear with me. Okay, so yes, I'd like to thank the organizers again uh, to give you an update on where we are with SGLT2 inhibitors. Hopefully some of this will be complementary to what you've heard today in the symposia and also what's been covered in, in other areas, including one of our, our speakers today, Dr. Raz, who gave an excellent talk yesterday on heart failure. Okay, so. Hopefully by the end of this talk, uh, you will know a little bit more about SGLT2 and mode of action. If you don't know already, you will just recap the known benefits uh, of SGLT2 inhibitors, this class of medication in people with type 2 diabetes. We'll go through what the risks are associated with using this class of medication in this cohort. I'll show you some data from recent clinical trials and perhaps we can appreciate the additional indications of use. And we'll finish with a guideline update, which is reasonably fresh off the press. Okay, so why do we need this class of medication that works on the kidney that causes sodium and glucose disposal? Well, certainly from the UK, we know that only 40% of our patients with type 2 diabetes are achieving all uh, metabolic targets for diabetes of glucose, blood pressure, and cholesterol. We know that type 2 diabetes is a progressive disease. The longer you have it, the, the less likely your pancreas and beta cells are going to respond. And we know that there are acute complications of diabetes, both hypo, hyperglycemia, hyperosmolality, and ketoacidosis. Not just that, but we know that there are chronic uh, complications that occur after somebody's had diabetes for a number of years. Uh, that's eye disease, so uh, uh, a Unfortunately, it's still a disastrous outcome is sight loss, 
Nephropathy, we'll talk a little bit about this. Uh, so kidney dysfunction, unfortunately, end-stage kidney failure, dialysis, and kidney death. Neuropathy, uh, uh, followed by, uh, unfortunately, ulceration, uh, and perhaps infection, and ultimately amputation if not uh, managed well. We must remember there are other classes of drugs that have cardiovascular benefits and improve mortality, not just at SGLT2 inhibitors. Other classes have been shown to have benefits. And lastly, we need a number of classes of drugs because many patients do not tolerate certain medications, do not accept other medications, and there are certain contraindications uh, depending on the patient's other comorbidities. So how do they work? Well, they work on the kidney, uh, they work on uh, the proximal tubule, so the number two transporter it is inhibited and therefore there's only a minority of glucose reabsorption. The majority of glucose and sodium is excreted in the urine, and this accounts to approximately 300 to 500 kilocalories a day. So that's not just glucose uh, excretion, but also caloric uh, 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 excretion. There are a number of agents available for uh, prescribing. Uh, uh, and I've listed them here, certainly the ones that are available in the UK. And again, this, this is based on the UK. There are a number of indications. Uh, all of the uh, uh, SGLT2 inhibitors are licensed for use for type 2 diabetes. Until recently, we had a preparation at lower dose that was licensed for the use of type 1 diabetes, and this has been uh, uh, withdrawn. The market authorization was withdrawn in October. So we can no longer use that and I've scrubbed that out. But also you can see there, there are a couple of SGLT2 inhibitors, dapagliflozin and empagliflozin, that also have a, a separate license indication for use in heart failure in people without type 2 diabetes. Additionally, canagliflozin has an additional license for use in chronic kidney disease. So it's not just about type 2 diabetes, and hopefully this will become clear in this presentation. So the key benefits of using SGLT2 inhibitors in people with type 2 diabetes is it, it lowers glucose. By glucose disposal, we lower average glucose uh, as measured by HbA1c by approximately approaching 1%. Uh, we know that the higher the starting HbA1c, the greater the form. We, we know this, for, uh, this works for a number of therapies. We know there's a low incidence of hypoglycemia. These medications by themselves do not cause hypoglycemia. That's one of the benefits. One should be cautious in using these medications with other agents that do uh, predispose to hypoglycemia. As I mentioned, there's a caloric loss, and with that caloric loss, there's, a, there's weight loss uh, in, in trials around two to three kilograms. Again, that's not just uh, fluid loss, that's loss of uh, adipose tissue and some beneficial effects on visceral fat. Ultimately, uh, where these medications are most useful are for reducing the progression of chronic complications, particularly cardiovascular disease and uh, kidney disease. So there are a number of benefits of use, both metabolic, but also uh, uh, changing the, out the outcomes of our patients. Remember there are risks for use, there are adverse effects, some of which are quite predictable. These medications cause uh, glycosuria uh, and genital urine infections are reasonably common. Uh, in patients uh, using these medications. So we must counsel our patients accordingly. In most cases, fortunately, these are minor, not recurrent, uh, and easily treatable. Some of the trials have shown a UTI signal, so urine infections, but not all trials have shown a signal uh, of UTI. So that's certainly in my practice less of an issue. There uh, is one main trial that showed a signal of uh, fracture and amputation. Fortunately, this has not been seen in some of the other trials. So it may be something particular about those individuals in that trial or, or the trial itself. Uh, we know that all SGLT2 inhibitors can predispose to ketosis. So they are, people are at risk of ketoacidosis. And therefore, it's ultimately uh, really, really important that when you prescribe an SGLT2 inhibitor, you must tell patients about sick day rules. So stop the SGLT2 stop the ACE inhibitor, stop the diuretic if you're vomiting, have a diarrhea illness, or, or have a febrile illness. If patients are worried or have other symptoms, they should seek urgent help. Something else to watch out for uh, that's fortunately not common, but beginning to be reported. 
and this is Fournier's gangrene. So uh, the uh, physicians amongst you uh, will be aware of this severe and rare complication that usually requires surgery as well as admission and intravenous antibiotics. Put it into context, uh, there have been 55 cases reported in the last six years. However, if we go back for over 30 years, there have only been about 20 cases reported with other antihyperglycemic medications. The question is, are we better at reporting it or is there a true signal? I think pharmacovigilance data shows that there's a clear signal. I've certainly seen one case that I think was implicated with an SGLT2 inhibitor. So uh, if somebody uh, complains of pain in the perineum, erythema, swelling or discomfort, please do think of this complication. I did say I wasn't gonna show any gory pictures and, I, and I've shown one, so I apologize. Uh, but the, the actual importance of this is one should be thinking about people who are incontinent and are immobile. We should think twice before uh, starting these medications and thereby it's worth assessing patients' frailty before we start these sort of uh, medications. On the topic of renal outcomes, uh, 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 I was one of a steering group that uh, published a, a sort of a review of all sort of renal uh, studies uh, with SGLT2 inhibitors. And you can see there seems to be a class effect, both with canagliflozin, empagliflozin, dapagliflozin. In each of the trials uh, I've summarized here, there was certainly a reduction in the endpoint, which is essentially a 40% in GFR decline end-stage kidney failure or renal replacement therapy. So there clearly seems to be a class effect with SGLT2 inhibitors. One of the uh, landmark studies that showed this was back in 2019, the Credence study using canagliflozin, and this showed a 30% uh, reduction in this the primary endpoint of end-stage kidney failure, doubling of serum creatinine or renal cardiovascular death. But the question is, what does this mean in real practice? And I like this paper that is open access and published recently. Well, this actually shows that if we extrapolate some of the data seen on these short-term trials, and I'll just go back uh, the last slide, you can see the curve separate after 12 months in terms of uh, kidney outcomes. So we're starting to see improvements in outcomes in patients in the trial after one year. So if we extrapolate that in terms of what, how many patients are we going to prevent uh, uh, in, in actually developing end-stage kidney failure and dialysis. Or more to the point, uh, how long are we gonna delay dialysis for if our patients are getting older uh, and have other comorbidities? And it is thought we're going to uh, potentially uh, prevent dialysis for about 13 years in individuals. And that's a huge, huge step forward in our management of people with kidney disease or early kidney disease. And clearly that has a major effect on economies. So that, uh, based on US data in 2020, that's an approximate $170,000 saving per patient. So not only are we saving kidneys, uh, we're potentially saving lives, but we're also saving a lot of resource. How does it work? Well, there's a big question mark. There are a number of uh, postulated mechanisms. Some are volume and glucose related. Uh, some are anti-inflammatory. Uh, and some are uh, other, other known mechanisms, such as uh, toxicity from albuminuria, oxidative stress. But we know, very similar to ACE inhibitors, SGLT2 inhibitors decrease glomerular pressure. And that's a common uh, mechanism in these renoprotective agents. I'm going to show you uh, data from one such trial, the DAPA uh, CKD trial. Uh, in patients with, with and without type 2 diabetes. And remember, I'll show you some data uh, really demonstrating that the, these patients, some of them had type 2 diabetes, others did not. And these were a range of EGFRs between 25 and 75 mils per minute per body surface area. Albuminuria varied between 22 and 565 milligrams per millimoles. They were all well treated with ACE inhibitors and ARBs prior to enrollment. And they, some of them had diabetes, about half of them, and some without diabetes. And this was over only 2.4 years in over 4,000 people. There were primary and secondary kidney outcomes. And what can we see here? Well, we can see uh, uh, significant reductions in uh, the composite endpoint of more than 50% decline in EGFR, end-stage kidney failure, uh, or a renal death. So you can see here, numbers needed to treat only 21 to prevent these catastrophic renal outcomes. 
Uh, and again, curves are separating relatively earlier, certainly by 12 months. What about people requiring dialysis, transplantation or death? Again, major reductions, 34% risk reduction in these uh, uh, hard renal events. So these medications do work in people with early nephropathy to prevent worsening of kidney disease, end-stage kidney disease and death. And as I said, some of the people had diabetes. Does it vary? Do people with diabetes have more or less benefits? Well, there's no difference. Uh, when you look at type 2 diabetes, a baseline is no difference in terms of effect in uh, primary and composite end, end points, whether you have diabetes or not. It didn't matter whether you had high amounts of albuminuria or not, or whether your GFR was preserved, i.e. more than 45 mils per minute or less. Made no difference. It worked in all of these patients. Moving on to heart failure and endoflosin, just a quick, I know I realize it's late in the day, just to show you some data uh, from the Emperor Reduce study that looked at people with type 2 diabetes and without type 2 diabetes with chronic heart failure class 2 to 4 using empagliflozin uh, versus placebo. Uh, again, this is a busy slide. All I want you to take from this is uh, that uh, these patients were uh, 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 sick patients in the sense that 35% had atrial fibrillation, half had type 2 diabetes, but 30% had already had hospitalization within the last one year for heart failure. They had relatively preserved kidney function. And you can see here a 25% reduction in cardiovascular death and hospitalization for heart failure. So empagliflozin really does work. Uh, similar data has been seen with dapagliflozin. And again, does it matter if you have diabetes or not? The answer is no, it doesn't matter. Uh, there was not much heterogeneity in, in positive uh, benefit apart from in, in race, ethnicity, and BMI. Uh, apart from that, it seems to be uh, 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 relatively concordant in favor of empagliflozin. Uh, and again, secondary outcome data hospitalization, first and recurrent, again, benefits uh, within the first three months with empagliflozin. So in this trial, it showed uh, uh, benefits of primary endpoints of death and hospitalization. Uh, first and recurrent hospitalizations, which were adjudicated. I didn't show you data on uh, declining EGFR. That's, there were uh, positive data that showed a, a, a reduction in the slope of EGFR decline. A common question people ask me is, which SGLT2 inhibitor do you use to prevent cardiovascular disease or renal disease? And well, actually, if you look at different trials, uh, different trials tell you different things, but the theme is the same. They're all pretty protective. But therefore, you've got to look at the trial population in a bit more detail. So remember, in the Dapagliflozin trials, uh, they had lots of patients without previous cardiovascular events. So they had a, a lower risk uh, uh, population in, in the, uh, the TIMI trials, the Dapagliflozin trials. Empagliflozin, certainly the Empereg trials, had established cardiovascular disease. And the Canagliflozin uh, trials, certainly the Credence, had established chronic kidney disease. So it all depends on what your patient looks like at the outset to which SGLT2 inhibitor you opt for. And everyone have their preferences. Uh, this it comes from uh, a position statement that was published in the British Journal of Diabetes uh, with a couple of colleagues of mine. And it gives you a flavor of uh, which SGLT2 to lean towards depending on the evidence. And you can see uh, uh, the number of pluses, there's significant overlap, but clearly if somebody has established cardiovascular disease, I think empagliflozin has uh, a far and beyond uh, a lot of evidence. Established heart failure is good evidence for DAPA or empagliflozin and established CKD, uh, canagliflozin and dapagliflozin. So again, go to the trials, uh, but you know, I think there's, there's significant merit to say there's a, there's a, a class effect for both heart failure uh, and renal disease. My last slide now, uh, not uh, in whom should we be using it, when should we be using it? And hopefully uh, you, you've got the flavor that we should be using it a lot more in people with early disease, but now we've got guidance certainly from America, Europe, and now even the UK saying we should be using it very early. And this is a draft and reasonably hot off the press uh, uh, this month uh, uh, and essentially showing uh, even uh, in the UK now, we're stratifying patients at the outset, whether they have no cardiovascular disease, 
established cardiovascular disease or if they're just at high risk of cardiovascular disease. So this is first line treatment. We know uh, on a starter on our menu, metformin is always a, the starter dish that we, we try to start with. Uh, but now uh, even the UK guidance is saying, well, actually, once you've started metformin, if your patient has established heart failure or atherosclerotic disease, you should offer, and I've highlighted that in yellow, offer an SGLT2 inhibitor routinely. And if your patient is at high risk uh, of cardiovascular disease as quantified by a risk score, Q-risk 2 of more than 10%, you should consider an SGLT2 inhibitor early after metformin therapy. So this is uh, beyond uh, uh, recognizing that these are glucose-lowering drugs, these are actually drugs that prevent cardiovascular and renal disease. And I think now uh, it's great that the UK is following uh, uh, America, Canada, Europe in their guidance in recognizing this. It's not about just glycemia, it's about actual risk. So on that note, uh, uh, Madam Chair Lady, uh, I will conclude and I'm very happy to take questions. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Dupesh, for that very clear uh, and really very useful pr uh, presentation, um, which I think summarised a lot of the uh, talks that we've also heard today. Um, can I just ask, I think there's, um, I'm not sure there's any specific questions as far from the audience, but can I just ask you, um, you know, if we look at the NICE guidelines, for example, so it's very clear if you've got established heart failure, established cardiovascular disease, that you should be reaching out to an SGLT2 inhibitor after metformin. What about those patients who do not have established cardiovascular disease or heart failure? Um, are we still justified to use, you know, to you know, metformin plus glyclozide, for example, based on cost, um, um, or perhaps even a gliptin? Or should we be really using these agents anyway as second line to metformin? What, you know, what are your thoughts about that? That's a really good question, a really practical question. People are going to go to agents that they're familiar with. Uh, I would agree. I think we should be going away from medications that don't give any other advantages. Our patients are unfortunately suffering from cardiovascular disease and renal disease far too commonly. We now have agents that prevent these diseases. It, it actually makes perfect sense to use them early. They're actually not that expensive uh, in the grand scheme of things. And we really shouldn't be going with sulfonylureas. I think it should be rescue therapy for hyperglycemia. Uh, it is what essentially what we use temporarily until we can add in other agents. Gliptins, again, uh, we use gliptins in people where we can't use these other medications in perhaps the frail elderly and that sort of thing where you want to take the edge off glycemia with a well tolerated, but it only has modest effect on glycemia and certainly no cardiovascular benefit nor renal benefit. Yeah, thanks, Bridget. Question is okay. Uh, uh, Dr. Bakir, first I want to welcome uh, Dr. Sayed Rada uh, on board. And then uh, uh, I have a question for Dr. Bakir. Uh, we know that many of the patients, we can give them a medication like metformin. We can give them, uh, of course, uh, uh, bioglitazone, sensitizer, and SGLT2. So which group of patients can respond better? with SGL22 and than others. And the one, uh, this is about uh, sugar control and who will get the best benefit from the renal and cardiac, uh, I mean, uh, part of the uh, prevention? Really good questions. I think, as we know, the higher the baseline A1C, the better the response. We have to be careful because uh, obviously there is a small increased risk of ketosis. And so in, certainly in my patients, if they start with an HbA1c of over 10%, I will bring it down with something else and then add in an SGLT2 inhibitor. Uh, but you're right, we should be using it in people with albuminuria at the outset, people who are overweight and have weight-related comorbidities and, and hypertensive patients. We know that these, pa these things help in terms of sodium loss and blood pressure reduction. So that's quite a lot of patients uh, actually uh, at the outset. So we should be using them more. In terms of risk of reduction, we know that higher the risk of, the higher the risk of, um, if you've got high amounts of albuminuria uh, or you've had diabetes a long time, you know you're gonna be at risk of kidney disease and, and heart failure. So in terms of those, uh, those endpoints, I think we would probably treat people uh, a little bit later. However, things are changing. If we start using these, these agents earlier, the premise is we'll prevent 
kidney disease and heart failure. Yet to be determined, that's the premise. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I think there's another question. Um, they're asking, somebody's asking, how big is the risk of DKA whilst on SGLT2 inhibitors and what should the patient be told with regards to this? A really important question. Uh, the risk is not, uh, it's not large, it's a small risk. So essentially you've got to tell your patient uh, during illness, that's when ketosis is going to come generally. So if somebody has a diarrheal in the illness, who's vomiting, uh, you would need them to have some sort of ketone measurement, okay? And that might be a urine dipstick, that might be the local GP or something like that essentially. So good sick day rules. And also, remember, patients going in for operations, they need to stop their SGLT2 inhibitor at least a day or so before, because we, we see a bit of ketosis in hospital, in people with a poor in the perioperative uh, state. That's great. Thank you very much, Tapesh. Um, I don't think there are any other I'm questions unless Dr. Ross. Yes, sure. Sorry. <laughs> well, no, hey, good evening, you. everyone. And uh, sorry Hello. for the uh, joining late. Uh, my apologies. Uh, just a Two quick questions, uh, Dr. Dipesh. First of all, a uh, wonderful uh, lecture on SGLT2 inhibitors. Uh, now, my question is, uh, we have a combination therapy available in the Middle East, SGLT2 inhibitors with metformin. Now, apart from the advantages of the compliance and perhaps uh, cost, uh, do you see any added advantage of using this combination therapy? Uh, that's a great question. Uh, I'm glad you've asked it. I think we should be using combinations therapies at the start, at the outset, okay, in patients. You're right. As long as we've got the right dose for the trials of renal protection and cardiovascular protection, we should be using these at the outset, at diagnosis in people uh, with, rap, you know, with, with certainly better glucose management, better weight management, and hopefully protection of cardiorenal disease. So I'm, I'm a big fan. I use a lot more combination therapies now at the outset. Okay, just uh, perhaps the last question. And uh, in my practice, I see patients uh, on SGLT2 inhibitors, uh, some of them, not all, a proportion of the patient, they lose weight. And they lose weight to an extent that they actually request or demand that I should stop their medications. And they have not restarted on any of them. What's your experience? Uh, do you stop and then restart? And if they're okay? With their I've not really had that experience. Yeah. I'm not sure what else you've been telling them, Dr. Raza, but you, <laughs> clearly I'm going to send my patients to you. But no, I've, I've not really seen that. I've not really no, seen there, that. There are quite a few whom, in whom I had to literally stop the medication. I've not restarted. Really I don't know what they will react as. Will they regain the weight or not? Well, that's, I think that, you know, you, you always get these sort of hyper responders, won't you, every so often that don't follow the clinical trials and what have you, but really interesting. Really interesting. No, I've, I've not really seen that. I've not had to stop many people because of weight loss. Uh, what about you, Professor McGowan, in obesity? Have you had to stop many patients? No, not really. If anything, we reinforce uh, SGLT2 plus and GLT1 to promote even more weight loss in the majority of the patients that we see. Um, I've not really seen any super responders to SGLT2 inhibitors, I have to say. Um, but um, it's great to share clinical experience, yeah. Really good. As long as it's not the fruzamide and the SGLT2 inhibitor, Dr. Raza. No, uh, no, no, just, just the, just the SGL, <laughs> SGLT2 alone. I'm just joking. I'm just joking. Of course. Okay, great. Well, okay, you. brilliant. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Depesh, uh, for, for an excellent lecture. And I think we're ready to move to the next lecture, actually. Yes, I think it's uh, you, Barbara. So let me introduce uh, yourself. Uh, so it's my pleasure uh, to introduce our chairman for... Uh, this session. Let me see if I can. One minute. Yeah, it's a pleasure to introduce our next speaker, Professor Barbara McCon. Uh, she is consultant endocrinologist at Guys and St. Thomas's Hospital. Uh, she's professor in diabetes and endocrinology at King's College London. Uh, she leads the obesity bariatric service at uh, GSTT for the management of patients with severe and complex obesity. Her areas of research are in, she has interest in gut hormones and appetite control, pharmacology for obesity and remission of type 2 diabetes post periodic surgeries. She is investigator for several obesity clinical trials 
and was awarded NHR uh, CRN Prize for recognition of outstanding research within the NHS. She chairs a couple of uh, obesity task forces such as ABCD and GR, GIRFT. So welcome, uh, Dr. Barbara, and the screen is yours. Thank, Thank you. you. So I think, um, I'm hoping there should be a recording coming up. Uh, yes, Dr. Barbara. Thank you. And women's health. So I'm going to talk today, uh, first of all, about obesity uh, as a disease, just to remind you um, that obesity is a chronic disease. And then I will move on to talk about the impact of obesity on women's health. And perhaps we've not really had a chance to really focus on how obesity impacts women's health. And hopefully with this lecture, I will um, remind you about the issues that we really need to be thinking about and focusing on. And then finally, I will talk about the benefits of weight loss um, in uh, relevance to the issues um, you know, affecting women and women's health. So obesity is recognized as a disease uh, in several countries in the world, and several organizations have defined it as a chronic relapsing progressive disease process, including world obesity, the American Medical Association, uh, Obesity Canada, EAASO, and the FDA. Now, we usually use BMI, of course, to uh, classify obesity. Um, so with a sort of BMI usually between sort of 18 and a half and 25 as a normal range, and 25 to 30 is overweight, and obese is over 30 with different classes of obesity. And this works very well at population level, but of course, at individual level, uh, we, we need to uh, look at um, other parameters to give us more of an idea about metabolic obesity. And that's where waist circumference uh, comes in very handy uh, with um, classifications of waist circumference for men and women, uh, and also uh, adjustment for certain ethnicities such as um, you know, agents, for example, where um, lower um, diameters, waist circumferences, uh, can actually predispose to uh, metabolic complications. And this is just to remind you that um, there are two different types of fat. There's a visceral fat, which is the metabolic fat, the harmful fat, the fat that leads to metabolic complications, and the subcutaneous fat, uh, which uh, to some extent is less damaging, although um, will also play a role in, in terms of other complications such as um, osteoarthritis um, and, and you know, excess weight having an impact on joints. Now, um, adipose tissue is uh, both an autocrine and paracrine uh, uh, tissue. It secretes uh, many, many, many hormones. Um, and some are listed here, so we recognize leptin, for example, so the more adipose tissue we have, the more leptin we secrete. And of course that plays um, an important role in signaling to the brain about the amount of adipose tissue, storage tissue that we have. But of course there are many, many hormones, um, inflammatory hormones, uh, angiotensin, adiponectin, steroid hormones. So it really it's a very active organ. And obesity at its simplest level is an equation between energy intake and energy expenditure. And there are many non-modifiable factors, for example, genetics that we, can, we can't really do much about. Um, and, and then signals from the gut, um, both adip well, and adipose tissues, but which sort of inform the brain as to whether we are hungry or full. Um, but there are also other modifiable factors, for example, that contribute to obesity, such as medication, for example, which we can do something about. Um, and all of these in, you know, interact with the obesogenic environment, which again, we can do something about at environment, uh, sorry, gov government level, perhaps. And then the experience uh, uh, and palatability of pleasure of food, the, the hedonic input, um, and, and all of those really sort of um, are directed towards this sort of equation to determine ultimately 
uh, whether we are um, calorie full or calorie deficit. But let's focus on uh, women's health and how does obesity affect women's health? So you can see from the slide, there's actually a very large number of uh, medical conditions affected um, um, uh, by being overweight. So gynecological cancers, for example, pelvic organ prolapse, urinary incontinence, infertility and sexual function. Of course, acne, hirsutism, and polycystic ovary is very, very common. Uh, obesity can also affect fertility, pregnancy, fetal complications, menstrual irregularities, not to mention, of course, mental health and depression, um, and also uh, other, um, other complications such as endometrial polyps, fibroids, uh, cardiometabolic complications, musculoskeletal pain. So the list is actually very comprehensive. And what I thought I thought I would do is just show you some clinical cases, not, not to solve the cases or go through the cases, but just think about some of these issues. Uh, and for example, with case number one, um, you know, mom comes to the pharmacy with her daughter, Nadia, who's 12 years of age and is experiencing long and painful periods as well as mild acne. And Nadia's BMI is 28, which is considered to have obesity according to her age. And Nadia suffers from anxiety and mild depression and cannot focus on school lessons. So already at the age of 12, um, you know, we have issues with weight, we have issues with periods, uh, this lady may have PCOS, um, and, you know, we're also looking at mental health in terms of anxiety and mild depression. So these conditions really can start early on in life. So this is a uh, a graph looking at um, the association of overweight and obesity with the odds of PCOS in adolescence. So it's a prevalence of uh, both diagnosed in the black and undiagnosed uh, PCOS um, in the gray. And what we can, this is between adolescents aged 15 to 19 years. And what we can see here. Uh, that obviously as uh, weight increases, so um, overweight, moderately obese, extremely obese, uh, the prevalence of PCOS increases. But what is extraordinary that only half of all PCOS at best is diagnosed. So there's a lot of undiagnosed PCOS out there. And interestingly, so even more undiagnosed PCOS in, in ladies who are underweight or normal weight, because we always think of PCOS, um, you know, in patients who may be overweight, but actually there's a lot of lean PCOS as well. So how can we diagnose uh, PCOS in adolescents? Um, this is a question, uh, but so is it a good family history? Is it by excluding other causes of hyperandrogenism? Is it by completing a hormonal and metabolic blood test? Or is it all of the above? And of course, you know, we need to do all of these things uh, to, to, to get to history of PCOS and a diagnosis of PCOS. So let's talk a little bit more about PCOS and how um, uh, we think about the pathophysiology and the diagnosis and management. So we know that in terms of pathophysiology, it, it remains a complex and largely unclear um, mechanism. But we do know that the, there are several contributing factors, including a genetic predisposition. And um, many uh, ladies affected have a hormonal imbalance and 60 to 80% we see increased androgens and increased insulin levels. Um, indeed, uh, we see insulin resistance in about 50 to 80% of our patients. Um, the condition is also associated with obesity that we've seen about again 60 to 80%. And often we see uh, ovarian dysfunction, so with ladies presenting with either oligomenorrhea or amenorrhea in 70 to 80%. We also see hypothalamic uh, pituitary abnormalities, and often we also see uh, slightly increased prolactin levels as well. And what do these uh, patients present with? Well, uh, commonly hirsutism with excessive hair growth on the face, chest, or upper thigh, uh, which we see about 70% of women PCOS. Uh, ladies will also often have irregular menstrual periods, which can be absent, infrequent, too frequent, heavy and unpredictable. Infertility is associated commonly with PCOS, um, um, and, and we see this often. 
Of course, acne, uh, 33% of women, oily skin, and then the sort of pathognomonic sort of uh, skin uh, discoloration uh, with acanthosis nigricans, where those patches with thick and velvety dark, darkened skin, which we see usually uh, around the neck area or, or um, underarms. Then, of course, um, some of the women will also have um, polycystic ovarian morphology in about 80%, but we don't have to have this to make the diagnosis. And how do we diagnose um, PCOS? Uh, well, there are different um, criteria. So there's the National Institute for Health or NIH criteria um, with presence of clinical and or biochemical hyperandrogenism and oligoaminuria or in ovulation. Uh, there's also the Rotterdam criteria, which are the ones that I usually uh, use. And two out of three, uh, you need to have two out of three, so oligoovulation and or anovulation. Clinical and or biochemical signs of hyperandrogenism and polycystic ovaries and ultrasound. So as I mentioned, if you have uh, ladies presenting with irregular periods uh, and clinical or biochemical signs of hyperandrogenism, you don't need to have polycystic ovarian appearances to make the diagnosis. Um, also, the Androgen Access BCOS Society has their definition, but they're much the same in terms of making that diagnosis. And of course, we have to exclude other etiologies of hyperandrogenism. And the um, effects of obesity upon PCOS can be summarized on this slide. So if we start off with obesity at the top, uh, so we know that obesity can lead to insulin resistance and hyperinsulinemia, and hyperinsulinemia um, can drive type 2 diabetes and increase cardiovascular risk. Uh, it can also lead to hyperandrogenism, and, and, and insulin resistance can also lead to hyperandrogenism, the two things that are very interconnected. The hyperandrogenism leads to mental uh, disturbances and ovarian dysfunction. So really the, um, the, the really important issue here is insulin resistance. It's the insulin resistance that's driving a lot of the, um, um, the, the, the symptoms uh, and the clinical picture that we see in PCOS. So what are the possible long-term risks of PCOS? Well, we've talked about uh, you know, subfertility and infertility, which we commonly see. Uh, it can lead to obstetrical complications, especially if, if ladies are overweight, and include increased cardiovascular risk. Um, it is also associated with impaired glucose tolerance, type 2 diabetes, and metabolic syndrome. Of course, uh, malignancies, which we'll talk about again with uh, increased obesity and weight, and of course, psychological complications. Now, the obstetric and metabolic complication of PCOS includes include a significant increase in the risk of gestational diabetes, preeclampsia, and a very preterm birth. So we need to uh, also um, inform patients uh, with regards to these. We know there's an approximately three times increased risk of impaired glucose tolerance, type 2 diabetes, and metabolic syndrome versus women without PCOS. And uh, coronary heart disease risk factors also increase in premenopausal women with PCOS, uh, with usually increased uh, levels of total cholesterol and LDL. How do we manage it? Well, lifestyle, of course, is always the first intervention, so healthy eating and physical activity. And uh, um, there is a metabolic dysfunction uh, present and um, 5 to 10 percent weight loss in women with obesity uh, can uh, improve this. We also have hyperandrogenism, which we need to treat, and usually we, we reach uh, to um, the combined contraceptive pill, for example, to try and reduce the levels of antiandrogens uh, or use uh, other uh, medications, for example, spironolactone, in combination with um, uh, contraception to reduce levels of antiandrogens. And then uh, for fertility indications, of course, um, we need to, uh, again, well, aim for weight loss to improve fertility. We can use uh, metformin, uh, which can improve uh, periods and by reducing insulin resistance. And then, of course, there are a number of other um, interventions, ovulation induction agents, gonadotropines, laparoscopic ovarian surgery, bariatric surgery, and 
uh, anti-obesity medications. Uh, but uh, we must always start with lifestyle first mm. and inform uh, our patients that weight loss can really help to improve a lot of the underlying problem of insulin resistance. So here we are. So weight loss improves clinical features and long metabolic health. Um, so by uh, with weight loss, uh, we see lower levels of insulin and decreased insulin resistance. Some studies have also shown some decreased androgen levels. There's usually uh, an improvement in menstrual cycles, uh, ovulation and fertility. Studies have also shown improved psychological outcomes. Uh, uh, risk factors of cardiovascular disease and type 2 diabetes are reduced. And also um, studies have also shown reduction of hirsutism, acne and skin affection. Although in my personal practice, I find that weight loss tends to be less effective in improving the hyperandrogenism uh, picture, but certainly uh, there can be some improvement. So here's a clinical case uh, number two. So this is a 32 year old female presented with menstrual irregularities and subfertility. She was married for eight years and had a history of three miscarriages. She was oligomenorrheic for uh, the last eight years, and the last menstrual period was six weeks ago. She complained about excessive facial hair for the last two years. She took ovulation induction drugs several times with different physicians, but she failed to conceive. So she's now, um, uh, you know, she weighs 79 kilograms, her BMI is 32.9. So um, what are we going to do? What will be our first management recommendation? for this lady. Uh, so we first of all are uh, going to arrange a biochemical workup for PCOS. Uh, well, I guess so. She definitely sounds like she has a diagnosis or may have a diagnosis of PCOS. Uh, we can certainly start to metformin to improve insulin resistance, which may also help to regulate her periods. Um, I think we should definitely advise weight loss uh, through a lifestyle intervention if this has not been uh, tried before. Um, and then perhaps think about advising weight loss through pharmacotherapy. Of course, if she's trying to get pregnant, we just uh, need to be slightly careful about what we can and can't do with pharmacotherapy. Uh, so it might be that uh, we only have lifestyle intervention if pregnancy is, of course, um, the top of our list. But the, the main, the main um, message here is that she really needs to try and lose some weight, which will hopefully improve her fertility. Okay, so we've talked at length about PCOS. Uh, what about other uh, uh, women's health issues around obesity? So I'm going to talk about a little bit about urinary incontinence, uh, can cancer risks, and postmenopausal complications. So starting with urinary incontinence, uh, urinary incontinence is caused by a disturbance in the storage function uh, and or the emptying function of the lower urinary tract, resulting in involuntary loss of urine. And essentially, we have two types, the stress urinary incontinence, which is leak of urine during increased abdominal pressure, and urge uh, urinary incontinence, which is the involuntary detrusive contraction, usually with a sensation of urge. We can, of course, get mixed uh, incontinence, which is a feature um, uh, of both stress and urge incontinence. And the prevalence of this increases with BMI. So actually, uh, in women, uh, the overall prevalence of urinary incontinence in women over 20 years of age is actually somewhere between 17 and 41 percent. And we can see here that as BMI increases, uh, that prevalence also increases. So what are the recommendations? Uh, well, weight loss, again, is recommended by a number of uh, societies and institutes. So um, we have the European Association of Urology that recommends overweight and obese adults with urinary incontinence to lose weight and maintain weight loss. We have the National Institute uh, for Health and Care Excellence that recommends um, those women with a BMI greater than 30 to lose weight, and also the American Neurological Association with much the same message. And of course, lifestyle intervention is always the first line treatment. Um, and um, we should advise to also reduce fluids, caffeine and carbonated drinks. So perhaps uh, think about time to voiding, uh, manage constipation, of course, which can also um, exacerbate symptoms of urinary incontinence. Aim for a BMI of below 25 and also think about uh, pelvic muscle training, depending on which side of the equation 
you're on, whether you're on the stress continence <clears throat> side um, or the urgency side. Okay, so what about cancers? Well, uh, we know that uh, the risk of developing some cancer is increased with obesity, and indeed overweight and obesity is the second biggest cause of cancer in the UK, uh, and I'm sure also uh, in, in many, many countries, and more than one in 20 cancers is uh, caused by excessive weight. The risk is uh, higher the more weight patients gain and the longer uh, they live with overweight and obesity. And thus far, we've identified at least um, um, 13 types of cancer um, and re reducing weight can reduce the risk of these cancers. As you can see here, uh, these include breast cancer, um, uh, bowel cancer, uh, endometrial cancer and, uh, you know, um, ovarian uterine cancer. So let's talk about uh, endometrial cancer as the context today is to talk about women's health. And women with obesity are two to three times more likely to get endometrial cancer. And for women who are 23 kilograms overweight, they're 10 times more likely to get endometrial cancer. Um, and studies have also shown that large weight loss can reduce this risk. Okay, so finally, let's talk about obesity in the older age. And older age and menopause are associated with an increased um, uh, fat mass and redistribution of fat to the abdominal area. And, you know, talking again about uh, visceral fat, remember that uh, this can lead to uh, medical consequences of, of obesity, including type 2 diabetes and cardiovascular disease, which can be commoner in older age and can generate additional burden on women with obesity in this age group. And of course, obesity can also exacerbate the decline in physical function related to age, leading to social isolation. Okay, so we know that there are many complications of obesity, um, and here they are listed um, from diabetes prevention, dyslipidemia, hypertriglyceridemia, GORD, non-alcoholic fatty liver disease, osteoarthritis, stress incontinence, hypertension, PCOS, and so on and so forth. And we also know that weight loss can help improve some of these complications and indeed lead to remission of some of these complications. And there are different amounts of weight loss which are required for therapeutic benefit for these conditions. So if we focus on those conditions, um, you know, linked with women's health, for example, stress incontinence. So evidence suggests that five to 10% of weight loss uh, can be beneficial. With PCOS, anywhere between five to 15%, uh, that can really, really help. Um, and then uh, if we're looking at diabetes remission, for example, so metabolic dysfunction in, in, in ladies, for example, with PCOS, then really 10 to 15% is the um, is really what we should be aiming for. So small amounts of weight helpful, but um, you know depending on the complications, we may need to be more ambitious in our targets. Okay, so in summary, um, I think I've shown you today that PCOS is probably the most common endocrine disorder in females, uh, with a high prevalence, um, and there's really no uh, medication approved for PCOS. Interestingly, and the pathophysiology is not clearly understood. But PCOS and obesity are uh, intricately linked and obesity contributes and exacerbates the complications of PCOS. Weight loss in women with obesity uh, is the recommended first line treatment for PCOS. So we must, must remember to manage this when we see ladies with PCOS. Um, and so not to ignore the, the weight issue um, and just sort of concentrate on, on hyperandrogenism, for example. Um, and anti-obesity medication, um, including medications, um, anti-obesity med sorry, treatment, including medications and bariatric surgery should be considered with obesity and PCOS after an assessment of the risk benefit ratio. Of course, a lot of these women are looking for fertility. So for example, bariatric surgery may not be um, favorable uh, in the sense that, you know, they, 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 they then need to wait at least 18 months to two years after bariatric surgery. Um, before thinking about pregnancy. Um, however, uh, each case needs to be discussed individually 
to see what's uh, the most optimal intervention and the timing of that intervention for each patient. And finally, I talked about obesity associated with urinary incontinence, increased cancer risks, and postmenopausal problems. And with that, I'd like to uh, say thank you very much. I'm very happy to take questions um, on this uh, very common uh, condition or set of conditions that affect women uh, commonly today. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Barbara. That was a wonderful presentation on obesity and its associated complications or negative effects, I would say. Uh, but one thing I would like to add, uh, which I didn't see featuring on your, in your presentation, is the psychological aspect, uh, particularly in the adolescents and children. And I feel that there, there is a huge impact, you know, these children or the teenagers particularly, uh, they are impacted negatively as far as their psychosocial health is concerned. And it can range anything from low mood to depression to even suicidal thoughts. What's your view on that? Uh, thank you very much for that. And you're, you're absolutely right. I mean, there's a huge psychological um, uh, component to uh, some of these conditions, especially PCOS, especially to the, the, the young women who are, uh, especially her suit, um, you know, with, with significant um, acne um, and, and, and of course, weight gain. So this can affect young ladies from, from very early ages and have a psychological impact. Um, and, and therefore, uh, addressing also the, the psychological and mental health aspect is important. There's no doubt about that. Um, I guess um, I, I'm not sure how good our, you know, certainly our services in the UK are not that good, actually, at uh, managing mental health aspects. But I think we're now becoming much more aware of these problems. And hopefully that will be part of the management of the whole patient, of course, as well as, uh, you know, the sort of interventions that I've mentioned. So absolutely very important. Thank you for raising that. Yep. Thank you. Uh, the other comment I would like to make is uh, when I see patients and I discuss weight loss with my patients and I tell them that, you know, don't lose weight, uh, go and lose fat. Now, you will agree perhaps that uh, the looking at the uh, body weight and the BMI are perhaps the more old fashioned way or traditional way of looking at, you know, obesity. And what we should really be looking at the visceral fat. And that's what should be estimated or at least the subcutaneous fat. Now, in our hospital now, we have got recently the DEXA scan where we can estimate the visceral fat and you know, the full, full body mass index. So what's, what's your view on that? Uh, are you using the DEXA scan uh, routinely? We don't, use, we don't use the DEXA scan routinely, uh, apart from uh, you know, if we do research on the patients and we don't tend to use it. Um, obviously, we, we try and use waist circumference as, as a marker to help us. Um, I think the, the good news is usually with weight loss, uh, the visceral fat is the first one that tends to go on the whole. Uh, and so, you know, um, but uh, it's really about uh, yeah, well, using what you have locally. You're absolutely right. Like I said, BMI is very good at population level, but not very good at individual level. Um, and, and therefore uh, also taking into account ethnicity. So as you know, you know, so we, we're really talking about much lower BMIs in the South East Asian populations, for example. Um, so those are very, very important. And then, as I mentioned, you know, there's lean PCOS, of course, um, where, you know, that can be quite um, difficult to diagnose sometimes because we, don't, we always associate PCOS with, with, with patients who are overweight. Uh, but you're absolutely right. Yeah, visceral fat is, is, is really what we want to try and address here. Yeah, on a lighter note on that, uh, the when you mentioned the weight circumference, now I uh, joke with the patient, first of all, they should know where their waist is. So it's hardly visible in obese patients. <laughs> yes. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Dipesh has a question. Uh, you want to unmute yourself, Dipesh? Well, thank you, Dr. Raza. Great lecture, uh, Barbara. I always learn lots of things uh, in different aspects of obesity. So. I guess cancer is a real concern going forward. We're making headway with cardiovascular disease, renal disease, and what's left as patients are getting older. But is there, are there any insights from registry studies using GLP-1 receptor, analog, uh, receptor agonists uh, of any potential benefits of using GLP-1s in terms of cancer risk on, on, on say, large registries? Any evidence at all? Um Thank you, Dipesh. Those are really good questions. Uh, I don't think there's any uh, evidence um, that I'm aware of about the benefits of GLP-1 agonists on cancer 
risk. Um, I don't think we have long term, you know, sort of long term data to be on because we're obviously using them for, well, I think the longest studies that I know is up to two years. So I think it's, 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 it's well worth collecting the data. As you know, as you lose weight, of course, there are some cancers which are much more they're easy to spot, for example, breast cancer. So as you lose weight, you're more likely to um, notice nodules, perhaps that you were not able to pick up beforehand. And so if anything, we, we, we pick up more cancer as we lose weight, but only because of the weight loss that allows us to, um, you know, to, 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 to basically notice more prevalent lumps and bumps. Um, so I think um, it'd be very good to get the data, but I think we need much long, longer term um, uh, sort of data collection. Thank you. Thank you, Barbara. There are a couple of questions in the chat box. Uh, I'll just quickly run through. Uh, the first question is, what can we do? I think it's regarding the PCOS and the patient who is already on a good lifestyle, uh, taking good lifestyle measures, exercise and eating healthy food and on metformin. But for some reason, the patient don't, doesn't tolerate metformin very well. So um, what's the next option? Well, I think, you know, so obviously always try and, and, and offer a slow release metformin if possible, uh, slow release, you know, just in case they haven't had it. Um, but of course, lots of people would not tolerate slow release metformin either. So if eligible and the need to lose weight, then, you know, we can think about pharmacotherapy, for example. Um, if, if obviously they've tried everything else, you know, we had some wonderful lectures about intermittent fasting, time restricted eating. So absolutely, you know, use other ways of of weight loss and time restricted eating is very good because of the, you know, you, you, you have lower insulin levels during these periods of fasting. But otherwise, like I said, medication, Saxenda, um, but of course we must um, also uh, let them know that they shouldn't really get pregnant on, on, on these weight loss medications. Um, but it's, uh, it's, it's, every case is individual. Some ladies will need bariatric surgery for weight loss. Um, if they've got lean PCOS, and I think I did see a question about lean PCOS, um, it's always worth trying metformin if they tolerate it, of course. Uh, but if they don't tolerate, then we need to try other agents. Yeah, I think you have answered that already. There's a question in the chat box. Thank you for that, Barbara. Uh, I believe Dr. Iman has a question. Yeah, uh, Dr. Barbara, uh, can I share a thought? Uh, do you think in the long term, I'm not going to say short term, I don't think it's possible to have a really easy uh, solution for obesity to lose weight? Or maybe obesity is that complex, there's nothing easy uh, to use it. Or maybe on the other hand, that obesity itself is, is, is a subject that is so profitable for, for, for many people, you know, whether it is the medications, Saxenda or Victoza, I mean, just to name a few, or the gyms, the nutritionist or bariatric surgery. So everybody is really uh, uh, profiting from this and maybe nobody's interested to find an easy direct solution to obesity and to help uh, mostly for the females and to help people, you know, lose uh, 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 weight uh, easily. Because actually, if you want to lose weight, you have to change your lifestyle, you have to count your calories, you have to go to the gym, you have uh be mentally uh acceptable of these things you know and ready for it uh it's really complex right what do you think uh thank you for that question well i, I mean it's absolutely complex because i because if we if it wasn't complex we would have all the answers and it's not easy you're absolutely right but we do have to change lifestyle because whatever intervention we choose without changing the lifestyle that intervention is not going to help I am, however, very, very uh, much more positive and excited about the, the drug portfolio, the sort of the, the combination of gut hormones, which I think will help us women and the men, of course, to try and lose weight. And, and so, we, so that we don't just have to have the surgery. Now, surgery is fantastic. I'm not, you know, obviously I'm a very advocate of surgery, but I do think that we've not had a effective medication and in fact i don't think the world has done anything actually in terms of the pharmacotherapy sphere to address obesity it's like this massive big elephant that we have the whole world has it and nobody wants to recognize it i mean even in the uk you know obesity is not recognized as a chronic disease the royal college of physicians recognizes it but the government doesn't recognize it it's because if they recognize it they have to treat it as a, as a disease and they actually have to invest the money and the services to, to treat patients. Um, I think it's slowly, slowly changing. I think COVID has also highlighted, you, you know, obesity as a massive risk factor. So I really hope things will change and I hope there'll be some really good solutions going forward to this epidemic um, of obesity that we have. 
Thanks, Dr. Raymond. Yeah, thank you, thank you, thank you, Dr. Barbara. I think, yeah, the same, yeah. They have to invest more. Thank you so much. Yes. <laughs> thank okay. you. With that, I would like to thank you, Professor Barbara, for your wonderful presentation, and that evoked a very interesting discussion. And uh, so I think I better you. introduce you. Thank you very much. So thank you very much. So, um, so our final lecture, and thank you very much for everybody uh, to hold on right till the end is, of course, Dr. Saeed Raza that needs no introduction because everybody already knows him very well. Uh, but uh, uh, for those of you who don't, he's a consultant cardiologist. He's very eminent. Uh, he, he works here in uh, the uh, Wali Hospital in Bahrain, and he's uh, very well um, uh, uh, published and uh, sort of works um, in education as an external examiner. He does a lot of research and it is a great pleasure to um, introduce uh, the last lecture of today entitled Sudden Cardiac Death Risk Markers, ECGs and Cardiovascular Imaging. Dr. Saeed. Uh, thank you very much, Barbara, for that very kind introduction and perhaps a little long one. Uh, so can you first of all see my slide? Yes, we can. Okay. All right. So in the next uh, 20 minutes or so, I'm just going to speak about as to what is the current burden of uh, sudden cardiac death. And then I'm going to show some ECGs and ECG findings, uh, which are considered as risk markers for sudden cardiac death. And I'm just going to share some uh, cardiovascular imaging as well as to how they help us to assess the uh, risk for sudden cardiac death. Now, sudden cardiac death by definition is an unexpected sudden death due to a heart condition that occurs within one hour of symptom onset. And the global incidence of sudden cardiac death is uh, roughly around 5 million people, they die suddenly. And this accounts for about one fifth of all the deaths uh, globally. And we know by now that uh, cardiovascular disease is the commonest cause for sudden death and 50% of the cardiovascular deaths are actually sudden. And uh, unfortunately, the, uh, the, the survival for, from sudden cardiac arrest is very bleak, and less than 1% of the victims of, survival of cardiac arrest will actually survive. There is very little data we have on sudden cardiac death uh, from low and middle income countries, unfortunately. So these are some of the ways we can risk stratify uh, a person for sudden cardiac death and medical history, particularly to look for if there's any history of syncope, a family history of sudden cardiac death, ECG and cardiovascular imaging, I'll be discussing a little more detail, biomarkers such as uh, rise in troponin and BNP and pro-BNP, and of course the genetic studies. So ECG is a very common tool that helps us to risk stratify a patient or a person for sudden cardiac death. It is easily available, it is cheap, and as I mentioned earlier, that coronary artery disease is the commonest cause for sudden cardiac death. And what you see on the screen, these are some of the markers of sudden cardiac death in coronary artery disease. If you look at the, I'm not sure if you can see my cursor, uh, but if you look at the extreme left uh, picture, left upper corner, uh, there is a significant rise in the ST segment in the anterior leads. So this is the worst. Uh, ST segment elevated MI, you can see uh, a significant rise in ST segments, uh, which actually also means that the heart muscle is damaged uh, to a greater extent and there's a lot of necrosis going on. The second ECG that you see in the middle panel, uh, there is ST elevation. And if these ST elevations, they persist beyond six months and they are suggestive of that there is left ventricular aneurysm. And once you develop left ventricular aneurysm, that again predisposes uh, the person for uh, malignant ventricular arrhythmia, such as ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation. And then you also look at the Q waves. When the Q waves are deep and they are broad, then certainly they do suggest that there is transmural infarction where the infarction has happened through and through and whole of the muscle thickness have been infarcted or they are completely dead. And then we look at just the bottom left, uh, on the screen, if you will see, there is a wide QRS complex, and the QRS complex, if it is particularly of the left bundle branch block pattern, now it is very well recognized that this is in itself an independent risk for sudden cardiac death, uh, particularly in patients of myocardial infarction. In acute setting, it will suggest that there is myocardial edema, 
uh, the electrical conduction does not go through very well. That's why it gives you a white complex or a left bundle branch, left bundle branch block pattern. And in chronic setting, it suggests there is a lot of fibrosis going on. Obviously, the electricity does not travel well if there is uh, there's fibrosis. And so that can also give rise to this kind of ECG pattern. Now, if you are caring for a patient in CCU and on a monitored bed, and if you look at the last picture on the right uh, lower corner, you will see there are premature ventricular contracting beats, uh, which are different from each other. So these are called the polymorphic uh, premature ventricular beats. And these are like ticking time bombs. And if you see these in a patient who had just suffered an MI, and then you should just wait that the bomb doesn't explode, uh, because very often this may uh, transpire as uh, ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Uh, this is what we like to assess after a patient have had a myocardial infarction and to by an echocardiogram to look at the left ventricular function. And here what you can see is the left ventricle is not only enlarged, but it's hardly moving. Uh, and suggesting that there is significant deterioration in the left ventricular systolic function. And if the left ventricular ejection fraction is less than 40%, it is a marker for sudden cardiac death. And the guidelines suggest that if the left ventricular ejection fraction is less than 35%, then it is an indication for implantation of implantable cardiac defibrillator. We also take help of the cardiac MRI. And if you can see in the picture A, uh, the arrows are pointing towards an area which is white in color. And this is basically the septum. And it, it is suggesting that the whole myocardium is scarred. So white thing, what you see here is scarring. And this is transmural myocardial infarction. Whole width of the myocardium is actually scarred and after infarction. And the picture on the left, on the right, the picture B, uh, the arrow again points out uh, towards the partial thickness uh, infarction and there's a bit of fibrosis here. So this is a uh, partial thickness infarction or subendocardial infarction. So which is bad? Certainly uh, picture A uh, is bad for uh, evoking uh, ventricular fibrillation or ventricular tachycardia. Now, this is an ECG I usually show when I do ECG uh, teaching courses. Uh, now, if I ask the audience, they most of them, they come up saying, first of all, that this is uh, tachycardia. Uh, so they get this absolutely right. Uh, because it is certainly fast and the heart rate is definitely more than 100. The second thing they also answer correctly that they say this is white uh, complex tachycardia. Uh, but when I ask what do you think the rhythm is and they say this is ventricular tachycardia. Uh, but uh, that is something, uh, uh, I mean, uh, that's not the correct answer. That's not ventricular tachycardia. Now, if I draw your attention to lead to the bottom and if you look at the rhythm, you'll recognize that the, the RR interval, they are not regular. And in other words, the rhythm is irregularly irregular here. And you also don't see any P waves. So by medical school teaching, you'll remember that if the rhythm is irregularly irregular and there are no P waves, uh, there's no other diagnosis than atrial fibrillation. But why this atrial fibrillation looks a little bizarre? Uh, because there is uh, not normal conduction that happens through the AV node and that will give you a normal QRS complex, uh, which is seen here in the first picture. Uh, but the electrical impulses, they travel faster uh, through the aberrant path. And since it travels faster, there's a, a short PR interval and it kind of uh, pre-excites the ventricle through myocyte, myocyte electrical conduction. And that gives a slurred R wave, which is called the delta wave. So when the atrial fibrillation is uh, occurring, the the electrical wavelets, which are a number of them, because atrial rate is quite high in atrial fibrillation. And instead of going through the AV node, they go through a shorter shortcut to the aberrant path. And during the course of that, they stimulate the or excite uh, the ventricle very, very fast. And that can give rise to that kind of pattern and it gives a broad complex and irregularly irregular pattern. Now showing you the same ECG again. And if uh, somebody gives a, a, a nodal blocking agent, uh, such as beta blocker or, or calcium channel blocker, uh, such as verapamil or diltazem to slow the heart rate, which we usually do in patients of atrial fibrillation, then you are perhaps going to cause sudden cardiac death. This will be atrogenic sudden cardiac death uh, because uh, once you give a beta blocking agent, 
uh, or, or AV nodal blocking agent, then the electrical wavelets will conduct more fast through this aberrant path and atrial fibrillation will uh, transcribe as ventricular fibrillation. And that can be a cause for sudden cardiac death. Now, most of you will perhaps recognize that this is very high voltage. Uh, you see deep S waves, you see very tall R waves. So certainly there's no doubt that there is a left ventricular uh, hypertrophy or enlargement. And also you see that there is the ST depression. And this is seen in the uh, inferior leads as well as the lateral leads and anterior leads. So the, it is a, a, a sign, the ECD says that there is significant left ventricular hypertrophy. But if we want to confirm the diagnosis further, then we have to take the help of echocardiogram. And what you see on the top picture right hind corner is the echocardiogram in the uh, parasternal long axis view. And where it says IVS, so IVS is the interventricular septum, which is very much thickened. And so is the posterior wall of the left ventricle. And if you lift, look at the left ventricular cavity, uh, which is very small here, and there's left atrial uh, enlargement. So these are all the features of uh, hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. And uh, this is just a, a resting image. I don't have a moving picture for that. Uh, and I could describe a few other features. Now, we also take help of the cardiac MRI. And if you look at the right bottom uh, corner picture here, uh, cardiac MRI will help to, to measure the uh, ventricular wall thickness. And, and it, in addition, it gives a great, it's a great help to recognize and see where the, uh, the, the fibrosis is. And the arrow points out at these white uh, areas, which are uh, filled with fibrous tissue. And, and why it is important? Because this is, again, an important predictor or a risk marker for, uh, and, and this forms a substrate for ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation. Now, if you look at this ECG, uh, some of you may diagnose that uh, there is significant ischemia going on, or, or somebody may have already suffered MI. Now, if I tell you that this is a young uh, patient and who is completely asymptomatic, so perhaps uh, you will have to think some other diagnosis for this. And what it is, it is apical hypertrophic uh, cardiomyopathy. So there's no obstruction, so it's not called hypertrophic obstructive cardiomyopathy. It is apical. And why it is apical, uh, I'll show you on the echo image. Uh, this is the resting image here. On the left-hand side, you see the walls of the left ventricle, they are fine. Uh, there is no thickness but the apex is thickened. And there's a zoom picture at the top, which again shows the same thing that the apex is thickened and it is just the hypertrophy of the apex of the heart. The free walls are well spared. And similar uh, findings are shown here by the cardiac MRI. And what interesting uh, thing has been described, if you look at the left ventricular cavity, which is black in, in echo images and they're white in, in cardiac, as cardiac MRI images, and they are described as a spade-shaped spade left ventricular uh, cavity, spade-shaped. Now, these are some of the major and minor risk factors for uh, sudden cardiac death in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. But what we are really interested here in is the left ventricular wall thickness, and this can be assessed uh, much uh, better uh, by cardiac MRI and, the, and also the echocardiogram. And if the left ventricular wall thickness is more than 30 millimeter, then in itself is an independent risk factor or marker for sudden cardiac death in hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Now, T wave alternance. Now, if you look at this ECG, you'll find that the T waves are not of, uh, they are not in these, uh, they are not seen uh, in the same axis. So there is a positive deflection of the T wave and then there's a negative, and then there's a positive and then there's a negative. So they are alternating uh, with each other. So and on this ECG, you'll see that the T waves, they have got a, a similar polarity. Uh, all are negatively deflected. And if you will just see the, the, the lead, the lead uh, where the ECG, where the T waves are marked with the red stars. So there's a small T wave, then there's a uh, tall uh, or deep T waves, then there's a smaller uh, T wave, inverted T wave, and there's a bigger invert, inverted T wave. So they are alternating with the size of the T waves. And this, this is called T wave alternance. Now T wave alternance, uh, it has been recognized uh, that it can precipitate ventricular tachycardia and fibrillation. 
And this is more often seen in patients who are being monitored in CCU. And the bottom uh, image that you'll see here that they are alternating uh, T waves. So one T wave is up and then the other one is down, then the up and then down. And then what follows is the polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, which is a kind of uh, ventricular fibrillation. Early repolarization uh, changes. Uh, most of you will recognize uh, the, the, the doctors who report ECGs routinely. This is a very common ECG finding that we get, uh, particularly if people who are uh, who just come for a screening or a pre-employment pre assessment. And what we see here uh, is the J-point elevation. So what is the J-point? J-point is the junction between the where the S-wave ends and where the ST segment starts. And it is shown here, it can be of two types. There is the J point, which is slurred, and then there's a nose J wave. So essentially, when you look at the ECGs, and, and if you don't have any background history, some of you may diagnose that this is ST segment elevator myocardial infarction. But when you are told that this patient is young, healthy, with no symptoms at all, and also what helps on the ECG is, is well-preserved R waves, and the ST elevation has got a, a coving upwards, uh, which is a saddle-shaped ST elevation then all they point towards that this is early repolarization changes. This is not ST segment elevated myocardial infarction. Uh, similar things are, uh, similar findings are seen here. But the question is, are the benign uh, early repolarization changes uh, really benign? Until recently, we thought these are benign EC changes, but studies have shown that if the ER changes occur, uh, particularly in the inferior leads, then they are not benign uh, because it has been observed that these patients invariably uh, may have uh, uh, ventricular tachycardia or ventricular fibrillation and can be a cause for sudden cardiac death. Uh, long QT syndrome. So first of all, what is QT syndrome? So we measure from the beginning of the Q wave till the end of the T wave. Uh, that is the QT interval, uh, but QT interval varies with the heart rate. If the heart rate is faster, then the QT interval will be shorter. If the heart rate is slower, then the QT interval be, will be prolonged. So what we should be actually looking at is not the QT interval, but the corrected QT interval. And there's a formula, I'm not going to go into, into the detail of that, but there's a formula where you can calculate the long QT interval. Now, QT intervals can be of two types. They are, they are congenital and then they are acquired. And acquired, the common causes are ischemia, then their drugs, electrolyte imbalance. Now, you may have heard during the COVID period when the people were uh, giving drugs like azithromycin or macrolide antibiotics, and and, and the hydroxychloroquine. And the combination of these drugs invariably was causing prolongation of QT uh, interval. And that was perhaps a cause which led to death of these COVID patients because it evokes a particular type of uh, polymorphic ventricular tachycardia, uh, which is called torsa de pond, which is shown here in the diagram because the, 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 the QRS complexes are very different from each other. And that's why it's called polymorphic. Now, Brugada syndrome, uh, this was something that was described by three cardiologists, uh, Brugada brothers. Uh, two of them, uh, they live in Spain, and they described this condition uh, back in 1992. Uh, Joseph and, and uh, uh, Pedro uh, Brugada. And then there was another, uh, the, the elder brother who lives uh, somewhere in America, he described it as uh, there was a genetic predisposition for this condition. Now, if I draw your attention to lead V1, what you see here, that there is partial right bundle band block, and then there is ST segment elevation, uh, which is which is down sloping, and there there are slight changes in the lead V2 as well. So this is typical uh, Brugada pattern ECG, I would say, and these are of three types: type one, type two, and type three, which you can see here on the screen. So it is the type one uh, which is uh, which is a high risk for sudden cardiac death, and type two and type three. Unless uh, there are uh, other features like uh, history of syncope or family history of sudden cardiac death, invariably they are low risk. So it is type one that has to be taken care of. And if the patients, particularly if they are symptomatic of syncope or if they had, or if there is a family history of sudden cardiac death, then these patients, they do require uh, implantable cardiac defibrillator. Now, this is a ECG of edmogenic right ventricular dysplasia. And what you see here is the QRS complex. And at the end of the QRS complex, there's a positive deflection of a wave, uh, which is called the epsilon wave. And this is pathognomic of uh, this uh, condition at ARVD. And in addition, you also you see there are T wave inversion in the 
uh, in the right sided leads, particularly. And why the right sided leads? Because it is the right ventricle that is involved, and right ventricle of free wall, a, the muscle is replaced by fat and fibrous tissue. And, and as the fibrous tissue and uh, fat, they replace uh, the, the, the muscle, and then the, left, then the right ventricle has got a tendency to dilate and right ventricle becomes uh, bigger than the left ventricle that you can see, uh, see here on the echocardiogram. So this is the right ventricle and this is the left ventricle. So right ventricle you will appreciate is much bigger than the left ventricle. And likewise, you'll see on a cardiac MRI, uh, there are, uh, the right ventricle is dilated, uh, the right free wall is scarred, and there are some microaneurysms. So that then forms a substrate for ventricular tachycardia and ventricular fibrillation in these patients. So cardiovascular imaging, we make use of echocardiogram, which is uh, cheap and readily available, but we also make use of CT scan and cardiac MRI. So with the echocardiogram, uh, we can show the uh, chamber sizes, and it is very useful to diagnose uh, conditions like dilated cardiomyopathy. And if you have a patient of cardiomyopathy and you want to risk stratify for, uh, for sudden cardiac death, then if these patients have got some late gadolinium enhancement on the cardiac MRI, a late gadolinium enhancement, gadolinium is the, is the dye that we use for the cardiac MR. And if they show some white patches, uh, if they do not show any white patches, if there's no late gadolinium enhancement and the uh, complexes, QRS complexes are narrow, uh, then they are at low risk of uh, death and any arrhythmic events. Now, if they have one of them, and uh, if the left gadolinium enhancement is positive or the QRS complex, complex, uh, complexes are wide, uh, then uh, they are intermediate risk for sudden cardiac death. And, but if they have both, if there's late gadolinium enhancement plus, if the QRS complexes are wide, uh, then these patients are certainly at high risk of sudden cardiac death. Cardi cardiac CT is very much in use, uh, but the disadvantages are a lot of radiation. Uh, there's use of iodine iodinated uh, contrast, and it has got low temporal resolution. So that's why it is not a very good uh, a tool to assess the left ventricular function and the other functions of the heart. But it, it requires, because the cardiac CT has advanced, and within a few seconds, you can get a very a good and pretty images. So where it helps uh, to assess the risk for a sudden cardiac death, it helps, helps us to look at the coronary arteries, particularly looking at the cores. Uh, of the coronary arteries and the origin where they arise from. Now, in this picture, you'll see on the left-hand side, uh, this is a normal origin of the uh, coronary arteries uh, from the left uh, coronary cusp. The left main divides into left anterior descending artery, LAD, and the CX is the LCX. But on the right, the left main, where it says LM, this is left main, which this is the initial part of the left coronary artery. And instead of arising from the LSV, uh, which is uh, which, which is the left coronary cusp. It arises from the RSV, uh, which is the right sinus of Valsalva. And so this is certainly not the place it should arise from. This is the, this is the position for the right coronary artery. And since this, uh, once this uh, coronary, sorry, the coronary artery arises and it, it, uh, it travels in between the PA or the aorta. This PA is the pulmonary artery and the A is the aorta. And so sometimes this artery gets sandwiched between the two large arteries under pressure. And if these uh, people or patients, they exercise, and then they may suffer uh, a, a myocardial infarction-like uh, uh, condition. And this can be a cause for sudden cardiac death. Coronary artery aneurysms, uh, they are recognized by cardiac CT. And if they are large aneurysms, they are, they are at risk of uh, dissection and sudden cardiac death. Uh, cardiac MRI is uh, very helpful in terms of assessing the risk because it has got high temporal resolution. It can help us to assess the left ventricular function, uh, but more important than that, it helps us to have the tissue characterization. And uh, uh, of course, there's no radiation. So some of the pictures I'm going to, to show and then I'll finish. Uh, so it helps us uh, a lot in recognizing uh, the risks of cardiac arrhythmia in patients of acute and chronic myocarditis. And certainly cardiac MRI has been very useful during the COVID period because of the uh, COVID-associated myocarditis. And once there is myocarditis, these are white patches that you'll see. And they, I'm not sure if you can appreciate on this, and there's a typical pattern of uh, the, the scarring. It is the mid, it is not the top, it is not the lower, but the mid is scarring, mid wall scarring that, that usually happens in myocarditis. So that is one of the way to assess for myocarditis. We can look at the extension of myocarditis 
and certainly that is an important uh, substrate uh, for a malignant ventricular arrhythmia. Uh, cardiac sarcod uh, sarcoidosis, again, you can see a lot of white patches. They are again all scarred uh, muscle tissue and more the scarring, more the risk for uh, ventricular arrhythmia. So how about the screening for sudden cardiac death? Now, so far, there is no clear consensus as to how the general population should be, should be screened. Now, but there are some guidelines for a special population like the athletes and the particularly the patients who have a family history of uh, sudden cardiac death. So those are the those group of population. Uh, there are some guidelines, and the recommendations uh, for uh, screening uh, from Europe and uh, USA they differ a little bit from each other. Now, US is more conservative. They say that particularly for the athletes, only ECG should be used. But European guidelines say they you make use of ECG as well as echocardiogram as the basic tools for screening these individuals. So finally, to conclude, ladies and gentlemen, a sudden cardiac death is common, but the good news is that it is preventable. We know of several risk factors or risk markers, but they are uh, they, there's a need to identify these risk, risk markers so that we can prevent these uh, precious uh, lives. ECG and cardiovascular imaging that I have shown you, uh, they do help to screen the associated uh, risk for sudden cardiac death, uh, but there still remains a greater need for educating and increasing awareness of sudden cardiac death, not only amongst the general public, but also among the, uh, the medical professional community, uh, so that these tools that are available for us to screen these patients and identify risk, they should be uh, very much utilized. So with that, I thank you very much uh, for listening and I'm ready to take any question that you may have. Thank you. Thank you very much uh, for that uh, lovely journey, really, to, through a lot of cardiologies, really sort of brought back some, 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 some memories. And of course, you know, an important topic, you know, we, we certainly we've had a few fo footballers, uh, you know, uh, having sudden cardiac uh, deaths on, on the pitch. So very relevant. Um, there is a question um, from Dipesh Patel, who's asking, very good talk. Which rhythm disturbances, apart from atrial fibrillation, should we be particularly aware in people with type 2 diabetes? Uh, sorry, if I heard that right, did, did you say atrial fibrillation? Apart from atrial fibrillation, uh, are there any other uh, arrhythmias or rhythm disturbances that we should be particularly aware of in people with type 2 diabetes? Well, I, I would say it can be anything really, because obviously uh, diabetes is one of the important risk factors for coronary artery disease. And uh, coronary artery disease obviously is the main uh, factor uh, that can lead to uh, problems in the heart. And so I would say it can range from anything, atrial flutter, atrial fibrillation, can be ventricular tachycardia, ventricular fibrillation, anything really. Anything like even that. The, even the bloody even the bloody Thank you very much. And do you think that, you know, our young athletes, you know, you know, we have young children, for example, doing swimming, you know, uh, uh, you know, six, seven times a week. Um, you know, should we be screening our young athletes at an early age or, you know, what do you think? Um, do, or should we look for sort of certain risk factors rather than screening everybody indiscriminately? No, certainly the risk factors that, that I mentioned in my presentation, if there's a family history, then for sure. Yeah. And if they are symptomatic, if they have suffered any kind of syncope, pre-syncope or full syncope, then yes, they should. And they, but, but there they are certain guidelines and certain countries, they are following these guidelines that they do screen the, their athletes. And, and it is a good way to, to, to offer that service because uh, obviously, you know, uh, the yield is not much. Uh, you may pick up just a few handful only uh, with lots and lots of uh, patients or individuals there that you screen. But obviously, it's worth doing the screening and saving precious lives. Fantastic. Thank and you very, very much. very recently, we had the sports cardiology uh, just very recently in Bahrain. So there is, Bahrain is taking a lead to, to screen the athletes here as well. Lovely. Thank you very much. Thank you for that. And I think with that, I don't yeah. think we've got any more questions. So um, I'd like to end uh, this session for the evening. Uh, thank you very much to all our speakers, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Saeed Raza for, uh, for helping me out with the questions tonight and, and, and everybody for listening uh, until this very late hour of the day. Um, I'm gonna hand over to Dr. Assad. I don't know if Dr. Assad, you'd like to um, close up for the evening and 
until tomorrow morning and the rest of thank the panel. Thank you for all of you to stay till this time. Thank you for uh, Dr. Iman and uh, the team with her, uh, Dr. Mohammed, Dr. Sayyid, Dr. Debish, all of you and the audience st stand to till this time. And good night for all of you. Good night, you, everybody. We'll see you tomorrow. Thank okay. You. Thank, you. thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. See you tomorrow. Bye-bye. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye. Bye, -bye.